this is part of the Ciji Global Symposium for Common Goodness, jointly organized by Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences Chem Lab and the Ciji Charity Found Foundation. Thank you all for your sponsor and your support. Yesterday, we made remarkable progress by discussing and talking and exploring. And there was a time where it was possible that we will all miss our dinner because there was too ample, too much discussion going on back and forth between, between on, people on the stage and also be, between the people here on stage and off stage. But I think that's a good process because that means that we are making strides forward and because we have a common goal. And I think Master taught us, and I think many great visionaries had shared with us that when we have friends with common goals, that we can make huge strides toward this goal together. And we can be more persistent and we can garner more success. So today, we're taking this very special opportunity for recognizing the friends that have helped us, that have been with us along the journey. And today we have this special thanks and special recognition for Professor Herman Leonard, who is the George F. Baker Jr. Professor of Public Management, Harvard Kennedy School, as well as Elliot Snyder and Family Professor of Business Administration, Harvard Business School. And to present this special thanks, let us welcome the co-organizer of this event, of the symposium, Professor Ray Sheng Her. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. This is indeed a very special recognition uh, to Professor Herman Nanner. And Professor Herman Nanner is a good friend of Tsuji and me. Uh, in 2009, he came to visit Tsuji and conduct interview with the Dharma Master Zheng Yan. He concluded that the success of Tsuji and his global charitable operation is neither based on strategy nor interest, but on spirit and belief. He perceived Master Zheng Yan as one of the greatest leaders who guide people, not through power or personal interest, but through value and belief. In 2010, he completed his essays on Suji and kindly asked me to review. And in 2011, he invited me to present Suji and deliver a lecture at Harvard Business School. Since then, he has taught the Suji case for more than 12 years here at Harvard. In 2016, we were honored to invite Professor Herman Nander to come to Taiwan and join the fourth Tsuji Forum as a keynote speaker. He flew for back and forth 40 hours and stayed only less than six hours and then flew back to US because he got a class to teach. His lecture received enormous compliment. As uh, one scholar said after he listened to Professor Leonard's speech, he said his lecture worth 10 million US dollars. Nonetheless, Professor Herbert Leonard received not a dime from Suji. <laughs> so during the speech of 2016, he introduced the concept that Suji's belief based management should serve as a model for enterprise to adopt and learn from in an uncertain world nowadays. In the case of Tsuji, his as relief often face a great deal of uncertainty. The timing of disasters is unpredictable. Location are unpredictable. And the local capability to handle disaster are also unpredictable. However, Tsuji volunteer are always able to deliver relief. Why? Because Suji volunteer vowed to help wherever disaster occurred. So this is the conviction that has guided Suji to his success in 
128 countries so far. So he said, we are fish in the lake. And he sees us from the mountain top to tell us how the bake look like. <laughs> okay. So we have uh, another video that from Master Zheng Yan in 2016. She has a lot of compliment on Professor Herman Nader. Let's watch the video. <laughs> now, with the highest uh, sincere gratitude, I would like to invite CEO Yan and the Master De Chen on behalf of Venerable Zheng Yan to present a special gift to Professor Herman Nander, express our highest regard for his contribution to Tsuji, as well as to the humanitarian work. Let's work on. And now we uh, present the gift. The second night is a uh, illumination to the human race. Thank you, Professor Herman Nenner. Now we have a, a Professor Lerner to have a few remarks. Can you hear me without the mic or do, you, do I need the mic? Oh, you, Should, need the mic. you need the mic, okay. Yes, okay. there are people online. Which okay. Means... Good morning. Well, well, so I will make my remarks in English. Uh, first, I, I will be very brief. Um, I'm very humbled. I'm very grateful. Um, I want first to say that everything I do, and especially everything I've done with Suchi, is a team sport. There are many people involved, all of whom are helpful. So I accept the recognition that you have graciously offered me on behalf of all of the people who have been involved at Harvard and at Suchi, uh, starting with 
uh, Ray Sheng Her and many others who have helped us to understand what is important about this organization. So that, and I love this idea, that we can illuminate these ideas uh, throughout the world. Uh, so first, I'm embarrassed and humbled to stand before you and to be recognized in this way. Uh, and as I say, I accept this on behalf of the many people. In English, we say, there is no letter I in the word team. And this was a team sport uh, throughout. Uh, it is I should be thanking all of you for the opportunity that we have had to look into, to have a window into the activities of this extraordinary organization. And I wanna just say a few brief words about why I see it as so extraordinary and, and, and offer my words of thanks. I love the case that Su Chi allowed us to write about the uh, work of this extraordinary organization. And I, I love the case because it has valuable insights for many audiences. In your remarks, you said, I've been teaching it here for 12 years. I teach it everywhere. I teach anyone who will listen. Uh, I, I want to share this case. What is important and valuable about this organization from a, a scholarly perspective and the case that we got to write is that it challenges our ordinary thinking about how to make things happen in the world, about how to mobilize people and how to, to take actions, how to figure out what to do, uh, how to make progress in the world. It challenges our received understanding, our conventional wisdom about management and leadership. I'm teaching the case again a week from today to our joint degree program students from the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Business School. In a required course in their third year, the course opens with this case because it has such powerful insights about the world and about the world they will be trying to uh, accomplish things in. Uh, a key observation known to all of you is that Tsuchi is one of the most effective humanitarian relief and development organizations in the world. It operates at very large scale and at a very high degree of effectiveness. Almost all of this is on a purely voluntary basis, as I have been. I will always be a volunteer for Tsuchi. <laughs> so I often ask the students when they've read the case, so what did you think of the, the strategic planning process and the detailed planning process that Tsuchi uses? And they look at me with some bewilderment, and then they look through the case, and they said, "They think, did I miss a paragraph here or an exhibit? You know what? What? What is?" It? And I said, "No, no. This is the important thing. The task environment of disasters does not allow you to do prior planning. You can set up the infrastructure, but you can't figure out what you're going to do until you see what the disaster is. And disasters are random and awful." And they are in different places. And as you said, the places have different capacity. And so you can't plan all that in advance. And so what they've missed is not an exhibit, but a whole philosophy of how one would actually make progress or how one would, would make a difference in such a world. They haven't missed anything. Suchi doesn't have a strategic planning process for disaster relief. What it has, and this is an important concept, it has a strategically designed adaptive process for rapidly figuring out what can be done in a particular situation that would be helpful, and then doing it, figuring out in real time. So instead of plans, what Su Chi makes in advance is commitments, the commitment that it will do what it can, and it will look at the situation and figure out and mobilize as well as it possibly can to be helpful. So it makes forward-looking commitments and then launches a planning process to figure out how to act in the moment. That is a fundamental challenge to our usual understanding of how organizations produce excellence, which is that they think it all out ahead of time and then they make a, a very detailed plan and then they execute the plan with precision. You can't do that in a disaster. And so Su Chi recognizes and responds to that uh, by having a different kind of process. You can plan, however, on the other things that Su Chi does, also at scale, the other charitable engagements with the world, 
on building hospitals, on organizing schools, on doing development, and on doing recovery after the fact of a disaster. So these are things you can plan. So what is wonderful about this organization is that it's a brilliant example of an organization that has is ambidextrous. It has these two sides to it. The side that says we are planning in advance, we are going to build the hospital, we're going to meticulously plan how that's going to work. Yeah. And we're also going to respond rapidly to whatever unfolds in the world, whatever uh, issue has arisen, whatever disaster has struck, we are going to figure out what we can do and operate on it. I refer to this in my teaching as a left-hand side approach, which is a reference to the left-hand side of the brain, the more analytical, linear, detailed part, and the right-hand side, the more creative, nimble, responsive, adaptive part. And Suchi has a wonderful balance of these two elements, which is what I want my students to understand. I want them to see these are both important and one cannot make your way in the world in our complicated, difficult, tumultuous, chaotic world with just one of them. You have to have both. So this implies that the preeminent question, the question of interest is how do you build an organization that has this capability? It is excellent at the left-hand side, linear analytical execution of plans, and also excellent at the right-hand side, at being nimble, at being adaptive, at being creative in the moment. Uh, that's a fundamentally different idea of what an organization should look like and how it should operate. And the question then, the deeper prior question, what I refer to as the meta question, is what form of leadership is necessary in order to create such organizations, uh, to build organizations of this kind? Again, remember that I'm telling this to students who I am expecting to go out in the world and build their own organizations and work on really important problems. And so these principles are illuminating for them uh, the path that lies ahead of them. So at Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School, we have a single concept that we believe explains everything. It's called leadership. Both schools are premised on the idea that leadership matters. So our challenge is to unpack what that means. What kind of leadership is necessary? What kind of understanding by leaders and then what kinds of actions by leaders are necessary in order to make progress, in order to figure out how to do the things that Su Chi does. And that's why, for me, the study of the Venerable Dharma Master Cheng Yen's leadership is so interesting and also so important. Because from this fountain flows the waters throughout the world of this effectiveness of impact. That's why I'm so grateful to the Venerable Master and to Su Chi for the opportunity to look at this, to try to understand how it works. Uh, the value-based approach to making things happen in the world, which is the essential idea that I'm unfolding for my third year students, the very beginning of their third and final year here. That's why I'm humbled uh, to receive uh, your uh, recognition in this way. And it's also a I am so very much looking forward to the discussion of the day so that I can learn more about how this actually works and the leadership of uh, the Venerable Master. So I'm looking forward to uh, all of the discussion. I stand before you, uh, as always, grateful for the opportunity I've had and anticipating learning yet to come about how this form of leadership can transform our world. So I know in the traditions of Su Chi, one of the other principles I teach is the idea of grateful giving, uh, the idea that what mobilizes us, what actualizes us as human beings, the highest thing that we can do is to serve one another. And so it is in that spirit that I say to you all, it is I who should thank you, and I do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in this, in this gesture, I'm trying to replicate a picture that is in the case which is of Suchi volunteers handing blank. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a picture. Take a picture. So we take a picture for that. Thank you, Professor Lerner, and thank you, Master Turchan and the CEO Yen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Leonard, for your help and also your continued um, exploration into how to teach this as a lesson to our next generation of great leaders in our community and society. Next, to continue expanding our efforts in advancing a holistic understanding of the Ziji and Venerable Dharma Master's teachings, we have formed a special Ziji Academic Committee. And in the hopes of converging ideas with the real world practices to present the certificates of Ziji Academic Committee, please once again welcome Professor Ray Shenghe. Thank you. Uh, for less than six decades, we've been engaged in many practices, uh, Buddhism, uh, interreligious inter uh, engagement. And now it's about time for us to, to theorize our practice because Tsuji has its distinction and also has its uh, very, very unique practices. As Herman Nanner and many other scholars, uh, Richard Madison has a road book on Tsuji uh, back to 2007. So we built uh, you know, academic committee to develop uh, various researches, including altruism, including the Buddhism, including the charity, emergency relief, the governance, economic goodness, et cetera. And we are very grateful that many of the distinguished scholars would like to become our advisor to guide us to advise us the right way to conduct research. So now let me invite uh, CEO Yen to present certificate to our distinguished advisors. First, I would, in, I would like to invite Professor Rachel Madison to receive our certificate. Okay, let's work on Thank you, Professor Madison. He's a, a very good friend of, of our Tsuji, has been uh, more than 15 years. And let's work on Professor Stephen Tizer. Thank you. And next, let's uh, work on uh, Professor Wang Song. And the Dharma Master Shi Zhao Hui.
and uh, Professor Deng Wei Ren from Dharma Drum. And the Professor Ahun. <laughs> and Professor Lina Brochery. And then finally, again, Professor Herman Nander, you know, Honorable Dr. Bakshi. Some uh, uh, our advisor has not yet come, including Professor uh, Monica Sanford and Julia Huang and Eugene Wang as well as the old our advisor. And also, there are some uh, couldn't come to this symposium. I would like to introduce uh, Professor Richard Gombridge. He's also our good friend from the Oxford University, also the founder for the Center of Oxford Buddhist Study. And, and next, yeah, Professor, Professor Ulrich Roster from Oxford University. Thank you for her advice. And also Professor Rose Sturks from the Cambridge University is also the chair for China study and also the fellow of British Academy. And I will introduce Professor Bernard Ford from Columbia University, very distinguished Buddhist scholar. And the Professor Junhua Chen from UBC, also the fellow of Canada Royal Academy. And thank you all the advisors who hope that together we can produce more research on the altruism, on the modern Buddhism, and many, many other academic principle that can be very beneficial to the human race nowadays. Thank you all, thank you. And, and lastly, we also would like to make special recognition and presenting the certificate of academic, um, uh, the committee uh, for helping, thanking Professor Ray Her for helping coordinating this entire committee. So uh, let's also uh, welcome uh, CEO Yen presenting the certificate for, yeah. thank you for coordinating this effort. Thank you, Professor Her. And also, let's take a picture. And also Miss Lori Lai as well. Back. Thank you, CEO. Uh, we're done here. We're <laughs> thank you, CEO Yen, and thank you all for the committee, and thank you all. Uh, for participation into this great work. And we look forward to this future where the committee works together, where friends 
work toward a common goal. Thank you. Now we proceed with today, the symposium's third session, where we will continue the discussion and exploration into the philosophy of Venerable Chen Yen. To help us with this part, now please join me to welcome Professor Stephen Tizer to help us serve as a moderator to this session. Thank you. Professor Tizer has been a key figure in the Injun Distinguished Lecture Series on Buddhism, and we thank you for your support and continued contribution. Professor Tizer, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we turn now from the uh, uh, celebration and awards uh, of certificates uh, and honors uh, to the uh, academic side of the to this morning's discussion. I'm chairing session number three, the philosophy of Venerable Zheng Yan. Uh, our presentations uh, will be three in number, uh, followed by two discussants uh, and then a discussion period. Our first presenter is Peying Lin from the National Zhengzhou University. Professor Lin. Good morning, everyone. Um, need a bit of time to set up, so I'll just start. Um, so first, let me take this opportunity to thank um, Professor uh, He Risheng and all the organizers and sponsors of this um, symposium. It has been very educational for me, um, even though it's only the second day, but I learned a lot from every um, presenta um, presenta <laughs> presenter and commentator yesterday. And um, I also want to thank all the volunteers, um, the Shi Xiong and Shi Jie, who have been looking after us for several days by now. Um, you really made us feel at home at, in Boston. Thank you so much. And um, um, I, it, it's a great honor for me to be here to present this ongoing project, um, talking about um, Master Zheng Yin's Bodhisattva precepts. Um, Probably you would notice it's slightly different from the original title that I submitted uh, because we only have 20 minutes. So I decided to narrow down the topic a little bit um, to suit the occasion here. So um, I, I really need the whole point. I can I just talk from Hong um, <laughs> We are working on the PowerPoint yeah. and we will not penalize your time <laughs> presentation. No, no, no. Yeah, I um, the bell is wonderful, but please don't do that to me. <laughs> um, so, um, well, what, what should we do? Well, actually, uh, yeah. um, I mean, there are so many interesting topics that have been repeated, um, re repeated over again and again um, yesterday in yesterday's session. So, you know, when I look at my original paper, I thought I could just jump to the conclusion part actually <laughs> directly, but no, I will give my presentation, don't worry. <laughs> Is there a portion you can do with less uh, support, either the introduction or the conclusion with less support from the PPT? Okay, I'll just read it, but um, okay, let's see how it, Okay. Okay. Um, so I mean, um, well, first of all, um, venerable Master Zheng Yan's unique style. I mean, I'm going to give um quotations from her public talks um today, um, because I think that's more interesting to me. I mean, uh, Master Zheng Yan's unique style of preaching is very different from all the other scholar monks, such as Tai Xu, Yin Shun, and Sheng Yan. 
Well, um, not just because of the speed of her um, speech. I mean, she talks very slowly, right? No one can talk so slowly like her. <laughs> but I mean, the difference lies not uh, so much in their understanding of Buddhism, but in the way she conveys Buddhist teachings. So even though the contents, the understanding of Buddhism is very important, but what is more interesting to me is how she explains, how she uses this, um, easy to understand examples to explain Buddhism. And even though her own acts conform to monastic rules with no doubt, uh, the morale that she proposed for the Tsuji Foundation has been adapted to suit uh, modern lay Buddhist. And my paper will discuss the following uh, the three aspects about Master Zheng Yan's You're, we are witnessing responsiveness and adaptability and many other aspects of Siji leadership style in action, uh, even here as we speak. The preparation, the preparation and the left hand side of the brain have all been engaged thus far, and now we are seeing an exercise in right side. One. Intelligence and yeah. adaptability. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll just read it, okay? Um, just see how much you can understand without my okay. point. Thank you, Professor Lin. So um, I'm going to discuss um, Master Zheng Yan's conception of Bodhisattva precepts from three, three aspects. First one is the uh, textual sources that she has been, uh, that, that she used uh, for her modernized Buddhist precepts. The second one would be the intensified role of love and compassion in uh, supplementing Buddhist precepts in the city. And the third one is a redefined relationship between the monastics and the laity. So this is my paper, another uh, PowerPoint. Um, and actually, I mean, by now, I think most of the audience have been, must be very familiar with the two scriptures uh, that uh, Master Zheng Yan rely on, the Lotus Sutra and the Sutra of the Indefinite Meanings. So I um, plan to skip the two uh, slides that I was go um, going to select quotations from her talks about those two sutras. Um, however, the first one was actually the same uh, as the same quotation from the one um, of Master uh, Zheng Yan's welcome speech yesterday um, through Venerable De Cheng. So that's a very important passage. Um, but anyway, I think everyone will be very familiar with those two scriptures already. And then the second uh, part that I'm going to talk is how she translated scriptures into actions. Uh, Master Zheng Yan's her method of Buddhist teaching is very different from traditional scholastic expressions. It might be feasible for us to take that um, her Buddhist teaching, pre preaching is delivered in a special format of um, operative discourse. She put a strong emphasis on doing in explaining the Bodhisattva path and Bodhisattva precepts. She has highlighted the importance of action by saying, just take action and do something right. However, this is not to say that she does not value Buddhist doctrines. On the contrary, she affirms that understanding the correct meaning of Buddhism is very important. A important concept of um, her interpretation of Bodhisattva is that every member of the community is important because uh, the, ten, so, uh, the Southern armed and Southern eyed Guan Yin is a representation of a Southern Bodhisattvas who might be uh, the Tsuji volunteers or lay, any lay Buddhist. In other words, every person is an Avalokiteshvara to be. Furthermore, um, she kept reminding us that everything a Bodhisattva, 
sat by thus is motivated by altruistic intentions for all sentient beings. Um, for this um, altruism, please read um, Professor Harishan's books. The following um, are the following slides <laughs> are examples taken from her public talks on Bodhisattva precepts. Okay. The first one, uh, the three clusters of pure precepts, uh, San Ju Jing Jie. Okay. So in her talk about the three clusters of pure precepts, uh, she first briefly explained the basic meaning of um, the precepts. Then instead of referring to any Buddhist scriptures, she expounded on these precepts with examples of daily life situations. For instance, um, for the first precept, abiding by the Buddhist rules. Um, according to her, it means that each member must renew their knowledge of the etiquette of the Ciji Foundation when they first joined the community. And also in their private life, they need to pay extra attention to their own manner while eating, uh, sitting, or dressing. Um, as for the second precept, um, abiding by good laws, which means to conduct good acts and avoid wrongful behaviors. Uh, okay. uh, she, in explaining this, she gave an example that during the course of walking and circulating the Buddha statue, which is a common Buddhist practice, each person should guard oneself carefully while being in a group. And in that group, one should also respect everyone and cultivate one's own compassion. Um, and then regarding the third precept, abiding by the principle of altruism, um, which means that each person must understand the necessity of helping others, which is the reason why the Ziji Foundation was established. Everyone in the community is just like um, Master Zheng Yan said, the street lamps uh, at night, which light up on the streets to light up the way uh, for the preceding person and the following person. So in this line, no one is left alone. Um, the next one is the five precepts, which um, is probably very familiar to most of the Buddhist followers here. When she talked about the five precepts, she first gave a sincere recognition of the audience who surely possess Bodhisattva's nature of endless endeavor in participating all volunteer work in the Ciji Foundation. And then she explained the definition of the precepts. Uh, because there is no slide here, I'll read it. Uh, no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no false language, and no um, toxification. Wow, it's back. <laughs> okay. Um, Professor Hurd's book is here. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a. Uh, what um, we heard from Master Zheng Yan's welcome speech, this is a phrase that um, she gave us yesterday, okay? So now I am, I have done with this um, three, yeah, okay. This is the five precepts. Um, so after explaining the uh, five precepts, she further explained that these five precepts are meant to elevate the cultivation of personal, uh, pers uh, individual personalities. According to her, these precepts and the Bodhisattva path never de uh, deviate from the core Buddhist principle of compassion and relief, which is the name of Ziji. Therefore, Buddhist precepts and the Bodhisattva path are connected by the foundation of loving kindness for all sentient beings. And then when she um, talked about this um, uh, Bodhisattva path, she spells out the Bodhisattva path that the practice itself relies on the strong will of Bodhisattvas and the goal is the purification of the human mind. She then elucidated the practice of Bodhisattva path by answering a specific question for herself. Whenever encountering difficulties, how does, how does she overcome and break through? In her case, she has set up two guidelines for herself. 
Versus never argue against others and always humbly reflect on her own faults. Second, never force anyone to do anything. This corresponds to her attitude that all Buddhist doctrines must be demonstrated by actions, which in fact conforms to, um, I think, the Tiantai doctrine that phenomena are taken to manifest principles. Now the 10 precepts, this is very special. Uh, Master Zheng Yan reinforced a modified version of 10 precepts for the Ciji community. Uh, from the list here, the first five um, are identical to the standard five precepts of Buddhism for lay practitioners. The second half of the list are the modernized form of regulations designed by Master Zheng Yan. And these 10 precepts are crucial rules, very important for the Ciji members. Um, it's remarkable if you go through, just glance through the magazines of the Ciji Foundation, uh, you will find many examples of short stories um, that how the volunteers um, were admired for their sincere observance of these 10 precepts. So it's very important for them. Now the next session is about uh, the, oh, sorry. The intensified role of love and compassion. The importance of love and compassion ha has been greatly promoted in supplementing Buddhist precepts in the Ciji Foundation. One of Master Zheng Yan's fundamental principles is, um, you heard it yesterday already, taking Buddhist precepts as institutional rules and love as a principle for management. In her Dharma talks, she has stressed the priority of Buddhist precepts in personal practice for each individual, which is equally important on the institutional level, because when uh, only when individuals can guard themselves carefully, the whole institution can function well. Um, to be precise, she said, according to um, according to Master Zheng Yan, each Buddhist must follow what the Buddha taught um, to take the Buddhist precepts as your master. Moreover. Each member should love themselves by looking after their own minds and reminding themselves not to make mistakes or talk about other people's faults. Because um, the truth is, according to her, when one cannot love oneself, it's impossible to love another person at all. Buddhist precepts are the effective means to look after oneself. On the other hand, uh, she stated that abiding by the Buddhist precepts cannot be any sort of rigid practice. What is even more crucial than strict observance is to have a correct understanding of the purpose of the precepts. If one treats the precepts as rigid dogmas, it may cause harmful effects in the end. The purpose of the city organization is to love all and to relieve sentient beings from suffering. Hence, Buddhist precepts are not the only guideline um, to abide by. Love is equally important. Along the same line, uh, the great love, or Ai, is the basis of the institutional operation of the Ciji Foundation. Master Zheng Yan said, um, Ciji is a group of the great love. Without such kind of love, Ciji will not be the same Ciji anymore. She also said to provide the great love for human beings is the road to liberation. It's indispensable for individual practice. She further explained that giving and helping sentient beings is a fundamental approach to Buddhist practice. In other words, the great love is the foundation of the Bodhisattva path. This um, interpretation of Buddhist precepts, according to uh, Master Zheng Yan, conforms to the Chinese tradition in general and Chan Buddhism in particular. Chinese eminent monks, such as Dao An, uh, Ma Zu Dao Yi, Bai Zhang Huai Hai, um, all showed their attempts to reformulate monastic rules for the Chinese Sangha. So this is clear evidence that the precepts cannot be rigid and Chinese masters knew it from the outset. Now, this is a, a final part of um, this paper uh, before conclusion. Um, the Ciji community consists of two major groups, the Jing Si Sangha and the Ciji Foundation. On top of this division, uh, Master Zheng Yan created a new format of devout participants whose identity lies between the ordained and the layman, the pure practitioners. The establishment of this new category 
of pure practitioners is a remarkable invention of Master Zheng Yan. This new idea was announced in 2007 and set up in 2019 when the first group of pure practitioners were certificated. These pure practitioners are meant to take the role as a bridge between the Sangha and the society. In terms of precepts and rules, however, they have to abide by all monastic rules except for wearing the Buddhist robe. That means even though the pure practitioners are not ordained, the precepts they uphold have no difference to the monastics. According to Master Zheng Yan's description, the pure practitioners have their hearts ordained, but it's not shown in their outfit. Such a special category of participants is needed because Ciji is an organization that aims to deeply engage with contemporary society for this mission in particular. A specific group of members who are lay and monastic simultaneously is absolutely necessary. The current team of uh, Ciji's pure practitioners consists of highly educated people with degrees from various academic disciplines and professional backgrounds. Um, those pure practitioners, I mean, they are just a small part um, in of a broader picture, picture of the Ciji Foundation. As is well known to us, passionate Buddhist volunteers have formed the lion's share in the composition of the participants of the Ciji Foundation. But as a matter of fact, um, Master Zheng Yan has a sophisticated scheme of the whole organization. All of the volunteers, the workers, and the monastics in Ciji community are modeled after a concentric circle guided by the spirit of love. Backed up by love and respect, all members of the community devote themselves and work in high spirits. Now, conclusion. Um, first of all, um, regarding the Buddhist sources that um, Master Zheng Yan drew on in her formulation of moral codes, she has elaborated on the significance of the Lotus Sutra and the Sutra of Infinite Meanings. She always explains the doctrines through easily understandable examples because, in her view, the Dharma are meant to be suitable for Buddhist followers in our contemporary society. Her interpretation of Buddhist doctrines, however, went beyond these textual sources. She has emphasized undoing over any verbal explanation. She has also innovated a modern presentation of Avalokiteshvara by encouraging the collective work of ordinary people. In other words, she translated scriptures into actions. Second, Master Zheng Yan has put a great emphasis on kindness and compassion in reaching the Bodhisattva path. Furthermore, she has affirmed that um, while Buddhist precepts are important codes, compassion is ultimately the underlying principle for the followers of the Ciji Foundation. Last, on top of the Jingsi Sangha and the Ciji Foundation, uh, Master Zheng Yan created a new category of devout participants, the pure practitioners, whose identity lies between the ordained and the layman. This novel scheme has enhanced the collaboration between the monastic, monastics and the laity. So overall, um, my study aims to bring together the doctrinal um, explanations in Buddhist scriptures and Master Zheng Yan's words and acts, so as to provide a new exposition of, of contemporary Buddhism in practice. It will illustrate how Bodhisattva precepts could be conjured in modern Taiwan through Master Zheng Yan's reinterpretation. Thank you for listening. As our next speaker prepares to take the stage, I want to thank Professor Lean. Uh, she is a an embodiment of what's called what is called in the Lotus Sutra an academic version of self sacrifice, xue shu she shen, and that's giving up your PPT, right? Uh, wu PPT. PPT every day. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Professor Weiren Deng. Uh, Professor Deng is teaches at the Dharma Drum Institute of Liberal Arts. Right. Uh, 
Good morning, uh, first time, sir, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Wei Ten, and I teach at the Dharma, uh, Dharma Dram. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Department of Buddhist Studies, Dharma Dram Institute of Liberal Arts. And I am a board member of Society of Religion in Taiwan. Um, I would like to also thank uh, Professor uh, Harishan Reho and the Chiti Foundation for inviting me back to Harvard for this wonderful and inspiring conference and happy meeting with many uh, friends and colleagues. Um, I'm a scholar of uh, Buddhist textual study and Buddhist philosophy, but in the past few years, I have been interested in contemporary Buddhism and Buddhist modernism. Um, I have been studying Master Shen Yan, <laughs> okay, Master Shen Yan's thoughts of like Tian Tai, uh, Tataka the Garba, um, Right Zhang, and, and his teaching of meditation in the context of Buddhist modernism. But I have to uh, confess that I am very new to Master Shen Yan's thoughts to Shi uh, and to uh, uh, Shi Ji's studies. The preliminary research on Master Trinian's thoughts of the Lotus Sutra is therefore a great learning opportunity for me. The topic of my talk is Lotus Sutra and Master Trinian's Shiji missions. Let me start with some uh, background of the uh, uh, background introduction. The centrality and guiding philosophy of Lotus Sutra in Master Trinian's Buddhist thought and subsequently the Chiji's uh, missions. It's no surprise. And in the language of Lotus Sutra itself, it is the, uh, the result of a profound cause, uh, it was at the age of 21 uh, during her mourning of her newly departed foster father that Master Chen Yan procured and then studied ever since her first Buddhist scripture, the Lotus Sutra. Master Chen Yan began his scriptural lecturing on the Lotus Sutra in 1969, when Chiji Nanari, the, the Jin Se, huh, was established. From 1969 to 1998, she taught the Lotus Sutra during the seven day retreat of recitation of Buddha's name, uh, the, the Nian Fu Qi. Um, in March 20, uh, 2008, during her morning Dharma talks, Master Chen Yan began to lecture on the Threefold Lotus Sutra. She began with the ritual and, verse, uh, ritual and verses chanting, chanted, bowing to the pre preface of the Lotus Sutra and followed with the uh, Sutra of Infinite Meanings. In uh, July, 2009, she officially began teaching the wonderful, the wondrous Dharma uh, Lotus Flower Sutra, Miao Fa Lianhua, Miao Fa Lianhua Jin. Master Zhen uh, Yan intended to carefully explain every word and sentence of the Lotus Sutra. Not only does she integrate the commentaries of ancient masters, she also brings in uh, the content of the Sutra of infinite meanings, as well as the uh, present condition of our planet and current world's affairs. Thus, using the Dharma to in in illuminate the various states of the human mind. Master Chen Yan consults several uh, commentaries composed by Chinese masters. Um, should be... Oh, sorry, um, this here. Um, like, uh, Zhi, uh, sorry, uh, including the profound meaning of Lotus Sutra by Master Zhen Yan, uh, sorry, uh, Zhi, uh, Zhi and, and, and his words and phrase of Lotus Sutra, the Fa Hua Wen Zhi, uh, and critical commentaries on Lotus Sutra by Kui Qi, and the compendium of meaning of Lotus, Lotus Sutra by Oi. Uh, the great companion uh, of the Lotus Sutra by da, uh, da Yi, uh, an exposition of the teaching of the Lotus Sutra by Tai Shi. Uh, the over 
18,000 times uh, lectures were collected under the title of uh, under the title of this one, the Jin Si Fa Sui Miao Lian Hua, uh, the Jin Si Dharma Essence Lotus uh, of Wonder. The Lotus Sutra can be regarded as the founding sutra, uh, which inspired uh, the Chi Ji's foundation's four profound missions and guided by which the Chi missions were carried out. The four, uh, the, four uh, the four profound missions are missions of charity, charity, right? <laughs> Not for uh, philanthropy. Educating the rich to help the poor, inspiring the poor to realize the riches. Mission of, uh, second mission of medicine, uh, patient-centered medical care that respect patients and teachers. Uh, the third mission of education, uh, educating children to be moral and upright. And the fourth mission of culture, recording the uh, examples of goodness and in integrity for future generations. The Lotus Sutra is interpreted and taught by Master Zhen Yan through the lens of her life conviction. Um, uh, Buddha Dharma realized in daily life and Bodhisattva render humanistic uh, uh, and in yesterday afternoon discussion that ideology and philosophy should be best understood and concluded through day-to-day -day routine practices. It is exactly the case that um, that um, the 28 chapters of the Lotus Sutra uh, in Master Zhen Yan's teaching well, were all connected to Chi's effort in down-to-earth social works of disaster relief, helping the poor and the needed mind and body medical care and environmental protection. So uh, in 2009, the beginning of the Lotus Sutra lecture, Master Zhen Yan emphasized the following. Uh, Now, in our current times of chaos, problems are occurring one after another. Uh, one after another. What method uh, can we use to treat the chaos of the modern era? Wondrous medicine only by Buddhas and Bodhisattvas coming to the world can humanity be helped uh, by their prescribing this medicine according to the disease. So the Lotus Sutra, uh, Lotus Sutra is the uh, wondrous medicine that the world needs. How can we help modern people's minds to enter the state of Lotus Sutra? This might take quite a long time, so it may be bad, better to use simple teachings um, to expand the Lotus Sutra as it applies to this world. The Lotus Sutra was delivered by the Buddha for the needs of the sentient beings of his time. So, uh, in delivering the Lotus Sutras in our time, we need to adapt it to our modern condition. Uh, oh, okay. Um, the humanistic principle uh, of Master Zhen Yan's teaching of the Lotus Sutra follows the six Fulfillments, the Liu Chen Jiu, as uh, elaborate in the con uh, Great Compendium, con Compendium of the Lotus Sutra, the uh, Fa Hua, uh, Fa Hua Jin Da Chen, uh, the Liu Shi Chen Jiu. So they are uh, confidence, that is the confidence of Ananda in the Buddha. The second one, hearing the Buddha's teaching heard and memorized by Ananda. Time, the occasion in which the Lotus Sutta was delivered, and fourth, Lord, referring to the Buddha who delivered the teaching, uh, and fifth, place the locus, the, the locus and, and environment where the teaching was delivered. Six, uh, populace uh, refers to the audience to whom the teaching uh, responds. The six fulfillments constitute in an important guidance of how Master Zhen Yan's teaching of the Lotus Sutta could be best understood and carried out. So the confidence in Master Zhen Yan's great vow 
and and great compassion as well as self confidence in each and every Chi practitioner themselves would build a strong Chi solidarity and spirit. The message of the Lotus Sutta was delivered through the soft, patient, patient, um, uh, and persuasive uh, local dialogue of Master Shen, uh, Master Zheng Yan. And the message should be adapted to the temporal, temporal and special context and to the actual needs of the audience. In terms of uh, scriptural ex exposition, Master Zheng Yan follows the compen compendiums of Lotus Sutra closely. Um, nonetheless, she would go beyond the compendium uh, and deliver her own elaboration. For example, uh, while the compendium compares the earthquake of Buddha's awakening to the shaking of the rock heart ignorance, Master Zheng Yan compared it to the shaking of the six indriya, the, that is uh, the sense organs and the six object, uh, sense or objects and the six consciousness in order to awake ourselves. Um, and in another episode, the sun moon in illuminating Buddha Buddha, uh, when he was a king, he has eight princes, while the scripture narrates how the eight princes were inspired by the fathers going forth and attaining Buddhahood. They, the princes, too, uh, renounce their worldly comforts and become uh, disciples. So uh, Master Zheng Yan offered her own interpretation, which uh, would relate the Chi spirit uh, and philosophy. Master Chen Yan relates the going forth, uh, the, the 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 going uh, forth of the prince uh, prince disciples, uh, following their father Buddha, uh, the blood uh, lineage to the lineage of Dharma uh, Fa Mai, and the idea of Dharma lineage, the like Fa Mai. Is an essential concept for the construction of uh, Chi lineage and carry out of and carry out the Chi's missions. Uh, Master Zheng Yan compares quite creatively the eight princes as the eight consciousness, and they are going forth, forth as the uh, purification of the consciousness. Uh, and the eight consciousness are when when the uh, eight consciousness are purified, the Buddhahood is attained. Um, I'm not able to go in uh, to go to the details of Master Zheng Yan's lecture of the Lotus Sutra. Broadly speaking, in her lecture of the first few chapters of Lotus Sutra, follow follows closely the meaning of the Sutra itself. So, uh, message such as the uh, ultimate teaching of the Buddha, the Pratitya Sampada, uh, origin, uh, dependent origination, the atten attaining of the sam uh, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the perfection and complete awakening, uh, the original um, purity of mind, Prabhasara, Prakrit, Prakrit Chitta, and the Buddha nature, the four foundations of my mindfulness, the five indriyas, uh, the four noble truths, the eight uh, noble eightfold path, and so on. As the foundation developed, and examples of social works of the uh, of disaster relief and charity increases, uh, Master Zheng Yan began to fill it in her commentaries with those examples, uh, with names of places. Uh, the uh, names of Chi's volunteers and donors, and so on. The current uh, themes of climate change, environmental destruction, the illness and disease of poor patients, tons of touching, moving, heart, heartfelt, and sometimes shocking stories and pictures find their places in Master Zheng commentary to the Lotus Sutra. Thus, oh wait. <laughs> Thus, uh, the ancient Indian and basically other worldly discourses of the Buddha is now rendered as a sutra of Chi. Uh, I, our Stefania was talking about uh, canonization right, of of Chi. 
so it's now rendered as a sutra of Chiji's spirit and missions, which are uh, present, up to date, happening in our present global village, and mostly this worldly. Lastly, um, I will conclude. I would like to conclude my presentation with a discussion of Master Zheng Yan's teaching of the Lotus Sutra in light of Buddhist modernism. The issue I would like to highlight is the, the, the place of other worldly teaching and practice which are profoundly uh, embedded in Lotus Sutra. So the place of this other worldly teaching in Shriji's missions and and this question can be likewise applied to um, or asked uh, to Fo Guang Shan and Dharma Zhang Mountain as well. We know uh, it has become uh, uh, quite a cliche, a cliche critique of humanistic Buddhism in Taiwan that the emphasis on this world, the well being, could bring about Buddhist secularism um, in which our ultimate otherworldly concerns of Buddhism, namely uh, the cessation of dukkha or the uh, attaining uh, attainment of nirvana tends to be overlooked. Yet, this is a, a theme that uh, Professor Huang, uh, Julia Huang, touches yesterday. She tried to demonstrate a desecularization element of Chiji's effort. Uh, from Buddhist point of view, however, we can um, discuss this I mean, we can discuss this later. Um, from Buddhist point of view, uh, the uh, ob obli uh, oblivion of the profound and ultimate liberation, moksha, um, from our samsaric existence is regarded as a form of Buddhist secularism. The, the otherworldly orientation of the Lotus Sutra is quite apparent. For example, um, our very existence is compared to a house on fire. And a, skill, a skillful means, like a fang bian, huh, um, are adapted to attract the ignorant, to escape from it. Indeed, I don't recall that the text, the scripture, Lotus Sutra, teaches a, a transformation of a fire house into a cozy cabin house or a luxurious mention. So my question is how to carry out this other worldly teaching of Lotus Sutra in Chiji's four great missions, or if the idea of Buddhist moksha, a mere metaphor for the well-being of our mind and body, our society and environment, or if this question matters at all, should we just roll up our sleeve and shui yuan, uh, what will happen will happen following the nature natural course of things? I don't have yet an uh, answer um, yet. I would like to uh, hear what uh, from you all later. Uh, so uh, that ends my uh, presentation and thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Dem. Uh, we especially appreciate your reflections on Buddhist philosophy and to drawing together some of the themes that have already emerged in the conference and connecting them with the questions that you leave us. Uh, I next uh, would like to call to the podium our third speaker for this morning. He needs no introduction, but it's my job to introduce everyone, uh, and that is Professor Reishan He. Of his many uh, thousand arms, uh, I'll just mention one, and that is that um, he uh, comes to us uh, as as you as we all know from Tsuji from Tsuji University. That's one of your arms that I will mention this thank morning. You. So welcome, Professor. Her. Thank you, thank you, Professor um, uh, Tizer. If I have uh, more than two arms, it will be my master Zheng Yan and all the um, effort for the Tsuji volunteers. And actually, uh, the, the reason or the uh, honor I can stand on the stage is really due to the Dharma Master Zheng Yan and all Tsuji volunteers. So um, now I want to present um, uh, the um, uh, Tsuji School of Buddhism. And also, as a Buddhist of a path, we always put other first and then self. That's the really uh, Tsuji's uh, Buddhist of a path. 
uh, I believe that Master Zheng Yan, uh, leading by example, uh, in the early age, that he built a new house to the recipient. And yet, uh, she and her disciple live in a small wooden house that borrowed from the other temple. And also, this kind of example really follow by uh, Cixi volunteers during the disasters, uh, you know, their family or their home been affected, but still they put other first and then themselves. So, so Dhamma Master Zheng Yan was born in the corner of Eastern World, Taiwan. And uh, this is very, you know, the other corner of the Eastern world. In the past 400 years, the small island has undergone nearly 200 years of Western colonial rule. Uh, it's quite familiar with the uh, Western philosophy and not resistance to the Western capitalism and scientism. He has even absorbed them as a part of his culture. So under the historical condition of separation by both the ocean and poverty, Confucianism, however deeply rooted in Taiwan tradition, has not taken a dominant position in Taiwan cultures. And meanwhile, Chinese Buddhism, which developed in the ancient land of China for nearly 1900 years, has a huge influence of Taiwan's cultural and its people view of life. So Buddhism, Confucianism, and Western scientism, these three schools of thought have gradually converged and developed in Taiwan, the frontier of China, as people strive to survive from generation to generation. This three school of thought nurtured and structural force, which allowed Siji to develop and grow strong in Taiwan. And Dhamma Master Zheng Yan with his extraordinary wisdom and personality, I see naturally and creatively has used and further enhanced this humanistic fusion. As the Renaissance began in the small city state of Florence, Italy, Taiwan as an extension of, of China's ancient empire. It is own unique historical destiny and experienced Western capitalism and scientism even earlier. Having been deeply steeped in Western thought, Taiwan, unlike the Chinese mainland, did not strongly resist Western ideal, nor did it experience the struggle contradiction between the concept of Zhong Shui Wei Ti Xi Shui Yong, Chinese knowledge for fundamental principle and with knowledge for practical application or Chen Pan Xi Hua, total westernization, which occurred during the May 4th movement in the early 20th century. All the resulting great social divide and war that occurred due to this contradiction. Confucianism the influence Taiwan, but it never played a dominant ideological position like it was on the Chinese mainland. Taiwan did not have the deep cultural structure of family governed country like a hereditary government where the world is governed by one family of the Confucian feudal society. Because in the last four centuries, over 170 years, it was ruled by Western countries, including Japan. Nonetheless, it did not deep directly embrace Western social uh, civilization, but used uh, Japan as a bridge to set the Western social system, which had been amended by the Mingzhi Weixing, means restoration. Buddhist faith gradually merged with the folk belief and Taoism and has lost its uniqueness and deep ideological foundation. So Buddhism in Taiwan thus tended to dissolve and disappear once a time. However, such a social and cultural atmosphere provide a rich 
and relatively free, wide, and space for the growth of completely civilized thinking. The birth and development of Zhiji in Taiwan is undoubtedly a coincidence and also a necessity in history. The historical necessity, with the soil of the culture, and the historical coincidence, was the appearance of Dharma Master Zheng Yan, an epic thing making religious thinker and leader. She joined these two elements all together. So there is a three stage of the Chinese cultural transformation in the last 5,000 5, years. At the spring and autumn and wearing state period around 700 to 200 BC, the collapse of traditional thought set the stage for the Henry schools of thought until the Han Dynasty, when Confucianism took the dominant position. And in the Wei Jing Nanbei Chao, Wei Jing and North South Dynasty, Confucianism and Taoism merged. The prominent scholars such as Wang Bi and He Yan, through their commentaries on the Lao Zi and Zhuang Zi, integrated the benevolent intention of Confucianism into the Taoism philosophy of non-action Wu Wei, resulting in a harmonious system, synthesis of Taoism and Confucianism. This period of cultural transformation is commonly referred to as the first major fusion of Chinese civilization. The second major fusion of Chinese culture result from the absorption of Buddhist thought, which came from India. Buddhism was introduced to China in the late Eastern Han Dynasty. Its in-depth understanding of the cultivation of human nature and its wealth of book full of inspiring thought drew admiration from Chinese scholars and the large Buddhist following among intellectual forms. Resonate between the Buddhist concept of non-self, Wu, and the Taoism letting things take their own course, Wu Wei, allow Buddhism to gradually take root in China. And during the Tang and Song dynasty, Confucian scholars again absorbed Buddhism ideal, especially in the Northern Song dynasty, scholars such as Wang Yangming and Zhu Xi rejected Buddhism in the beginning but later absorbed Buddhism ideal, and eventually fused Confucianism, which dominated Chinese culture as a Li Xie, set up a scholar school of principle, or Neo-Confucianism, which dominated Chinese culture in nearly 700 years, and eventually led to decline of Buddhism in China. This was the second major fusion of Chinese civilization. Now we move to the third stage of Chinese cultural transformation. During the late Qing dynasty and early Republic period, Chinese culture faced a huge challenge for the third time as Western Gangbo invaded China. The ideological system that led to this challenging period was scientific rationality and capitalism, which took the world by storm. China as a major power in the East, bore the brunt of impact for more than a century. How the Chinese culture of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism absorbed Western scientific rationality was the third phase of great change in Chinese culture. Sichi began in Taiwan, which had already been influenced by Western civilization for nearly 200 years. Siji combined Buddhism, Confucianism, and Western scientific rationality and introduced Buddhism thought into a modern professional domain with a various function. It has extended its influence to more than 128 country and area. From the Chinese to the African, from Indonesia to Philippines, Siji influence has crossed border, ethnic group, and religion. Is 
its universality represent the new civilization of Buddhism, Confucianism and Western rationality and technology combined all together. This new ideal must be the direction for the third fusion and transformation of Chinese cultural system, with Shiji have achieved some initial result in the third great fusion of Chinese cultural system. So such a school Buddhism is uh, emphasized enlightenment through altruism. It's not about obtaining all wisdom first and then proceeding to enlighten all sensual being. Instead, it's about enlighten all sensual being bring to nourish our wisdom, to help all sensual being and cultivate all our compassion until we reach the ultimate enlightenment. In the discussion of altruist thought and practice from the perspective of Buddhist philosophy of interdependent arising, and then expand the inherent logical interconnectedness between the new law of karma and altruistic practice, all dharma originate from nindanas, that we should be compassion to all sensual beings, because everybody is interconnected. Another layer of concept of interdependent right, empathy nature of this independent arising, which is the indictment itself. When one fully understand the emptiness of all Dharma that originate from Nindana, he enter into the reign of the Buddhas. The empathy nature is the altruism itself. As Master Zheng Yan has embodied the Buddhist altruism to be given without asking for anything in return. Giving is an arising. Without ask anything for return is the emptiness in nature. So that's maintain calmness and purity because you are selfless giving. So altruism is the path to perfect enlightenment. All Dharma originate from interdependent arising. So we have to serve people with compassion. Since all things are unified into one, altruism is equal to self-interest. Therefore, all living beings are what we should care for, all being a part of ourselves. This is the fundamental spirit of Buddha compassion, namely unconditional, great, loving kindness and empathetic, great compassion, we so-called Wu Yuan Da Ci, Tong Ti Da Bei. So, Chi altruism emphasizes the compassionate action and selfless giving, and also giving with gratitude, as the Professor Lanner just showed us, giving with gratitude. We bow to the recipient. Altruism is not a practice after enlightenment. That's traditional Buddhism belief. But on the contrary, Altruism is the essence of enlightenment and also enlightenment itself. Without altruism, there will be no ultimate enlightenment. So altruism conveys compassion. We should cherish all essential beings. Altruism conveys rationality. So altruism requires wisdom. And altruism conveys harmony. So altruism to reach human harmony. Apply altruism to the field of economy, governance, environment, science, media, and art is the, uh, the mission of Buddhism and the mission of Tsuji. In the last six decades, Tsuji has uh, applied compassion and altruism to charity, medicine, education, cultural humanity, and environmental protection. And now also from our own perspective, Applied to economy and governance. My book, Economy of Goodness, inspired by Master Zheng Yan and Suji volunteering activities, and also in part inspired by Professor Herman Nander. And that economic goodness provides the common goodness as a result of economy 
and business activities. From the perspective of Buddhism, the world is seen as one, where all things arise and depend on each other due to interdependent origination. There is no individual existence for any entity. Hence, everything in the world is interconnected since the world is one. Self and other are inseparable and the benefit others is equivalent to benefit oneself. Therefore, Bodhisattva follow the principle of other before self and prioritize the salvation of other before themselves. They strive to save others before saving themselves. This is exemplified by compassionate vow of Bodhisattva Siti Gaba, who declare not to attain Buddhahood until hell is empty. Even after attaining Buddhahood, they continue to re reincarnate in the world to help and guide countless sensual beings. Buddha and Bodhisattva continuously came to the earthly realm to save and guide sensual beings. They do not wait until after attain Buddhahood to engage in salvation of others. It's through the ongoing process of saving and guiding sensual being that they ultimately achieve Buddhahood. As a Sakyana Muti Buddha, for example, attain enlightenment after countless lifetime of saving and guiding all sensual beings through many, many eons to achieve this Buddhahood by helping others. Therefore, the aspiration to save all sensual beings, attain all wisdom, nurture all sensual beings, culture, cultivate all compassion until the ultimate realization of the path to Buddhahood, until all sensual beings become Buddha. The complete fulfillment is when the entirety of Buddha nature is fully actualized. And from Master Zheng Yan's word, is great perfect, great nirvana. Make an example. Master Zheng Yan visited an elderly named Su Yu Cheng in Taidong in early 1970s. Su Yu Cheng had various diseases and also have a heart problem. And he told Master Zheng Yan if there is a medicine called Jiu Xing, heart saving medicine, it's very expensive, hard to purchase. He said, if there is a Jiu Xing, I will be, you know, okay, will be, you know, more secure. At the time, Mr. Jenny also experienced the heart problem severely. So someone gave her a heart saving medicine, Jiu Xing, but she immediately asked the volunteer to hand over this medicine to the uh, 80 years old recipient, Su Yu Cheng. This action exemplified the Bodhisattva principle of prioritizing other before oneself. And Master Zheng Yan selflessly offered the medication to Su Yu Cheng, putting the need of others ahead of our own. This is the um, elder recipient back to 1970s. And also in the 1970s, Matt Zheng Yin visited an elderly man called Li Ya Pao, uh, which is also our you know, program. Li Ya Pao was uh, 81 years old at the time and completed the mind and living a solitary and impoverished life. His living condition was extremely challenged, a lack of water and electricity. The Yapa relied on monthly government one hundred and eighty dollars to make living. Met Zheng Yan and, and her five disciples at the time live in a small wooden house, but he built a new seven house to the elderly people, the Yapa, and he became the first villa house of Chiji. Put others first. This is a, the first. A great love house, the Yapo. And now we have a uh, you know great love village in Indonesia and everywhere in the world. More than twenty thousand great love houses been built or worldwide. 
So the compassion vow of Bodhisattva, other before self, may all sensual beings be free from suffering without seeking personal comfort. Even during the earthquake, September 21st, volunteers' own house were ruined, and yet they immediately dedicated themselves to rescue their neighbor and providing food and needed to the disastrous victims. That's also follow the master's step, put other before themselves. And this is uh, during the um, sutra, the Dipan Kara Buddha, Disha uh, He has two prominent disciples, Milu, uh, Maitreya Buddha Sava, and Sakanya Muni Shijia Buddha. And from the uh, uh, Dipan Kara Buddha, he believed that um, Milu Fu uh, benefit himself better than benefit others. He benefit uh, himself more than he benefit others. So the Dipankara Buddha decided to put Sakyamuni Buddha to become Buddhahood. And before Nan Yang, you know, before the Milo Four. That's proof we have to help in others in order to uh, attain the Buddhahood. I think my time has come. So this is also uh, from Yin Sun, a Bodhisattva, though unable to save oneself, is ready to save others. It's from the point that the Bodhisattva initial aspiration arise. And also from Sutra in Finimini, the bold man has an illness, and yet, with the boat, with the Buddha wisdom, he can carry the passenger to reach the uh, enlightenment shore. And when the passenger reach the uh, enlightenment shore, the bold man, the illness of bold man also attend the awakening shore. So I save it to the discussion. The finally, uh, Master Zheng explained the significance of a lotus flower. Lotus flower through the mud nourish his purity and fragrance. Without the mud, there will be no purity of Lotus Sutra. Like, you know, we want to attain Buddhahood. The secular uh, trouble and affliction will be the mud to nutrient our wisdom and compassion until all sensual being enlightened will be enlightened as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we still, uh, for your teachings on the Bodhisattva path, although they're given with no thought of, of return, we still want to repay your teachings with applause. And I'm looking to our MC to confirm that uh, 1030 yes, is yes. when we will resume. And in the meantime, uh, there are refreshments outside. Thank you. Thank you. So we will reconvene again at 1030. Thank you, our panelists. And thank you. And we'll have to take a break.
平怀感恩，珍惜拥有，让我们的世界因真善而完美。爱感恩，真情拥有。
心怀的感恩。珍惜拥有，让我们的世界你真善和完美。见
Thank you, everybody. Our next session is about to begin. Yes. Yes. With the presenters as well as the commentators and moderator, Professor Tyser, also be on stage. Thank you all. And we will begin as soon as everyone is prepared. Thank you.
Uh, before we start, uh, remember to look on the back of your name badge. There is a QR code. And on that QR code, you will find the most updated symposium proceedings, which you probably know by now that have been changed many, many, many times. So in order for any surprises to happen or not to happen, please make sure that you scan that QR code and you get to know what will be coming up next. But what is very certain now is that we will be uh, going into the commentary portion of our discussion number three. And I'll hand it over to Professor Tizer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we're now gonna begin the discussion section. This begins with commentaries uh, and then uh, responses from the panelists and then uh, open audience discussion. And we have up until 11.40 uh, if we wanna use that time. Our first commentator is Professor Megan Bryson of the University of Tennessee. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. Uh, it's a true honor to be here today and to get to respond to these three wonderful papers. I would like to especially thank the person sitting right next to me, um, Professor He, for all of his work in organizing this wonderful symposium. So please join me again in thanking Professor He. Uh, I'd also like to thank, of course, the many volunteers who have selflessly given their time and energy in making this event run so smoothly. Um, so uh, this is the panel on Master Zheng Yan's philosophy. And yesterday, Professor Song Wang raised the question about how we define philosophy um, and urged us to expand our understanding of philosophy beyond the usual suspects to consider how philosophy operates more in daily life. Um, I think this is a, a truly significant point. Um, I also think it speaks very highly to the organization of this symposium that we can have so many it's an intertwined themes uh, coming up already on you know, the second day and the third panel. I think there are other issues we can consider in thinking about how we define philosophy. And this also goes back to the presentation that Professor Reeves gave on the gender coding of charity and philanthropy, because philosophy you know, as a discipline has generally been coded as masculine um, in the sense that most recognized philosophers are men. Um, it's often considered to be a, dis a discipline of great male thinkers. But that's not the only area where we find coding in philosophy. The discipline of philosophy also carries significant colonial and racist legacies in terms of who gets to be considered a philosopher. A lot of philosophy departments in the United States only have scholars working on Euro-American traditions, that they don't necessarily recognize philosophy as coming from other parts of the world. Um, 
So this is then a, a, an issue of epistemic violence as the critical theorist Gayatri Spivak has defined it, namely the violence of discounting certain knowledge as knowledge and only recognizing a very narrow range of concepts or ideas as legitimate knowledge or wisdom. So the question then is, who gets to be a philosopher? Who is taken seriously as a philosopher? And I think all three of these papers made very strong cases for understanding Master Zheng Yan as a philosopher. This does not mean understanding her as a philosopher, for example, like the you know, great men of European philosophy. So we, we might expand our category somewhat to think about what philosophy includes. Um, but I do think each of these papers has demonstrated the deep sophistication of Master Zheng Yan's thought. Um, one of the, the main issues I think that comes up both today and yesterday in these papers um, has to do with the relationship between the two aspects of this symposium the philosophy or Sixiang and leadership or Shijian. And so many presenters have remarked on the challenge of separating these two aspects of Master Zheng Yan's work. I think this is a feature, not a bug. Right? <laughs> this is precisely the point um, that Master Zheng Yan draws on a long tradition of Mahayana philosophy including its metaphysics and ethics to challenge dualities um, and to present a philosophy of non-duality that does not just remain in the realm of abstract thought, but which is embodied and practiced. And I think this has come up in each of the three papers we heard. Professor Lin, um, demonstrated how the pure practitioners, the Qing Xiu Si, shi, sorry, um, bridge and transcend monastic and lay identities. Um, so, so the ways in which monastic uh, and, and lay roles um, are transcended in a non-dualistic way. And of course, non-duality means both not two, but also not one, right? It's not completely melting into one thing, it's saying it's not two, but it's also not one. And I think that is the really critical insight, um, and especially in terms of how it is implemented in the world as practice. Professor Dung um, talked a, a lot about the Lotus Sutras um, concepts that Master Zheng Yan incorporates into her uh, preaching. Uh, and of course, the Lotus Sutra um, presents a, a strong case for upaya, um, but also for the relationship between chen and shi, the provisional and the ultimate, um, and seeing these also as non-dual. Um, we could perhaps think similarly about the issue that um, Professor Dung brought up at the end of his talk, which is the relationship between this world and the other world, and also seeing those as non-dual, as ultimately you know, part of the same system, though not completely collapsed into each other. And then finally, and I think most clearly, Professor He discussed the self-other relationship as non-dual, which is such an important part of Master Zheng Yan's philosophy, and I think is the most kind of innovative aspect of her philosophy in the world for all of the reasons that Professor He explained. So each paper shows us how Master Zheng Yan innovates in bridging this dichotomy of theory and practice. And here we come back to the metaphor of the path, the bodhisattva path. A path is only made by walking it. A path in the absence of people, in the absence of practice, is not a path. It's just a place. <laughs> yeah. It's cement, yeah. Um, and I think that one of the really critical things in Master Zheng Yan's work 
is to take these very abstract concepts such as non-duality, um, you know, such as the sort of non-duality of self and other in particular, and put them into practice. Because as hard as some of these concepts are to grasp, actually implementing them is way harder. Um, that's why most of us as professors prefer to, you know, keep our work in the classroom because we know how hard it is to do the work out in the world, you know, with people. Of course, we talk to students, which is its own challenge sometimes, but, um, it, you know, it's it's very hard to, to do that work. Um, and I think that these uh, innovations that Master Zheng Yan has made with Buddhist philosophy and practice are not only important for Buddhist philosophy and for philosophy in general, but also for the philosophical underpinnings of leadership. And we heard of, uh, about this some from Professor Leonard already, um, but I, I've, I've taught a class on religion and nonprofit leadership at my institution. Um, and one of the books I assigned is a book called Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton. Um, and the book focuses on ways in which charitable efforts can go horribly wrong when people are giving in a self-centered way. Because, you know, if, if you're giving because of what you care about and what makes you feel good and don't think about the recipient and where they're coming from, that's ultimately not helping anyone. <laughs> Um, and I think that the self-other identification, that non-duality that especially came through in Professor He's paper, helps to really prevent a kind of toxic charity um, that puts the giver above the receiver, um, a kind of charity that can be condescending or paternalistic and doesn't take into account what the receiver needs and wants and what is meaningful to that person. So this recognition of self and other as interconnected, um, that that I think makes a tremendous contribution to understanding you know, nonprofit work or relief work across a wide variety of, of contexts. I don't think that you know, is only applicable to Tsuji. Another area where I think there's a lot of potential um, for Master Zheng Yan's leadership style to be very impactful is in the specific understanding of compassionate leadership. I had a student who wrote a paper about this last year, and one of the things he encountered was you know, seeing how the concept of compassionate leadership has been appearing more and more in some scholarly literature since the pandemic. Um, and compassionate leadership uh, is especially used for healthcare contexts, um, where this idea of identifying with the people you are helping and trying to understand um, your team compassionately. Um, th this is something that's coming up on a global scale. And I think this is also an area where people could have much to learn from Master Zheng Yan's compassionate leadership that has this doctrinal philosophical underpinning of non-duality of self and other, and is also active in the world um, to you know, make a, an important difference. So I think there's a lot of, of great potential here. So the questions, um, to, to shift focus slightly, I would invite any of the presenters to respond to any of what I have just said, um, but I have a couple of relatively smaller questions for, for each of you. Um, one concerns uh, the concept of da ai, um, or great love. Um, and, and this is in part a, a question about how you understand this da ai in connection to the, you know, perhaps more established Buddhist concept of tzibay, of compassion, um, especially as it relates to Master Zheng Yan's philosophy overall. Um, so, so that relationship between da ai and tzibay, um, how, how it relates to the bodhisattva path in particular. Um, and, and I'm especially interested again in what each of those concepts mean for how people understand their 
identity or their relationship to others. Um, the other question takes us back to one of the papers from, from yesterday from Professor DeVito who talked about um, Mofa um, and the, the age of the final Dharma. And I think when we're talking about doctrines and philosophies, one of the you know, qualities associated with the age of the final Dharma is that it becomes more difficult to grasp those abstruse uh, philosophies, the, the abstract doctrinal concepts. And so I just have a, a quick question of how you see Master Zheng Yin's philosophy and preaching, especially how she chooses to adapt these doctrinal uh, concepts, these scriptures, you know, into practice, um, the extent to which you see that is responding to Mofa, um, you know, age of final Dharma concerns. Um, so with that, um, I, I thank you again for um, those three wonderful papers, and I, I hope we have a lot of time for um, more discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bryson, for your capacious and incisive and relatively brief comments. Uh, I'm happy to introduce Professor Justin Ritzinger of the University of Miami, our next commentator. So I'm very happy to be here, uh, very happy to be at this conference, uh, to be back in Cambridge uh, and to have the opportunity to sing, uh, hopefully quite briefly, for my supper lunch, breakfast, airfare, and lodging. Uh, so this has been a, uh, I want to first thank uh, Dr. He, I want to thank the organizers, uh, the foundation, and all of the volunteers that have made this possible, uh, and all of the presenters that have made this such a wonderful conference. Uh, I've learned so much from all of the presentations uh, and all of the discussions that they have sparked. Uh, it serves as kind of a challenge to be a respondent at this point in such a wonderful conference. Uh, what can I possibly add? to what has been said already, uh, perhaps not much. So if you'll allow me, uh, I will transmit and not innovate. Sure, uh, I'm just going to try to take some of the key themes that I've seen so far uh, and kind of bring them together and ask the uh, presenters to address them. So some of the key themes that I've seen uh, in the conference so far uh, is the theme of tensions, uh, the theme of scale, of change, and of identity. So I wanna begin by asking the presenters, what are the tensions that they see uh, in their various topics? Uh, tensions don't necessarily have to be bad. They can be productive, uh, they can be generative, they can really fuel the growth of a movement or of a system of thought as people try to uh, navigate their way between these opposing pulls and pushes. Uh, Dr. La Liberté uh, yesterday talked about the tension between whether you grow the movement or whether you deepen the movement. Uh, right? Dr. Huang talked about secularizing versus sacralizing, uh, and she has her article on the body donation is wonderful for that. Uh, if you teach a lot of pre-med students like I do, uh, it's a really great article uh, to teach with as well. Um, and right, uh, Wang Song Zhao Shou talked about the tension between Ju Ti and Chou Xiang, right? Between the concrete and the abstract. And so I wanted to pose this issue uh, to uh, our presenters here. Uh, so for uh, Dr. Lin and Dr. Dung, right, what are the kind of strains in interpretation uh, that you see, right? Everyone who interprets necessarily interprets from a particular historical moment and context that's different than the ideas or the text that they're interpreting. Uh, and operate with this kind of logic of presumed consistency, but sometimes where there is some tension between the interpretation and the original text or ideas, we can really find uh, where some of the work of interpretation is really being done. So kind of what is she reading it through? Uh, what is she reading the precepts through? What is she reading uh, the, uh, the Lotus Sutra through? Uh, for Dr. Lin in particular, uh, I'm curious about the pure practitioners and what the tensions of that role might be. Uh, sort of midway between uh, Chu Jiazhong and Cai Jiazhong. Uh, for uh, Wei Ren, um, I'm wondering about the choice of the lotus and the fact that this puts her in the Tatagata Garba system uh, from Yinshun's point of view. Does this put her in some kind of tension with Yinshun's idea because she's focused on the Tatagata Garba strain uh, for Dr. He? 
uh, you offer the sort of broad sweep of history. And when you went back to uh, the initial context of contact with the West, uh, it reminded me of Tian Yong. Uh, so I'm wondering if that is an applicable framework for Tsuji. Uh, if so, what is the T, what is the Yong, uh, and what is the relationship? Um, because one of the things that's come up is we have, you know, we have hospitals, we have sort of the secular NGO side, and then we have the Buddhist teachings. So is that the T? And then the, the missions are the Yong, and what's the relationship between them? Uh, is perhaps Zheng Yan herself uh, the T in this analogy? Um, and also, what is the tension, or what can we think about in the tension between uh, Zili and Li Ta, right? Between benefiting oneself and benefiting others. Ultimately, they're identical, but that's really only at a certain level of cultivation, right? But when you're just Chu Xin Pu Sao, right? When you're just starting off in the path, Zili and Li Ta can be in tension. So in the uh, Diamond Sutra, right? The reason that the Bodhisattva has to realize emptiness is because only once you've realized emptiness can you really help all sentient beings without attachment. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, where we can see uh, those tensions and what we might learn from them. Uh, in terms of scale, uh, both in time and space, uh, I was wondering if Dr. Lin could put uh, her discussion of precepts in the context of the very long path. Uh, so what about after this life, what about the kind of long sweep of the Bodhisattva path, uh, right? Siji wants to ren jian hua uh, Buddhist doctrines, but at least for figures like Taishu, there's all still this broader scope uh, involved. Uh, in terms of space, I was wondering if you could bring it into dialogue with Sri Lanka, uh, right? The idea of the pure practitioners, of course, looks a lot like Dharmapala, uh, at least on the surface. The precepts uh, that Siji adds also sounds a bit like Dharmapala um, for uh, Dr. Dung, one of the things that struck me, and we talked a little bit about this, but when you showed the slide for how many episodes there was for each chapter, what does the sheer length of this sermon series do, right? I'm thinking it almost in terms of literature. What does it mean to have a sutra lecture that goes on that long? Does the form somehow affect uh, the content in some way, uh, or does the form do something? Uh, also, the question of why this particular text? I mean, the Lotus Sutra is very particular. It's maybe the most self-referential text in the Buddhist tradition. Some people have said it's almost like an empty placeholder because it talks so much about itself. It tells a lot of stories. Is there something special about this text uh, versus maybe others that she might have chosen, the Vamalakirti, uh, what have you? Uh, for Dr. He, right, you had such a vast historical sweep. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could go maybe a little bit in the other direction. When you talked about the West, uh, you lumped Japan in with the West, and I can see why you did that. Uh, but I also wonder if you could address ways in which that particular legacy uh, might have been important. Because as we talked about yesterday, there are certain resemblances between Tsuji and some of the newer religious movements in Japan. Uh, is there something from that Japanese colonial heritage uh, that was particularly important? Uh, the third theme is change, uh, right? There has been a good deal of change uh, in the Tsuji movement over time, uh, including over the last 20 years. Uh, so I'm wondering if there has been a sort of fo shui hua uh, to Tsuji, right? A new emphasis on Buddhist thought and Buddhist ideas that maybe might not have been uh, as strong before, at least from the outside appear not to have been as strong before. Um, I'm wondering if uh, some of the criticism of Tsuji in the mid uh, 20 teens had any effect on this. Uh, and if the impending post Jung Yen era uh, has some bearing on this as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, the question of identity. Uh, somebody yesterday, I forget exactly who, said that Buddhism and Tsuji are not identical, uh, which I thought was was a nice way to phrase it. And people have talked about right Buddhism, they've talked about secular NGOs, uh, they've talked about um, Confucianism. Uh, and it strikes me that if you look at the things that really make Siji distinct, a lot of them really are none of these things, right? So I'm thinking especially of the things that Julia talks about in her book, uh, right, with the circulation and the role of emotion and disciplined bodies, uh, they're really quite distinct. So I'm wondering between Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, secular NGO, uh, and sort of sui generis, like what is Tsuji and in what proportion or maybe in what way? 
Uh, and I'm also wondering, because there's been some talk about um, secularization, you know, if we always have to privilege uh, Western terms. So one of the things that I was thinking about is Fang Nei and Fang Wai uh, in the indigenous tradition. Is this not a secularization, but maybe some kind of a Fang Nei Hua, right? Since Confucianism doesn't occupy Fang Nei in the same way that it used to, is there a sense that Buddhism is moving into that Fang Nei space rather than simply being secularized? So thank you very much. Uh, Ganen. Thank you very much, Professor Ritzinger, uh, who, whose comments are capacious, incisive, and even briefer. Uh, that reminds me that I believe in our session, we will have more time than before for the audience to post questions and engage in discussion afterwards. So I want to encourage everyone to begin thinking now uh, about your own comments and your own questions, uh, both to panelists and about the conference in general. Uh, first, I'm going to turn to our three panelists who will go in order, beginning with Professor Lean. Thank you. Um, wow, that's very challenging, I think, to respond. I feel we, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so I'll try because I think all your um, comments are very insightful and I have been digesting all of them <laughs> myself. So um, I think, um, but but one thing um, very interesting is that both uh, of our commentators um, seem to highlight the pure practitioners in particular. So I think this is a very interesting topic for us. I mean, um, I have to admit that um, when, when I was doing this research, I mean, I had paid, uh, I went to Hualien um, for a field trip. And then I was looking for the sources in their library, but um, for pure practitioners, um, there isn't so much um, written yet. And also a lot of them are like internal sources. So I think I the next step uh, for me is to um, interview uh, those pure practitioners. I want to know more about them because I think it's a really, really, important um, new scheme that uh, Master Zheng Yan um, has invented. But um, I mean, according to your comments, I mean, you are looking at it from different perspectives. I mean, one is um, um, Professor, uh, I mean, um, how to pronounce your surname? Bresson. <laughs> um, Professor Bresson is talking about the non-duality, which I think would be um, what I think is, you know, the, really the core or the, the essence of um, this scheme. I think um, Master Zheng Yan wanted to have something which transcends this non-duality. But um, Professor Riesinger is talking, asking me about the tension, you know, like the zai jia and chu jia, could there be any tension? So, I want to know what the pure practitioners um, say themselves, because I think if there is a tension, it has to be um, from their experience. I mean, when they, you know, they are the bridge between the lady and the, the Sangha. So um, would it be more convenient to, to not wear a robe or would that be confusing for, for their own identity? I don't know. So I think um, the answer is, um, you know, I don't have an answer. I, I want to know about that. Um, yeah, so this is about the, you know, the non-duality and the tension. Um, but for, uh, another question about uh, the Bodhisattva path that um, Professor um, Bresson is um, asking, I think, uh, this is also what I was um, emphasizing in my paper. I was saying that um, uh, Master Zheng Yin, he, he, she didn't want to talk so much about um, doctrines, right? I mean, this is clear. Um, and I totally agree that implementing um, the doctrines or the ideas is actually uh, much harder than saying it or, or explaining that. So, um, all the Cixi volunteers have this impression, um, uh, so doing is very important. And now I think, um, you know, when I reflect on this, I think 
um, you know, the Buddha himself doesn't want to talk so much about, you know, he, he's not interested in uh, making a system of his own teachings, right? So he's always um, uh, using stories or, you know, daily life situations to explain, you know, how we should respond when you have any problems or, uh, um, so, I mean, now I think we, we are a little bit like the Abhidhamma authors. We are trying to theorize um, what the Buddha is doing or what uh, Master Zheng Yin is doing, but still, I mean, the most, in, she's very different from us. I mean, she um, does things that, um, you know, we can only just kind of try to guess. Yeah, so this is um, what I found very interesting about um, the, the feature of her Bodhisattva path, okay? So I, I want to um, develop that in my paper in the future, okay? And then um, uh, one question from uh, Professor Riesinger about this um, tension. <laughs> and um, I am trying to think of uh, the major uh, tension that I, encountered when I read the, their um, sources. I think perhaps the 10 precepts, uh, would be the very uh, more debatable. I mean, the tension I would imagine, uh, the tension would be some people would think it's too um, simple or too, um, how to say, to um, because, you know, like um, to obey the traffic rules, this kind of thing would never appear on the Buddhist scripture, right? But but it's really practical. So I guess the tension uh, for master, no, not for him, for the followers or actually for us would be um, when you when you when you have the regulations, um, do you want very clear and very um, sophisticated ones or you want very simple ones? I think that would be one tension, uh, but perhaps this tension is not uh, Master Zheng Yin's tension, it's tension, you know, for people who, um, I don't think she has any problem about thinking about that. I mean, she's just um, trying to uh, uh, do things that which is, you know, practical and which is good, uh, beneficial for the practitioners. So, I, I mean, this is, you know, yeah, the 10, um, Siji 10 precepts would be the case, yeah. Thank you, but yeah, a lot of uh, um, inspirations that I, I I've um, found that I can continue to work for the final paper. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. Uh, we're now going to turn to uh, Professor Dung for his response. Sure. Um. Thanks for the very uh, concise and um, uh, uh, comments, but uh, tough questions, big questions. Uh, da wen, huh? Um. In terms of uh, you're asking about uh, uh, Chiji's uh, concept of Da Ai versus uh, the uh, or Da Bei, huh? that, is, that is talk about uh, in Buddhist text, I would like to I think um, to 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 come back to the, the 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 question of language itself. So I've been thinking back and forth, uh, locating modern uh, modern concept um, in uh, native uh, Buddhist terms. Uh, not 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 only Chinese Buddhist terms, uh, vocabularies, but uh, Indian uh, vocabularies. So yesterday we were talking about giving, uh, charity. So I was thinking, oh, um, the the Indic terms will be dana, and dana is masculine, <laughs> uh, and so uh, also a secular secular versus um, secular versus uh, sacred, right? Uh, and in Buddhist terms will be. Laukika and uh, uh, Lok Lokotara, uh, so Shi Jian and Chu Shi Jian, um, and several other uh, other terms, uh, like um, non duality, uh, near Bikalpa. Uh, so I think the the ma the meaningful mentions of 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 the um, the modern concepts and the Buddhist native uh, terms are. Uh, it's difficult, and and we should um, we should be very careful uh, to um, as to dis distinguish and 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 uh, to distinguish them. Um, and I think I'm not sure, but I maybe you are not happy with this. But I I don't think uh, 
action itself would resolve or uh, naturally bring out uh, a desired uh, uh, result. Um, okay, uh, so uh, in terms of tension, uh, Tataka de Gaba, I think yeah, for, for those who are familiar with this um, concept is that uh, there are there's there are two meanings that or uh, our uh, sentient beings are regarded as the embryo of of Tathagata. So we will eventually potentially um, uh, grow into a, a Buddha a Tathagata, or we are the carrier of uh, of the Buddha or Tathagata. So uh, each and every of us there's a Buddha living uh, inside. But Venerable In Shun doesn't seem to be uh, doesn't seem to um, Appreciate the, the, the idea of Tathagata Garba, right? Zhang Hao Shi Xiang. Um, as, because I think he he think the Tathagata Garba uh, thought privileged, uh, universal privileged origin essence, and considered as ultimate. But um, uh, but but the 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 phenomenon, uh, and the particulars, uh, are deemed regarded as provisional. So uh, that idea seems to resemble uh, the Brahmin, Brahminic idea of Brahman. Uh, um, but in, in case of uh, Master Singh, although uh, she uh, the whole, the, uh, like our, the globe as a whole, the society as a whole, uh, Chiji Foundation as a whole, um, I think she does um, pay attention to uh, individuals. Uh, she doesn't really emphasize the, the, the term Tathagata Garba so much. She, instead, she emphasized Buddha nature. She used Buddha nature for Xin. And uh, therefore, uh, each and every one of us has this for Xin. So I think there she also pay attention to each and every individuals. I think the tension probably not um, not between uh, 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 insurance and <laughs> you you brought this because uh, Master Zhenyan's disciple of Master Yinshan, right? So, um, but the tension is not so much between uh, Master Zhenyan's uh, insurance uh, interpretation of Tanaka uh, Garba versus Master Zhenyan, but I think the tension is be between the whole and the individual, um, which is to be uh, uh, privileged. And thank you for uh, bring uh, bring uh, my intention to the this format or the length of the discourse of uh, of Master Zhenyan's teaching of Lotus Sutta. And uh, it, we know uh, how, how we know uh, Lotus Sutta or the, the this. Uh, large Mahayana Buddhist text. It's not only a text that we, uh, it's not the text that is important. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, the, the the content or the message itself um, is not the only uh, important element of Mahayana Sutras, but the, the sutra, the format uh, itself also important. Um, so in Delivering the Lotus Sutras in such a over still, Master Zhen is still doing that every morning now, and it's been a thousand eight hundred talks already. Uh, in doing that, it seems to me that um, it's a, a ritual act. So we know uh, we worship uh, Mahayana Sutras. We even worship each and every character of the sutras, right? So it seems to me, uh, uh, Master Stranger is doing that. Um, I watch each and every uh, character of, of the Lotus Sutra by, um, you know, uh, deli deli uh, delivering uh, this this sutras every morning. It's a kind of ritual you know, gesture. Thank you very much, Professor Deng. Uh, and we turn to Professor He to uh, offer his response. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Besson, and also uh, 
uh, um, Justin. Um, so they, they are raised a very important and very essential question for Tsuji and also for Buddhism about the uh, tea, uh, essential philosophy and Jung, the application. So I think uh, for the master Zheng Yan and also for the Buddhism itself, uh, the fundamental or ultimate indictment were perceived as um, interdependent rising and emptiness in nature. This two thing, I think is the core philosopher, core philosophy of Buddha as well as Master Zheng Yan. So uh, uh, I think because the interdependent rising, so everything is interconnected. So we perceive the whole world is one. So Master Zheng always say the Buddha nature uh, is to merge into all truth and all being a one. So you had to follow all truth, like a Buddha. Uh, he said, I'm the only you know, holiness you know, uh, among the planet, but the only one, that only and one has been, he followed the truth, he become the truth itself. So, uh, so this is very uh, so-called tea, as a very, very fundamental essential philosophy is that we have to, uh, you know, cultivate our Buddha nature. And what's Buddha nature? Father all truth and cherish all beings. So that's the essential philosophy of Master Zheng Yan and also uh, the Buddhism philosophy. And how to practice it? And you so-called Da Ai, right? Great love. Great love is built in a love relationship with every being. No matter it's human being or material being. So Master Zheng Yan say, cherish all material life, because material can convey life. An iPhone, a microphone, everything can be alive. So how to practice this kind of Buddha nature? You have to cherish all sensual being and build love relationship with every being, no matter it's human being or sensual being. So that's the very practical way. So we response every arising, we so-called interdependent rising. We we response every countering, every uh, ingrain, uh, every uh, rising by love, not by hate, by give, not by taking, by blessing, not by jealousy. So by this kind of uh, practice, you are going to transfer your big karma in the consciousness to the good seed. So Master Chang said, you cherish all countering, all in yuan, all arising, response in positive way. And that will transform your store consciousness. All the seeds in the store consciousness will transfer to good seeds. So we cherish every people, every being we encounter and transfer it from the negative to positive. So we have to cherish all the arising through the yin we cherish all the yin yuan. So that's the very, very practical way for you to practice how to become a Buddhahood or how you become, you know, from the secular lay person to a very good practitioner. You cherish all arising, all being, transfer your back seat to the good seas until you, you attain the ultimate enlightenment of Buddhahood. And and very, very practical way, Master Zheng asks you to give selfless. Especially charity is a good way to practice selfless giving. But you have self. It's hard to be selfless giving. So Master Zheng said, hey, giving with the gratitude. You start yourself. Gratitude. Express gratitude when you are giving. So that with gratitude, Giving. You learn to be humble, not arrogant. You learn to be really comply with the precept because if you are very egocentric, there's no way for you to give with gratitude. You also feel, oh, I'm so proud, I'm arrogant, I'm good. So you learn how to be humble and then you hold to uh, you comply with the precept. That's the sick parameter. You give selfless, bushi, and then you comply precept. You have to be humble and also, you know, very, very low profile yourself. So you comply precept. You learn how to tolerate. Even you do good things. 
you face a lot of criticism. People criticize you from different way. You have the tolerance. And also, even those who criticize you, you have to try to inspire them to do good things. That's called diligence, jing jing. And then if every people get along with you with a positive and low relationship, you will achieve calmness, really calmness, because there's nothing that can really agitate you or stir you up you know, to become angry. So you reach the state of calmness and purity, and then the wisdom will come. So actually the Siji Buddha path can really practice Liu Du Buddha, six parameter to reach the enlightenment. And that's we saw Ti Gen Yong and also uh, you know, response to the Reisinger's, uh, Professor Reisinger's uh, a question about Zi Li and Li Tang. Zi Li in Buddhism is not different. It's different from the Western idea that I seeking for self-interest. Zi Li from Buddhism is that I cultivate myself first. I purify my own sin first. And then I support people. There was a priest called uh, Damien, Catholic priest. In the 19th century, he went to Hawaii he take care of the leprosy patient. He was not a doctor. So people criticize him, how can you take care of the le leprosy people? He said, people suffer, people bleeding, and I, I just saw it. So I have to purify myself until I become a Buddha, so I can help him. It's, it's really ironic. It's, it's, it's not right It's a human being. You are not perfect, but you can help people. That's the Buddha's Bodhisattva way. And you, Every people you help, you accumulate your wisdom and cultivate your compassion. The more people you help, the more difficulty you face, and the more compassion and wisdom you, you may generate. Until you face no any difficulty to enlighten all sensual beings, you become the Buddhahood. So this non-duality, right? It's like, hey, I have to purify myself first, and then I take care of people. People are suffering over there. They're bleeding, they're hungry, uh, they, they have no house. So we're helping them. So like an a infinite sutra, infinite meaning sutra saying that the boatman can carry the passenger to the offshore of enlightenment. We are all illness, uh, you know, ill boatman. Like we are sinner, as a Catholic saying. But we can still helping people by what? By Buddha teaching. So the bow is Buddha teaching. The bow is the organization that can carry you to the state of enlightenment. And from the message, you know, her saying is that when the passengers reach the state of enlightenment, the bowmen also reach the offshore of the enlightenment. So that's the city and lead, huh? You cultivate yourself, and as well as you helping others, the more you helping others, the more you can cultivate your wisdom. So it is also non duality, uh, you know, uh, philosophy also paradox, uh, you know, philosophy, and uh, also a uh, very important uh, question is a uh, Japanese colony uh, in Taiwan. I. I I am not expertise on this, uh, you know, um, uh, Japanese influence on Taiwanese Buddhism. According to uh, Ahun, <laughs> she has introduced some about you know Buddhism in the colonial age and early uh, early age of uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, republican period. And at the time, I believe that less known, and also the female uh, may not be ordained like a zai jiao. So actually. From my very, very rough understanding, Japan has not really good impact on Taiwanese Buddhism. Until after the 14, uh, 1949, when the Han Buddhism returned to Taiwan to reinstate the you know, traditional ordain for the nun and monk. But what I'm saying is that Japan, after the Mingzhi Weixing, has a lot of influence on the westernization of Taiwan. So that's what I'm mentioning about, you know. So they learn westernized uh, idea from Japanese after the Minzhu Weixing. So, and the Buddhism and NGO uh, and the Confucianism, I think Confucianism emphasize on practice. And also, like uh, Richard Gombrich is saying, that Master Zheng Yan uh, employ Confucianism 
to instate the original teaching of Buddha. Because Confucianism emphasizes on practice, so is Buddha. Buddha taught us you had to practice eight, eight normal food and four Im, Im, immeasurable heart, you know, and then so you can reach the enlightenment. He is not only teaching, <laughs> there's Richard Gombri saying that Buddhism is not about only meditation. It's about the practice in the daily life, you know, to get rid of greed, desire, and until you really purify yourself. So I think this is a, a, a very important for this kind of practice to be a good Buddhist practitioner. And, um, and, and layman and monastery practitioner, I don't see it. It's a big difference. It's, you know, Bo Wen Yan, CEO, and I are lay person. But Master Zheng Yan treat us is uh, quite equally, right? I'm also added the uh, master's teaching. So as those uh, our masters, we all together, 50 Dharma masters and myself work together, and including Hong Lao Shi, we all added master's teaching, Lotus Sutra. So I, I think Master Zheng Yan treat lay person as she treat, uh, you know, monastery practitioners and Qin Xiu Shi as well, because that's the basic philosophy. Av essential being convey Buddhahood. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, following on these great uh, comments, uh, we open the floor to to questions from the audience. And uh, if we could also uh, have microphones, please, uh, Director Director Yen. Thank you very much for uh, it's a great talks and uh, I learned a lot from your discussion and uh, don't feel pressure. I'm not bringing question for you. I, actually, I'm bringing answer uh, regarding the pure petitioner. And we have two real petitioner here in this chamber. Uh, our uh, three, okay. So Joe Huang, you want to explain to us what is pure petitioner? And my special assistant, uh, Sean Tan. Okay, sure, please. Yes, uh, thank you. We have three here today. And uh, just to, uh, to share with all of you, this afternoon, there's going to be a session where we're going to share more about pure practitioners. So if it's okay, we will wait until that time. And we are really happy and, and, and joyous so that we could we could hear your feedbacks as well as uh, uh, your, 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 um, your guidance on how else we could work with the lay group, with the lay group. Thank you. Thank you very much. So really, we have oh, a this provisional uh, answer. Well, maybe I can explain the, what is uh, Tsuji's volunteers. Uh, you see that the Tsuji volunteers, we have two kinds of volunteers. Uh, one is 35 volunteers. Once certified, it takes two, three years tra training and incubation program. And once you certify, we call it commissioner, Wei Yuan. And the commissioner, in my uh, explanation, is commit mission person. That is commissioner. So that's why, you know, you see that Sushi volunteers, they are so dedicated to commit Master Zhenye's mission. And what is Master Zhenye's mission is from her uh, uh, in you know, Master in for Buddhism, for all sentient beings. That is our mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we look forward to this afternoon's uh, uh, revelation of the full teaching uh, from the pure practitioners. Uh, I see uh, Professor Robson has a question here. And I'm looking for other questions. Great. See in the back. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, this actually follows on the previous, and since we'll hear more about uh, Tzuchi's actual, the practitioners of these Qingxiu Shi, the pure practitioners, we can wait to hear about that. But 
I think any uh, there's been a lot of claims about the innovative nature of this uh, category. Um, and uh, innovation always needs to be treated with care. You sit a historian in a room and uh, inevitably they will say, uh, actually, uh, the term and the category has existed for a very long time across the East Asian Buddhist tradition from China to Korea to Japan, uh, but it's been flying in the dark. Um, and it's literally been flying in the dark because the term they used was a bian fu sung, which means a bat monk, uh, or sometimes they called it a niao shu sung. Uh, the, and this gets to uh, Meg's, Megan's question or point about non-duality. A niao shu sung is a bird mouse monk. Uh, because a bat uh, has always defied taxonomical categories, uh, can't be split. It's the only mammal with flight, and therefore it was impossible to categorize. So the term uh, was picked up by Buddhists as early as Kumara Jiva. He uses this in a fourth century uh, text called the Fu Zhang Jing, and it gets picked up in all the Vinaya, it gets picked up in commentaries, gets used, but it seems to have fallen out of uh, much knowledge. And that term was used in a positive way and a negative way. The negative way was any Buddhist, a monk who did not keep the precepts, was called a bian fu sang, or uh, because they were no longer acting like a monk. Lay people uh, were the positive use of that term uh, because they were keeping the precepts, yet they didn't dress in monastic robes. So they were called a bian fu sang. And the most obvious, famous case of this is in Japan with Basho, with uh, Basho as a bat. Uh, he uh, took this very proudly as his his name. Uh, so I think that this um, uh, could present, a, you know, the 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 uh, canonical text reads that it's a si sung fei sung si su fei su fo wei zhi niao shu sung. So it's a perfect uh, case of non-duality and uh, also not collapsing it into a singularity as well. Um, so uh, the bat in the Western context obviously has negative connotations with vampires and all of that. In East Asia, the bat was a very positive image. This was a bringer of wealth and prosperity and all of that. So I could see new iconography for the uh, Suqi, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, this category you know, could be revived, uh, but uh, neologisms always make you more famous than drawing on uh, old technical terms. But uh, just to say that the innovative aspect of that, yes, she's innovating in the and adding, I think, uh, and paying point the extra uh, aspects to the bodhisattva precepts, which are interesting, but the category and dealing with this problem of those who uh, 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 fall between a monk and a lay person has been around and thought about for a very long time. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I'm going to forego responses and, and ask for more questions. And I see one in the back row. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, if we could have a microphone to the to the uh, women in the back, woman in the back. Thank you. Uh, maybe if you speak 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 louder into it. No, still not working. <laughs> Sorry. We'll get you another one. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. great. So first of all, I like to thank the. Uh, Professor Ho for inviting myself and my husband to this uh, forum. It's been a great occasion to learn about some of these great research and interests of the Buddhism theory and also of veteran Sheng Yan. So uh, my question is really in relation to uh, in your article, Dr. Uh, Professor Ho, that you mentioned about the interconnectedness, right? Because we see in your theory, either from the theoretical perspective or from cultural perspective or historical perspective to understand how uh, veteran Zheng Yan interprets uh, Buddhist theory. So my question to you is really, how do you perceive the interconnectedness have changed or evolved from the first 20, 30 years when uh, veteran Zheng Yan first started her teaching until the reason, the most for instance, 10 years? because I study sociology. So my view of how people come to perceive and react to certain either theory or thinking or teaching, for instance, this interconnectedness has this very peculiar sociological, social historical circumstances. So how has this perception changed or evolved in the past 10 years versus the prior 10 years from your perspective? Uh, brief response, please. Uh, yes, if you wish. Uh, uh, brief, please. 
<laughs> How brief. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I think this interconnectedness is, uh, is a very basic philosophy of Master Zheng Yin. As I mentioned that, the three others first, and then herself. And so as a volunteer follow her model. And but when the organization become bigger and bigger, the interconnectedness become, you know, have to be transformed. And so, you know, I think she innovate like a musical chanting sutra to everyone can join together uh, to share the, the changing sutra with the music, with the different side languages. And for that kind of a platform, people can interconnect it with each other, no matter he or she is a physician or professor or volunteer or taxi driver, we can all interconnect it with each other. And so as uh, uh, in the disaster side, you know, we are all wear uniform and we are all equal to provide relief to the people. So it, it transformed, but never changed the basic fundamental philosophy of interconnectedness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Su Jiao Shou, Professor La Liberté. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief in the interest of time because I prepared a long introduction to my question, but I'll go straight to, to the point. Very inspiring. And in your three presentation, I saw one thread running through. And this is about Zheng Yan's philosophy. This is not about religious doctrine. And philosophy change, philosophy adapt to the time. And the lesson I have retained from our conversation so far is that the world has changed, Suji has changed, and I have a question that I know is always controversial, but I think I need to raise it. And I hope, and I humbly suggest, or oh, sorry, I don't dare to suggest, but I would like to see what would be the response of the panelists, and in particular, uh, Professor Ha, what can you tell us about the possibility that Zheng Yan Fasha would consider, um, because I know that her philosophy is changing and adapting, and how likely would she be to reconsider or, or rethink or reformulate? I think reformulate would be better. The 10th percent that was so concisely uh, presented by Professor Lin Peying, right? Don't participate in politics. And I think that the, uh, presentation by Professor Tang Weiren, to me was like presenting the justification when you were quoting the sutra and then you were presenting in your slide. What's the point of, you know, saving for enlightenment and then the house is in fire. I read that as you are commenting on climate change and the necessity for Tsuji to transmit its message. And so I turn to you, Professor Ra, because you quoted from Zheng Yan herself, and your very last uh, phrase was, let me quote it because it was so eloquent, by not separating from impurity, we cannot reach Buddhahood. So right there, you have a doctrinal justification to rethink that precept. So thank you. Would you, would you uh, uh, Professor Dong, would you like to give a brief response? Or shall we <laughs> agree? <laughs> <laughs> That's very brief. <laughs> um, uh, I need a second to think about it, but but basically agree with you. Um, just kind of justification. But I'll, I'll listen to the other and I'll listen. Uh, uh, let's let's keep going with questions. There, we, I think if we have time for for two more. Uh, it, uh, our student from McGill, uh, and then and then here, please, uh, uh, Alex. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to return to a question that Professor Ritzinger raised, and uh, hopefully we can have a brief discussion. But given uh, where we are today. And um, is this, you know, a case of Fo Shui Hua? And if so, or if not, what would we say is the relationship or the role of Fo Shui, Buddhist studies within uh, Tsuji, when uh, Master Zheng Yan herself has, of course, 
perhaps drawn distinctions between fo xue and xue fo, so the practice of Buddhism versus Buddhist studies? That's a, a wonderful and very and big question. We're going to leave that on the table and go to another another question uh, here. Thank you very much. Uh, right here. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Yen, and uh, I am doctor, and I'm from New York. I also uh, is a Suji uh, commissioner, and uh, uh, I have to thanks. And um, nearby me is the our CEO of uh, Suji uh, Northeast Religion uh, Freeman, and our team uh, provide wonderful event for this uh, volunteer, and we. We and uh, we are about to provide wonderful uh, event for this uh, uh, today's meeting and combine other uh, different thing. So um, my uh, right now, uh, like a 2020, uh, we provide to the uh, medical supplies. Uh, also, uh, COVID nineteen occurred. Uh, New York is the first the uh, ground zero to start the night, uh, COVID-19, then uh, uh, spread to the, uh, almost to the world. And uh, for that time, uh, Zhen Yan, Master Zhen Yan, uh, have a clear message about uh, the, uh, about the, uh, the vegetable movement, also uh, uh, you have to be a Da Zai Jiao Yu, that means, uh, uh, the harmony of the uh, because we are human uh, very uh, uh, destroy all the environment and stuff and uh, we have to protect ourselves and uh, we have to resume the harmony and uh, not only this uh, we uh, also didn't stop here we our organization also provide a medical supply to first uh, uh, hospital and the New York area and uh, provide the uh, education, how to prevent the disease. And also in a headquarter, we uh, purchase the um, vaccination for the um, Taiwan. And uh, that um, in turn of, uh, I seen other religion and uh, the response is very subtle. Okay, uh, uh, they are stopped the service, and some of the um, believers uh, they um, they don't have uh, um, their their religion to serve. Um, like uh, for example, um, some of the church they close the door, and uh, uh, that uh, contract the difference. My question is, the religion is only uh, just uh, worship or is just a uh, uh, practice or just uh, pray or just comfort themselves or they are actually helping other people. So that's uh, uh, my questions to end. I hope uh, you can uh, answer for that. That's uh, probably give us some answer for the uh, okay. Thank you very much. Our, 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 these final two questions are, 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 are quite close, I think, and uh, we look forward to answers later, later in the program in the, this afternoon. Uh, so if you'll join me in thanking all of our participants in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tizer. And with all the panelists, stay on the stage and we'll take the photograph. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. And uh, with thank you, thank you, the panelists, and would you please return to your seats? As we have finished the third discussion session, sharing from our panelists and commentators, let us now cement this moment with another group photo. <laughs> it seems like we're taking a lot of photos. And I think that's very important. Uh, we are keeping track of history, making sure who is where at what time. And that is why we are now taking photos. So would the photographer please come up here to help us take the group photo?
And, and just so that everybody knows, we need to finish take this photo before we can have lunch. So please cooperate. You know, I really don't want to threaten anybody with, you know, the threat of not having lunch. So please, everybody. Uh, so the sooner we finish this, the sooner we get to lunch. Any blurred smiles that would be just tragic? Okay, so let's all be seated. Thank you. It's wonderful. Hang on, hang on. We're almost okay. We're still moving. Okay. Right. So we're just filling up the seat. We're really getting to the final part. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. We finally got this. Will not be this burdensome. Okay, we're done. All right. So thank you. So please be back here on at 1:10. Okay, 1:10. We'll resume our afternoon sessions at 1:10. Please exchange ideas and make new friends. Thank you.
begin our grand discussion very shortly. Thank you, Jamie. All right, thank you. I hope you have all had very fulfilling lunch and all had opportunity to engage in discussion and exchange ideas with other fellow participants. Now it is time for another group photo. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I know this will get your attention. Okay, okay, no more, no more group photos. So thank you, no more. Uh, now we are now moving. <laughs> yeah, now we're moving on to, we have already finished three discussions and we thank all the presenters as well as the moderators and the commentators. Now we have moved into the grand discussion. And today, the first round of the grand discussion is going to be talking about uh, the, um, the Buddhism and interreligious engagement. And for that, we welcome now, Eugene. <laughs> for that, we welcome the moderator, Professor Wei Ren Deng, to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, I was told that I'd be moderating for this session uh, the, the last minute. And the last minute they took, uh, <laughs> they just took one of the commentators from <laughs> my, my session. So in the spirit of our uh, discussion, you know, uh, 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 discussion spirit of last session, this session will be not only more discussion, but grand discussion. <laughs> So we will have grand discussion. We'll see what that means uh, in a bit. So we have um, uh, three presenters, um, Hong, Chin, uh, CEO, BAAI TV, uh, Indonesia. Um, and we have second presenter, Hun um, Xiang Li, volunteer coordinator, Chiji, Malaysia. And we have Lori Lai, the director of the Department of uh, Literature and History, Chiji Foundation. And we have uh, now only three commentators. Um, Nina Vachiri, lecturer in Regional Studies, uh, Victoria University of, of Wellington, uh, and Gleck, Associate Professor of religious, uh, Religion and Cultural Studies, University of Central Florida, and the local <laughs> professor, James Swapstan uh, from YLC, uh, Harvard here. Um, the, I was told that the, the commentators uh, do not necessarily uh, like uh, previous um, uh, sessions go through uh, or respond to each and every presenter so they can also speak for themselves um, keep share their their thoughts as well so okay now uh, let's um, welcome uh, our first presenter Hong Jin am I pronouncing yes. correct okay oh.
venerable dharma masters excellencies pure practitioners distinguished professors especially professor Harrison, thank you for organizing and inviting us coming to this wonderful event we love to volunteers ladies and gentlemen I'm Hong Xin. I would like to share with you about the Foundation's experiences in interreligious affairs. First, let me greet you in the standard greetings in each official event in Indonesia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. That's a Catholic. Shalom, Protestant. Om Swastiastu, Hindu. Namo Buddhaya. And Salam Kebajikan. All six religions represented in these greetings. Yeah, and to begin my presentations, let me share with you a video made especially for this occasion. Based on the World Population Review 2023, Indonesia is the biggest Muslim population country in the world. From over 227 million population of Indonesia, 87.2% are Muslim. With the Muslim population as majority, Siji Buddhist Foundation built the synergy with the society, community, institution, even government with all backgrounds. This is based on universal great love. In 1993, Siji Buddhist Foundation came to Indonesia. Social and health service is the first step for Siji in spreading great love to the community. Since 2003, Siji has had a good relationship with El Ashariya Nuru Imam Boarding School which is located in Parun Bagor, West Java. This boarding school has thousands of students coming from orphans and poor families. Boarding school established by Habib Sagaf share the same humanity path with Siji. Kami tidak punya sumber daya apa-apa, jadi kami tidak punya santri yang bisa bayar SPP. Mereka rata semuanya gratis karena mereka rata-rata anak yatim, yatim piatu, dan anak-anak yang dari orang tua yang bercerai, terus tidak mau mereka di diurus lagi anak-anaknya, atau anak-anak yang diabandon, dibuang, ditinggalkan oleh orang tua. Saya hanya SMU kita, orang yang, yang dikasih amanah untuk mengurus anak-anak ini. Masa depan mereka, semua ada di tangan kami. The cooperation in creating the future of the students to not only have religion knowledge, but also develop their love and apply it in the community. Master Jenyan always advised that to unite great love, so the harmonious community will be created. Dan saya yakin ketika anak-anak ini bisa kita didik dengan baik, dengan mencinta kasih, seperti semboyannya,
apa itu cinta kasih, apa itu perdamaian, apa itu toleransi, itu semua didapatkan dari pendidikan. In Indonesia, Muslim organization Pengurus Besar Nadatu Ulama, PBNU, has more than 90 million members. To reach the wider help distribution to the community, all parties have to synergize. To know deeper about Siji's vision and mission, the chief of Pengaras, Basar Nadatu Ulama, went to Hualien to visit Master Jinyan. Yang ini silaturahim, itu tatap muka, sangat penting, sangat penting, dan itu ajaran Islam. Islam merentahkan Al-Quran, merentahkan kita selalu silaturahim, ketemu bertemu berjumpa tapi kalau sebatas berjumpa kurang bernilai harus dilanjutkan dengan bahasa Arabnya silatul afkar kalau silaturahim tatap muka silatul afkar menyamakan persepsi menyamakan orientasi pemahaman sudah akan berlanjut menjadi silatul amal menjadi jaringan kerjasama tim wakil terakhir silatul roh menyamakan spiritual At Nadatul Ulama University, Master Jinyan's aphorism, along with the motivational quotes from Muslim figures, become the form of respect to create harmony and tolerance. Long ago, the Black Anke River is so close with the society's life. When big flood hit in 2002, this area is the worst impacted. Looking at the condition of Anke Riverside community, Master Jinyan encouraged city volunteers in Indonesia to help the community through 5P program, which are water absorbing, garbage cleaning, preventing disease, healing, and housing. In Great Love Housing sites, there are some facilities built like place of worships, hospital and great love school the children are taught character building so that they can apply it in their family and the community in the middle of a disaster Macedonian also calls to provide holistic assistance beginning from establishing the body in the form of distributing emergency response assistance establishing the soul in the form of assistance and restored lives with the construction of loving housing for affected citizens, which are equipped with school facilities and place of worship. The construction of a school which was destroyed due to the disaster also being a main concern, like the construction of Esman 1 Padang West Sumatra. Previously, they had to study in tents due to the damaged condition of the school. Grateful, now students can return to learning in the classroom. The school was rebuilt not only as a learning place, but also a disaster mitigation shelter. Also in Lombok, West Nusa Tenggara, post earthquake, city built school, mosque, and temple for the local community. When COVID 19 hit the world, city cooperating with the government, TNI, POLRI, and other NGOs to distribute medical help, groceries, and vaccination to help the COVID 19 relief acceleration. This medical help has been distributed to 375 institutions in 1,096 hospitals and public health center around Jabodetabek and 27 provinces in Indonesia. From one goodness, we'll create another through universal great love relay. Yeah, 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have many volunteers from not only Buddhist, but also from Muslim, from Christians, and other religions. And I would like to call it like an engagement uh, point or engagement area. With the Muslim, usually it's like a mission of charity, health, and also uh, sometimes mission of education. But with the churches, usually we have common interest in environmental protection. So, for example, the member of the church or the, uh, also member of Chichi, and they also want to, to do eco enzyme, to do uh, recycling stations, then we work to cooperate together. We even have some commissioners that are non Buddhist. We have many from Muslim, from Christians, and other religions. And this PowerPoint actually highlight what has been displayed in the video and a disclaimer. I'm not a professor, I'm not an academician, and sometimes point of view of volunteer. We just celebrated 20 years of Anki River project last week. From the slum area, we relocated because of the guidance and leadership of Master Chen Yen give us direction. Otherwise, we did not know where to start, how to scope the work. And Master say, to this slum area, 1.5 kilometers left bank and right banks of this river, 5,000 or so families, to relocate them, build housing units, work with the government. And we did. So the engagement area, of course, is charity, health. We do clinic services. But the most important critical factor based on this 20 years ex experience is education. The first five years, we changed the children from not going to school. In the beginning, we have to do door to door and knock. Why you are eight years old, you have eight years old children, why parents have you not sent the children to school, etc. And that's the first foundation. And then we, we have to teach them all about not to throw garbage everywhere they want and to be disciplined in queuing things that they haven't done. So such a basic like a personal hygiene, not throwing garbage and queuing. And education, after five years, we can see directly start the children improving. Before, they fell asleep after 15 minutes because of their nutrition problem. So we have to supplement. After five years, the children change. Next five years, mother, because they see their children change, they have hopes. So the mother also changed. The most difficult, ladies and gentlemen, to change are the males. Because they are usually don't want to participate in this you know, gathering, uh, socialization of good hygiene, etc. It's like a, it's a, my children and my, I send my children and my wife, not me. So after 15 years, 20 years, the one children generation that may not go to school, right now they graduated from the best university in Indonesia. They participated in uh, active building bridges in Papua. They active, uh, become police. They also become military and all the good positions they never had before. So engagement area, mission of education is very important. The next one is the this one. In 2003, when the Minister of Welfare say, uh, can Chichi help this uh, poor uh, Islamic boarding school? I, with two other uh, volunteers, went there. 
And they were in the middle of gathering after the Friday prayer. And to my amazement, the, the Habib, the leader, say, go to hell with the British. Go to hell with the United States. I say, well, is this the right place we, we want to be here? But fortunately, after continuous engagement with us, we helped them with the providing 50 tons of rice uh, from Taiwan. Uh, and also uh, provide clean water and help them with the uh, Jingzi education inside the curriculum. After three years, they are more receptive to our uh, engagement. And not only learning Mandarin, also learning Jingzi. And next day, the Korean, Korea ambassador also say, oh, you can practice Taekwondo. I will give you the dojo and learn Korean also. And the next month, the Japanese ambassador say, oh, you should learn karate also. Uh, and we provide you with dojo. So they are happy to, to receive all this kind of uh, uh, assistance. And for the last 10 years, I haven't heard anything about United Kingdom or United States anymore, luckily. And this is the meeting of the largest Muslim organization in the world, Nadatul Ulama, with Master Chung Yen. And I went to see Kiai Said, the leader of Nadatul Ulama then, to discuss the term of engagement. I described the chi, great love, and especially kan and chun chung ai, gratitude, respect, and love. And Kiai Said, they say, oh, yes, of course, we also know about gratitude, mutual respect, and love. And also proposes silatu rahim, silatu afka, silatu amal, and silatu roh. So basically, let's get to know each other before we understand each other, and then let's do something good together before we discuss something about philosophy. Because if you started with I'm the way, you are not the way, then it's very difficult. But if you say like, okay, let's understand each other, that's doable. So we have MOU, especially in education. We help them with uh, constructing a uh, building, 56 classes, uh, and uh, it's been uh, used uh, very well by them. And we try to develop a Jingzui curriculum also for them. And this is the most common engagement with other religions because disaster never asks what your religion are. And this is Aceh, for example. We rebuilt 1,000, uh, sorry, 2,700 houses in Aceh, and total great love housing is uh, 6,800 something. Equipped with mosque, equipped with school facilities. And just a Earthquake happened also in Lombok, in Palu, and we provided helping them like master guided us. Give them some worship place that they really need to recover, not only from the physical, but also from their emotional need. So we built mosques, we built Buddhist temple, and also we built our renovate church. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, the philosophy of Master Cheng Yen, the spirit of gratitude, respect, and love really provide us a very good guiding principle, and it worked very well with other religions. Thank you for the time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hong Chin, for a wonderful presentation. I mean, uh, different regions help uh, the world differently, uh, but uh, we we all agree that um, different. Uh, we, I mean, we will, we will all have the same uh, spirit and in enthusiasm in in helping the world, uh, and I think you all agree that. Uh, Chichi is the most successful uh, Buddhist organization, not only helping people of different religions, but also 
but more importantly, bring uh, people of different regions to help. Okay, uh, so with this, now let's welcome our second presenter, Peng Xiang Li, uh, director, oh, uh, sorry, uh, volunteer uh, coordinator, Chiji Malaysia. A very good afternoon, uh, reverends, uh, masters, uh, honorable professors, uh, fellow participants, and uh, fellow Tsuchi brothers and sisters. Um, I'm humbly uh, honored and a uh, special thank to um, Master Cheng and also Professor Harrison for giving me uh, this opportunity to report on the, some of the work, the footprints that is there. Uh, uh, Tsuji volunteer has walked through in uh, Malaysia. Yeah. Um, this uh, slide is, is especially uh, selected, as you can see that the although the color of the hand is different, but is the the message across is actually similar. Um, my presentation, was, my reports are actually divided. It is a four area, and. Uh, First, I would like to give you a little bit of the insight about Malaysia. Yeah, so it is a thirteen states uh, with uh, three federal territory, and then uh, we have the composition of uh, fifty over percent, which is Malay. Um, and you can see that the Chinese and the rest of others are actually very small percentage, right? So it is a very Muslim dominated uh, country, and. It, um, thanks to this uh, great love that was to see sail all the way about 30 years ago that is into Malaysia by Taiwanese uh, volunteer and that we have the four chapters in uh, throughout Malaysia and also we have about 32 liaisons uh, offices throughout the entire countries and um, most important thing, I want to show you this uh, statistic. Uh, a lot of the time that when we ask the general public, do you know Tsuji? They say, yeah, you guys are very good in uh, collecting rubbish, right? Wow, that's just quite interesting uh, in Malaysia's context, because as you can see from here that we actually have about 130 over uh, recycle centers. And we also have the 800 over recycling points, which is when we talk about the points, we have about uh, each month, we have a volunteer there and recollecting all the recycles and then uh, interact with the communities. So all in all, we have about 1,100 uh, recycling points, right? And this uh, very interesting thing you can see from here, this uh, recycling point is, is not just collecting rubbish. It is actually for us, all the volunteers to interact, right? And you can see all colors of the people that is, is down here. And the question here is to see, what do we do with them? Is it that you really just want the resource? No, we actually uh, transcend a little bit of the message, right? Do we preach them with the Dharma? No, right? but we speak the common language, right? Take, for example, the most common thing that we share with them is to see, a lot of the people might have some trouble that really come by. Then say, we share with them this example, right? A lot of the time that when people scold us, right, remember it for life, but every time that this is the praises, you just take it lightly. But at this, oh, sorry, at this recycle station, what do we do, right? A lot of a bad thing that we throw it away and a good thing that we remember. So it's just the opposite of in life, the same philosophy that is in life, we practice the opposite. We always remember the, the negative things very deeply. But in this research, we, we learn this is a simple philosophy from the recycle stations. Yeah. So uh, instead of uh, telling people preaching the, the deep dharma, so this is uh, the simple example that I could cite, right? Um, other than that, you can see a lot of 
the volunteerism work that is uh, in the charity that you can see that the uh, majority of the, the, unfortunately the poverty levels that's the, in the Indian communities that's a little bit uh, significant. So a lot of our charity case actually focuses on the uh, Indian community. As you can see here, that is the great love uh, beyond that boundary. All right. Um, Moving on, I just want to see, uh, share with you a little bit of the uh, inconvenient truth, whereby in Malaysia, we actually have a quite a significant number of uh, refugees. And this number, the registered is about 180,000. And um, officially, that is uh, across the number of uh, 200,000 uh, refugees. And we have actually another uh, number, which is, uh, it might shock you, we call it stateless. We have a stateless population, which is over a million. Malaysia, remember, just I was mentioning to you, we have a 34 million uh, population. And when they're stateless and the refugees adding up to almost like a 1.2 million, it's a very significant amount, right? So naturally, that uh, that's why we, uh, we're very glad that we were entrusted by UNHCR to do some work. And uh, that was way back in, in 2004, right? And um, our primary focus is actually on the healthcare and also the education, other than those kind of a charity and also the other treatment as well. Um, I think not forgetting to mention here also throughout the medical, we actually have a various uh, centers to cater for the welfare of the uh, this group of uh, people that inclusive of in Penang that we have a dialysis center, right? And uh, we have a free clinic throughout uh, various part of uh, Kuala Lumpur, right? Um, I just want to take you through a video presentation that uh, it takes about five minutes. Right. Let's take a January 2023, there were some 183,790 refugees and asylum seekers registered with UNHCR in Malaysia. As Malaysia is a party to the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol, refugees seeking refuge in Malaysia have no access to basic rights, including access to work, healthcare, and formal education, and aren't protected by Malaysian law. There's about 33,000 refugee children overall in the country. What, what happens to the next generation if they're not able to go to school? The education of refugee children has become a major issue. With respect for life and people oriented as guiding principles, in 2008, Suzy Kiel and set up UNHCR Suzy Education Centers in five refugee communities in Kiel Slangor regions, working hand in hand with UNHCR Malaysia in promoting preschool education for refugees. The education centers had undergone several rounds of consolidation, relocation, and expansion. The learning environment has continuously improved, and the teaching style has also been reinforced. City education centers emphasize on instilling kindness in children. Humanistic culture and other subjects are given equal importance. The teachers teach with propriety and educate with love. Every semester, training on the teaching of humanistic culture lessons are conducted for teachers. Susie so found a secondary school that would accept the refugee children. Ensuring a seamless transition to secondary school, Susie so collegiate youth conduct various extracurricular activities to broaden the students' horizons. Outdoor learning sessions are also arranged to enhance the students' knowledge and understanding of nature and science. The education centers that many trained teachers were previously unwilling to serve at have evolved into a professional alternative learning centers. There are currently two centers in Selaya and Ampang with 22 classes, 21 teachers, and 453 enrollments. Thank all the teachers because they made me to study so hard and I now I'm proud of myself. For the past 11 years, Suji provides free monthly medical services to refugees in Salaya, serving over 1,000 patients per month, feeding the spirit of great love. 
medical personnel from various racial and religious backgrounds joined Tima to safeguard the health of refugees. The Tutsi Free Clinic in Klang was open to refugees in 2017, and in 2018, it expanded its services by setting up makeshift free clinic to cater for more refugees. This church, in use since 1928, houses Tutsi's monthly free clinic sessions. In January 2019, Tutsi volunteers in Kwantan held a free clinic for Rohingya refugees. The KL Tsuji Free Clinic was opened in 2007 for the Tsuji care recipients and disadvantaged groups. After much effort, in March 2010, it opened its doors to refugees with medical expenses borne by the UNHCR. Every day, an hour before the clinic opens, refugees would have already formed a long queue outside. Sushi and the UNHCR cooperation is one of the things we're most proud of. Sushi is a, an extremely professional organization that has a very strong spiritual, moral, and ethical heart to all of its work. And that appeals to us because we think that we're the same kind of an organization in the UN system. We are deeply, both in terms of the mandate, but in terms of the staff here, we're deeply committed to working for the improvement of refugee rights and uh, ref refugee health and education particularly. So the collaboration with Suchi and UNHCR, I think, is extremely important. Suchi puts forward manpower, girl power as well, and financial contributions to the partnership that we enjoy. And uh, I often talk about the UNHCR Suchi partnership as a model financial that other NGOs and UN should, should try to respond to. The Tsuji Free Clinic, which provides free medical services for underprivileged, has recruited four graduates from the Tsuji ALC to serve as medical assistants, allowing them to benefit themselves and others. For me, it's possible to help as much as I can. Tsuji ALC cares deeply about the future of refugee children and has implemented an education system that enables them to seamlessly integrate into the local education system of third countries. When I come here, a lot of volunteers ask me how I can speak English. I was yeah. like, in, in Malaysia, I studied this at the- This is the most recent case school. that she's now so attending in America. That English was really good. In 2015, the United Nations listed 70 ways it was making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Assisting refugees ranked 57, while ensuring all children complete a full course of primary school ranked 28th. As of 2023, nearly 6,000 refugee children have received education at Suji ALCs. And uh, it's interesting that you will learn that we have the school that has the most number of uh, headmasters. We have one school that have uh, seven headmasters because they retired from the school and then they join us then in the school as a volunteer. Right, other than the... Um, okay. Um, oh gosh, hang on a minute. Um, this is other than the, the refugees, this is also a, a quite a significant am uh, amount of indigenous uh, group that this is in Malaysia that constitute about 2% of our population. And then we do a lot of the medical access to them. And uh, the other part of it, this is the, the, I want to show you another video, which is the, on the, to introduce those work that is for the, oh, sorry. It's in COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have a little bit of a control issue, right? My 2% of Malaysia's population are non-citizens. They are either refugees or stateless people. Most whom are living on the poverty line or struggling for food. They have no right to attend school. The simple house extended from this house is the home of 10-year-old Abdul and his grandmother, elder sister and younger brother. The most eye-catching green suitcase is broken. It was left by Abdul's late mother, and it holds all his clothes. It is also how Abdul feels connected to his late mother. 12-year-old Janeline has also lost a mother. Her father came from the Philippines and has lived here for over 20 years. 
kadang-kadang susah sana perang sikit-sikit perang. Ya kita pun sebagai bapak mau juga anak yang sekolah ada pengalaman ada aja punya jangan sampai tulis pun baca ndak tahu apa susah. Di sekolah. Tengok orang belajar. Ingat semua Since 2008, Suzi has established five learning centers for non-citizen children in Malaysia, allowing them to complete their primary school education. Currently, there are over 800 students in these centers. We are facing the biggest refugee and displacement crisis of our time. The world must rise to the challenge. Providing hope means providing pathways for a better future. Give non-citizen children a schooling opportunity. Sorry that I'm showing you all the uh, not so pleasant, but uh, um, I think uh, the, other, the next one I want to introduce a little bit. There's a, the, some report that is, uh, every one of us has walked through. There's a COVID-19. And there's a little bit of a work that Suji initiated. That is the, I have a next video to show you. The increasing COVID-19 cases are straining Malaysia's healthcare system, especially medical resources for severe patients. Tuzi KLN Selangor collaborates with 17 other faith-based organizations to raise medical supplies for local hospitals. I feel that um, all of us need to play our role, our part, and it's not just one person or one religion or one organization or one ministries work but all of us as malaysians have to come together so i'm very happy to be part of this i think perhaps this is for the first time a multi-faith multi-racial multi-ethnic effort that cuts across all racial barriers and religion joining hands together to do something good for malaysia this is a very crucial effort uh, that we are all undertaking uh, with the lead of Sechi, and uh, we have gone on a fund uh, raising campaign uh, to be able to provide the hospitals some of their additional requirements. Transcending religious differences, everyone comes together to unite love and kindness amidst the pandemic. <laughs> Bila kita berada bersama-sama, saya fikir uh, contribution dan juga uh, sumbangan yang kita akan berikan akan memberikan lebih impak berbanding jika kita bergerakkan secara bersendirian. Besides providing medical equipments, this interfaith collaboration also manifests transcendental love. This is the work that we should do together. And we're very happy that even the, the Christians or the Catholics have come in, uh, the Muslims have come in strong, uh, the Sikhs and all that. So it is Malaysians coming together to do something for Malaysia. We have to help Malaysia. I'm really impressed and touched with the works we have been doing. Uh, and this time, I'm even more uh, honoured uh, and privileged that Suji has invited people of different faiths, besides Buddhists, to join together. Be it compassion, universal love, or mercy, the heart of all religions is goodness and kindness. Let us gather everyone's strength and pray for the pandemic to leave soon. Right. Uh, other than the, the work of the giving uh, medical facilities, we also run used our Singsa Hall in a, a various Singsa Hall as a vaccination center because it's everybody are very skeptical whether this will work. 
So um, when they see that that Suji is, is being in the frontage of the, this particular effort, a lot more of them that they feel much more comfortable. And this is another effort that is a, this is a really a disaster. It happens to my own community that I'm, si I'm staying in a city center where next to my city center that was uh, actually the big flood. And then there was a uh, very serious where 6,000 houses was actually uh, in the water. Right, and uh, we'll very quickly that we administrated uh, all the cash, uh, all the uh, hot food, and the uh, as you can see here, there's uh, some celebrities that although she's just in a mask, but uh, uh, she was so uh, we're so honored that Michelle you actually turned up then uh, with a helicopter to help us to do all the cleanup. That is, and as you can see that we combined with all the team to reach out, and of course it's the door to door. Uh, kind of a visit because this, this is one very important factor that we need to ensure that the deserving one are receiving the cash aid. So that's why we administrated a uh, volunteer to do the house to house uh, visit, right? So this is the uh, distribution, right? And I just want to end this particular presentation that to see. Um, there's a lot of a time that during peace and harmony, all of our volunteers are taking uh, opportunity to actually work with the institution, and this is where we witness a lot of uh, suffering. And that is the one of it is actually capitalize on this is to do educate ourselves to strengthen our faith and our belief as it's a volunteerism, in the volunteerism, and then. Um, of course, this is also an uh, opportunity for us to reach out more. Other than the institution, we do we do collaboration with the schools, we do collaboration with uh, uh, corporate, for example, Malaysia Airlines. When uh, 370 happens, that, is the, that was the first thing that we deployed our volunteer within the next six hours is already in Beijing to render the necessary help. And uh, right, so I'll end my presentation here. Thank you. Um, yeah, like in like Indonesia, Malaysia has its own unique uh, religious config, uh, config, uh, configuration. So thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Lee, for showing us um, this wonderful, touching um, social work that uh, Chuji Malaysia has been doing. So now let's welcome our third presenter, Lori Lai. Um, it's me. It's you. <laughs> okay. Um, so Laura is the director of the uh, Department of Literature and History, uh, Suji Foundation. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Lai from the Department of Literature and the History of Suji Foundation. I'm honored to participate in today's seminar. Before I proceed with my briefing, I would like to stay late. My master's degree is communication. <laughs> And my PhD is public administration. So my major has limited relevance uh, to so, uh, sociology or religion. Uh, but today, uh, my report will be more related to my work. I hope our scholars yeah, can give me your advice. So my topic today is examining the relations between Tsuji and other religions based on Tsuji's literature and the history digital collection database. Okay, thank you. Someone help me to control the PPT, yes. Okay. Okay, today's presentation in my, uh, is my personal exploration, uh, finding rather than a comprehensive starting. As you may know, Dama Master Jin Yan placed great importance on historical records in 1966. Since Tsuji since was first established, Master Jin Yan has requested volunteers to provide like this. Yes, very detailed descriptions of the poor families. In July 19. 167, like this, okay. We have our magazine in Tsuji Monthly. On the one hand, this is done for transparency. 
allowing uh, allowing donors to know how Ciji donations are helping people. On the other hand, it is a uh, it can inspire uh, compassion in the border society, as shown in this report, like this. Okay, yes, this story uh, is uh, in the third issue of Tsuji Monthly. This 77 years old grandmother, yes, this picture, whose son has passed away and the daughter in law had remarried, was left uh, two young granddaughters. The three of them lived in a rented house that was only about 165 square feet, struggling to put food on the table. Land alone, yes, like this, uh, is uh, talking about land alone, uh, cover the children's school fees. Starting from late month, Suji began providing monthly assistance to this family such including 21 kilograms of rice and a life allowance of $200, around six US dollars. And of course, time goes by. Uh, over the past 15, six years, Suji has accumulated a wealth of data and the stories like this are among the more than 617 issues of Suji Monthly. In today's seminar, the topic of discussion is interfaith charity. And my research question are as follows. First, according to historical data, how was the relationship between Tsuji and other religions established subsequently. I believe that religion is a framework closely to intertwine with the social environment, allowing us to understand the significance of contem contemporary society in relation to humanities, ethics, and even social capital. Therefore, there is a question to be explored from the perspective of social network. And the second question is, how did the religion diversity within the Tsuji world emerge? As everyone knows, Tsuji volunteers, the daughters of Tsuji hospitals, school principals, or the all care recipients are not necessarily Buddhists. How this diversity emerge is closely related to the actions of Master Zhen Yan, which I uh, aim to validate from the data. So my presentation will have the three parts. The first one, I will uh, have the literature review, a review of signif uh, significant uh, events in Tsuji's interface char charitable history. And the two, uh, introduced to the Tsuji literature in the history digital collection database and how my research is conducted. And the three, I will have some conclusion. Okay, about the literature reviewed. Looking at the history of Tsuji interface activity, we cannot start from the 1966 when Tsuji was founded but rather trans back to the experiences of its founder, Master Zhen Yan. And in this picture, you can see this during the World War II, Master Zhen Yan personally experiences how the, the older generation would pray for the protection and the blessing of Guanyin Bodhisattva while taking shelter from the, the air raids. And, in the 1958, Master Zhen Yan's father suddenly passed away, leading her to engage with Buddhist scriptures in the Bible. And in the 1966, she came across three nuns in the pool of blood incident. Here, I'd like to quote a passage from the Master Zhen Yan. Okay, Buddhists often speak of the thousands handed, thousands eyes Guan Yin, 
how could there be someone with a thousand hands and a thousand eyes in this world? I had least doubt things I was a child. And there's another saying, every home has a Buddha, every household has Guan Yin. On the day I saw the pool of blood, I understand. I believe it should be changed to everyone is a Buddha, everyone is Guan Yin. I made up my mind to unite Buddhist members of society and everyone's strength to build a hospital in the Hualien, Hualien area to improve medical stand, standards. I didn't want the people on the rural east coast to watch helplessly as someone died due to illness or accidents. And the next. Yeah, the picture, maybe someone <laughs> long, long, long time ago. Okay, Ray, yes, yes, in the picture. Yes. Okay, but my story is from the 1974. When, yeah, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> uh, my story, uh, I would like to uh, start. Uh, 1974, when Honduras was affected by the by a flood, Master Zhen Yan decided to assist disaster victims there. However, a month later, Typhoon Fendi, this one, okay, Fendi accused the landslides in Kilong, Taiwan. Suji redirected its effort to help the disaster victims in North Taiwan. Later in 1919, Suji provided aid during the Bangladesh flood, marking the beginning of Suji International Relief. Although the plan of Honduras relief work did not materialize, this decision has a significant importance. Honduras is a Catholic, and I believe this decision in 1974 while Taiwan was still under the martial rule, illustrate Master Jin Yan's international perspective. And the next, in the 1919, Chen Ying He, who is a Christian, became the third superintendent of the Hualien City Hospital. And the next, okay. in the 2001, our Turkish volunteer Hu Guangzhong was uh, was certified as a Suji volunteer and uh, is a devout Muslim. He remains uh, a Muslim to these days until now. And the next, in the 2002, Fang Juxiong, a member of Presbyterian Church, became the uh, president of Tsuji University. President Fang had been involved in the planning of Tsuji Medical College since 1991. Here is an excerpt, uh, ex excerpt from the oral interview with the President Fang. Okay, I quote some, uh, some of the uh, his interview. I know it's a uh, Buddhist uh, in institution Please tell Master Zheng Yan I'm a Christian and I will never change my faith. Later, uh, Master Zheng Yan responds to him, I am not afraid that you are a Christian. I'm only afraid that you have no faith. So I started to pray to God. If you don't want me to go there, please give me a sign in one or two weeks. And then, but everything went smoothly during that time. And I feel that it was God's approve. And until now, although he is uh, retired, but now he is our uh, advisor. Uh, and uh, uh, he thanks uh, Mr. Jin Yan's trust. And the list, list in uh, uh, 2006, our South Africa volunteers, ladies and uh, other volunteers uh, become the uh, our commissioner. Now I have a video to play. My name is Gladys Damon from South Africa in Africa. 
I'm very blessed. And the day, I bless the day when our Master Cheng Yen started teaching for nation. I bless the day when Master Cheng Yen sent the volunteers to South Africa, where they found me uh, in a very dirty place. So from that day, I felt my Master in my heart because so many things was happening in my life. But Master is in my heart whenever I'm sleeping. I think of master whenever sometimes I got problems. I always feel master in my in my in my body. I can feel everything about master. I always uh, pray for you, master, like where you are, that you must be, be, be strong because we still you master. Because if you leave us, I'll be nothing. Because you always, I always pray you. Mm. And whenever you I think of you, master, you know there are so many things. What uh, Master and your volunteers have done for my life. So now I'm able uh, to help others through Master's teachings, through the 10 percent of Master. I'm able to make other people uh, follow you, Master. I love you, Master. I love all you. All. I love you, Master, with all of my heart because so many things have happened. I'm able to help other people through you, Master. I'm able to go and look after patients, which I never know that that thing will happen to my heart. Why must I forget you, Master? You know, now, even my chair, they said, now, you are not a Christian now, you are a Buddhist. I said, no, Buddhism and church is the same thing. They said, all the time we are in the Buddhist. I said, okay, we are doing the same way. I love you, Master. I love you, Master. I won't stop doing your job. I won't stop preaching sushi. I won't stop going all over countries just to spread the place seed of love. Thank you, Master. I love you, Master. I love you, Master. This is uh, Sister Gladys. Okay. Regarding the literature review, I initially structured it around the significant organizational projects and the key individuals with Ciji. I have listed the eight events mentioned above. Of course, I believe that the literature review should encompass, encompass more than just this. Due to the stress uh, today, I will only present what I personally consider important at this stage. And the next about the database uh, data analysis. The Tsuji Digital Archive has been accessible to be public since January to, uh, 2021 and does not require any ID or password for access. It allows users to search through over 1.45 million public available records within. 85% of them being image data. Additionally, there are 230,000 records, including Tsuji monthly magazines and Tsuji USA monthly, Tsuji bi weekly newsletter, Tsuji uh, any variety of the documentary yeah, from the official Tsuji website. There is also concise, uh, concise history of Tsuji development in different countries compared to Tsuji Department of Literature and History. Yes, this is my apartment. This session sounds like a little bit, like a, a eight. <laughs> and next. Initially, I conduct a keyword analysis using test segmentation, searching for all data with keywords such as, oh, yes, I use the Richard Madison, Professor, your name in our data. Yes, we have more than 11 in photos. Yes, and some magazine report about you and uh, uh, our website article about you. <laughs> yes, and I use the keyword like this, and the, the keywords uh, primarily, primarily uh, re, uh, evolve around different religions, and the religions uh, turns followed by detailed examin examination of the content found. Okay, and uh, I think uh, it's not a uh, fully 
phage research. Due to the time constraints, I will present the primary results to you. Okay. First, uh, I find I found through the primary analysis, the different times bear different things from the 1967 to 1972, the source of Tsuji Monthly were mainly editorial over manuscripts that were not written by Zinsu about masters. Topics explored including the learning of other religions and the relevance of exploring um, Manamdeyan. Yeah, in the news report of Buddhism, it does not shy away from sharing information of other religions like this. And I have Dao Shi, Yin Shun Dao Shi. And from the 1973 to 1986, with the funding of Tsuji Hospital, the content focused on how Catholic and the Christian benefits the world through schools and the hospitals. And the comparison of various teachings also began, for example, the difference between compassion and love in the 15th issue of Tsuji Biweekly Letters and in the 21th issue, Master Shen Liu Fa Shi mentioned why there are many churches but no temples. Yes, and in addition, after Mother Teresa won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985, re relevant reports float and the difference is Differences between Master Jin Yin and Mother Teresa were compared. And in the next, from the 1987 to 1999, there were continued interreligious interaction, interactions. During this period, Tsuji Hospital and the Tsuji Medical College were established. The referral of cases from rural churches was increased. Interreligious collaborations also become possible, such as the interactive between Tsuji and the sister Angela, like this. In Australia, in the issue uh, 323 of Tsuji Monthly in 1993, describe the relationship between sister Angela and the Tsuji volunteers. And the next, since the uh, 2000, uh, in response to major disaster, disaster events worldwide, Tsuji's collaboration with international religion nonprofit organization increased significantly, including Katerios and many other kinds uh, organizations. Tsuji volunteers in various countries also actively engage with local religious organizations, notably in Jordan with Muslim uh, and in the America, Tsuji volunteers have partnered with local churches for the relief mission. And this is uh, in the Poland. Yeah, after the word. Okay, about my conclusion. In this era of VUCA, the need for adaptability is stronger than ever, and the interface interactions are bound to increase. And uh, I want to quote the two scholars uh, because I like John Higgs. Professor Zhang Hees and uh, some of the studies about uh, the religion and polarity reason. The first one is the polarity reason is mutual learning, enrichment, and the transformation. This means that religion polarity reason is not an end in itself. And of course, maybe about the another one. Yes, uh, Professor Smith, uh, he remarked about the Christian plus and the Muslim plus. I personally think that Tsuji led by 
Madame Master Zhen Yan is both a retro and enhanced version of Buddhism. I think Suji has great ability to learn due to its high tolerance, understanding, and the empathy to the outside world, fully refreshing and continue learning on the inside. Suji needs to continuously improve its ability to rebound, re respond to global disaster and to be able to communicate and interact with Buddhist teaching and non-believers. Based on the analysis of Tsuji literature and the history digital correlation database, this is what Tsuji has been doing all this time and we will continue to record, re record it. I cannot fully answer my question in such a short period of time, but I hope our scholars can use our database and welcome to Hualien to join our study. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Raylin, uh, for your wonderful uh, uh, introduction of the Chichi Digital Archive. Uh, I think very soon we will find our names. You can find your names in the archive. And I think your, your, your study and findings will be very important and be very interesting in Buddhist attitudes uh, towards uh, other regions got changed through time and what make, uh, make, makes those changes. So uh, this end uh, with the uh, presentation uh, uh, and then we will have a comment uh, commentator uh, coming uh, next, uh, but we will have 10 minutes break. Ten minutes break. Uh, so should we come back at two uh, thirty? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's have uh, some break. Thank you.
coming. All right. Oh, uh, can I think our uh, um, time is up. Um, so please be seated. Can't wait to the what? Grand discussion. Yes. Oh, so we have um um actually four commentators coming um, for this session. Really can't wait. Okay, we have uh Nina Virtuary. We have Anne Black. Um. James Robson and Monica Sanford. Uh, so let's get started, right? Um, it's okay. Yeah. So Nina, I, I have the, like, according to the list. So you'll Please. start with. Sure. Thank you so much. So thanks everyone. Um, it's been a really productive couple of days and thank you to the organizers. It's been really delightful to be here. Um, as we were listening to these talks, the three of us were sitting together and I just thought, oh, I'll come up with some ideas by copying off Anne, but actually her handwriting is totally illegible. So I wasn't able to copy down her good answers to say. So I have to say my own, own ideas. Um, so it strikes me, right, the uh, theme for this conversation is, is the theme on here? Interreligious engagement, right? Interreligious engagement. So it strikes me that, you know, what we mean when we say something like interreligious uh, engagement has everything to do with uh, how we define and circumscribe what we mean by religion. And that has been, it seems to be a theme that has arisen uh, regularly over the last 48 hours. Um, in fact, I really enjoyed your presentation, Hong Jin, because actually I learned recently, having uh, moved to Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I teach at the Victoria University of Wellington, I have the great pleasure in my introduction to religion class to have many students from Indonesia, actually, who come to study in New Zealand. So I've learned a few things about the way in which religion has been circumscribed and defined in your country. So one of the really fascinating facts to me was that Indonesia, as you mentioned, had five official state religions, yes, but it initially was Islam, Hinduism, uh, Christianity, by which I think we would say Protestant Christianity, Catholicism, and Buddhism. And then in 1960s, I think 1965 or something, Confucianism was added. Mm. That's a very interesting choice of new religion to add, because many of you probably have uh, read Anna Sun's book, uh, Confucianism as a World Religion, you know, that really lays out the ways in which Confucianism, like Suchi, as we've been talking about, uh, rides this line between what we might call a philosophy <laughs> and a religion, and how, depending on how we define what is, different things are possible. So I just thought that the example of Confucianism was quite thought-provoking in thinking about uh, Suchi in Indonesia. It strikes me that as we've been talking these last two days about Suchi and volunteerism and kind of thinking about how this organization operates beyond the narrowly circumscribed fields of what we traditionally call Buddhism, right, and is reaching into disaster relief, um, volunteerism, charity, altruism, all these kinds of different uh, spheres of action, We've been talking about it as though this global engagement is just one thing, that Suchi volunteerism is just this kind of single, single object. But actually, it strikes me that we maybe should think more discreetly about how Suchi is operating in different kinds of political contexts, and that what Suchi's activities, what's possible in some place like uh, Indonesia might be different from Suchi in the United States, might be different from Suchi in Europe, and so forth. And so thinking maybe on a more granular level about what that looks like. Um, something else that kind of strikes me is that we've been talking in some ways, this kind of theme has been arising about Buddhism beyond Buddhism, right? Or thinking about such as activities in uh, something that's both religious and also beyond religious activity. Um, in the videos that we watched, it was quite interesting to see how the word religion did or did not appear, actually. Sometimes it was conspicuously absent. It began as being like, oh, here's gonna be, a, here's a video about religion. But in fact, what it was, was a video about education. It was a video about disaster relief, about building schools, about hospitals, about environmental activism. So 
maybe there's something to circle back to on that point, but actually, you know, as we all know, and we've been hearing about, for instance, the Lotus Sutra and the inspiration of Guanyin Bodhisattva, the Pusadao. The Bodhisattva is one who, as we know from chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra, can come back in any form, right? Including non-Buddhist forms, if those are the most expedient forms to take action in the world, right, and address suffering. So in some ways, uh, Acting beyond Buddhism in ostensibly non-Buddhist ways is a very Buddhist thing to do. <laughs> uh, and so there's maybe a tension here when we think about, you know, how are we using this word religion? And how are we thinking about Buddhism in particular as being something that uh, almost um, uh, deconstructs its own boundaries of, of what religion is or should look like in the world? Um, the final thing I guess I'll say is thinking about education, housing, disaster relief, environmental action, uh, medical work, and so forth. The topic of this session is interreligious dialogue or interreligious engagement. But I started to really wonder, is religion even the salient category here? Um, <laughs> looking at you know the um, work with uh, hospitals, for instance, all of the medical outreach, you know, those videos are deeply moving on a profoundly human level. And um, you see people in physical pain, and it's really hard not to kind of wince when you see those kinds of images. Um, I wonder if perhaps other kinds of categories, maybe it's not religion, but in fact, thinking about things like embodiment, thinking about how we all have bodies and experience pain and vulnerability, and thinking about other sorts of ways in which we can um, circumscribe sort of human experience that might not actually fall along the lines of discrete religious traditions might be a more productive way of thinking about this kind of um, relational model. And in fact, I think in a lot of ways, this is what Suchi seems to already be doing, right? Is operating along these alternate sort of taxonomies. And so I wonder about the usefulness of religion itself, but perhaps that can be the Question for discussion. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, um, let's move to um, end. Is it on? Yeah. Hey, so yeah, I just like to echo uh, my colleagues' uh, words of gratitude, uh, and I have really appreciated how open Suchi is to academic research and learning from academics, but I think academics have a lot to learn from you, and I think we should start with um, conference organizing and the food, and I am a member of the AAR, um, so I'd be happy to be a bridge figure in, in, that, in that endeavor, so thanks everyone for your generosity. Um, so I'm actually a scholar of American Buddhism, um, and I thought it might be useful as, uh, you know, to share how interreligious uh, dialogue and social engagement kind of occurs in an American Buddhist context, and then think across, you know, the contexts. So I actually, uh, in the, I think the first thing that's important to note is the difference in scale. So, you know, to start off with, in the US, um, Buddhists make up 1.2% of the population. So Buddhists are a small minority religion. Um, so, you know, I was curious as, you know, what does it mean to do interreligious engagement um, as a small minority religion rather than a majority religion? And with that size also, you know, the other thing that I noted was there's such a difference in scale like I was really blown away by, by the scale of activities, the humanistic activities that were shared today, um, which are really different uh, in, the, in the US context where it's just much more focused local action. Um, my speciality within American Buddhism is convert lineages. So there are kind of slither of American Buddhist populations in general. Two thirds of American Buddhists are Asian Americans. Convert lineages are uh, historically been dominated by white converts, although those lineages are you know, experiencing movements in diversity and racial justice. Um, but I would say from those communities, there are three ways that I see interreligious engagement 
uh, a, a dialogue and social engagement kind of occurring. So the first way is actually in the field of contemplation. And it was so striking to me at this conference, you know, that I've been here for, I think it's been two days now. Um, and I think I only heard the word meditation once. And that is truly liberating because in the context of my, you know, uh, Buddhist populations, like meditation is, you know, if you, it would probably explode the database. If you did a search for meditation, you'd explode the database because historically these lineages have been very focused on meditation. So contemplation, the, the kind of field of contemplative studies, um, it is an interfaith movement, but it's been, I think, led by Buddhists. Monica, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this. Um, and the search for the kind of common, the kind of common principle that we often find in interreligious dialogue has really, you know, been articulated as the search, you know, for contemplative states. So if you go on to the website of the Center for Contemplative Research, which I looked at about 2 a.m. last night, um, there's a quote by the Dalai Lama, and he talks about going to Spain and meeting a Catholic uh, monk who was meditating and a kind of recognition of a shared um, love state behind, you know, the contemplative practice. Um, and so contemplation, you know, it's it's often dated to um, the meeting between Thomas Merton and Ch uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche uh, that happened in 1968 in India. This has been a real way in which I think Buddhists in the US have come into dialogue with other religions. Um, I think there's, you know, lots of good from that, but it also raises, you know, the question of in a society like the US, which is, you know, quite individualistic, um, in what way might meditation um, work against movement towards social action? Like, can it, um, you know, can it become quite kind of self-centered? I think that's certainly a critique of the contemplative movement. Um, so I think Suchi really offers a challenge to that as I didn't see one, you know, one activity centered around contemplation. So I am quite interested in, does contemplation play a part in Suchi's interreligious activities? Um, a second area in which um, interreligious dialogue uh, occurs is, is social engagement. Uh, in 2015, there was the first White House US Buddhist leadership conference and 125 Buddhist leaders from across uh, Buddhist lineages, uh, heritage convert lineages went to the White House and they presented two statements of justice. One was ecological justice for climate justice. Um, and another was racial justice. And the areas of racial justice and ecological justice have definitely been areas of interfaith um, organizing. Um, one, one thing that does strike me as maybe different, and again, this will be a question for the discussion, is in the US, the issues of racial justice and environmental justice are very politicized. So it's immediately uh, kind of coded as a progressive issue. So it is, it's a justice issue, it's a political issue. So I'm curious of to hear how, you know, Suchi kind of navigates, you know, when, when, when justice issues are politicized in other contexts, like how do you enter into dialogue with those specific contexts? Um, the third area is a little bit different, but it was something that I'd think about as what kind of religious Buddhist innovation, religious dialogue across people, but also in the body of a person. So, for example, I've learned over you know the last two days that Master Young Jan was influenced by Confucianism um, and also by Christianity. Um, so in the American Buddhist context, I think of two communities. So one is the community of, there's a whole new word for it, the Jubu, the Jewish Buddhist kind of hybrid um, that kind of brings, you know, interreligious dialogue into a new form of Buddhism. Um, and the other is uh, Black Buddhism. So over the last like decade, the Black Buddhist community has really grown and is exerting more of an influence on the American Buddhist landscape. And Professor Rima Vesley-Flad, who is actually Andrew, Andrew, 
Andrew's teacher at Union Theological Seminar talks about black Buddhism as a kind of dialogue between Buddhism and the black radical tradition, the black Christian radical tradition. Um, so I also, you know, wanted to think about interreligious dialogue as a force for religious creativity and innovation. And, and I think it's just really interesting that, Andrew, you now have this relationship. And I'm really looking forward to see what might grow from that. Okay, thanks, everyone. Um, thank you very much. And, and this, the, the, this, this meditation thing is really interesting. And... Um, I'm thinking uh, the question whether the, the meditation in 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 Zhi uh, it all depends how how what we meant by meditation. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a very interesting uh, what uh, example of you know you can just add uh, meditation in Chinese chan huh, to every activity, so you will have 吃饭禅, 走路禅, 跑步禅, Shigo Chan, Zhao Xiang Chan, and Hui So Chan. So <laughs> would that work? I'm not sure. <laughs> and anyway, okay, let's sorry about that. Uh, very interesting this topic. Uh let's move to uh James. Good. I think this is working. Um also like to extend uh Thanks to all the organizers of this uh, um, conversation and bringing people together. Uh, it's a real rare opportunity to engage uh, two different communities like this. Um, and uh, if Lena was unable to read um, uh, Anne's uh, uh, notes on her paper, I can't even read my own. So uh, let's uh, see what I can put together here. But um, so this question that Lena raised about what do we mean by interreligious engagement, I think is a very complicated one. Um, just what is this? Uh, what are the goals of it as well? Um, and I'll return to that. But I'd like to first start um, just with a comment, uh, which won't surprise you based on my earlier comment uh, just a little bit ago before lunch, uh, which is to say uh, the claims um, about or the discussion of Master Zheng Yan's, uh religious uh, diversity and in, in drawing on others and also this claim that there is no Wai Dao, there is no uh, uh, heterodox uh, 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 tradition within uh, uh, in in the way of thinking about Sichi. Um, this again is not a new thing. I mean, when one reads uh, early Buddhist biographies, pick up any biography in the Song Gao Song Dran and just take a look at it. What do they do? They first start studying. They read the Analects, the Lun Yu, and then what do they read? They read the Tao Te Ching or they study Mencius uh, and so on. Uh, this is a very, very common part, even down to the present day in. Uh, uh, Buddhist monastic education often doesn't even begin with Buddhist texts. It begins reading uh, Confucian works or and also Taoist works. So just to uh, put that into a context um, to say that this kind of uh, thinking of religious diversity has been around for, for quite some time. Um, it seems to me that uh, there's a couple of dangers here. Um, well, I have the danger of uh, being accused of using alliterations too often, so I might as well do it again, uh, of three possible dangers of uh, or, or warnings, perhaps, of that uh, Suchi uh, will have to think about going forward, and I would uh, call them uh, the danger of paternalism, perennialism, and pluralism. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Bryson already brought up the issue of paternalism in terms of uh, uh, giving, uh, which is a is a real uh, issue. But there's also, I think, a relational inequality that can come uh, just from uh, the other types of, um, not just on the giving front, but also in religious uh, in, in dialogue and engagement uh, that has to be treated very carefully. I think um, to draw from Professor Madsen, the title of his book, the issue of uh, democracy over uh, philanthropy is perhaps a better model in the sense of respect for people's status as equals uh, and not uh, falling into the trap of setting up uh, unequal uh, relationships uh, to those. Uh, that are being uh, helped uh, through uh, the tremendous efforts that we've just witnessed of the all of the uh, presentations that have happened on this panel. Uh, the question of uh, perennialism, I think, is an equally tricky one. Um, you know, once you open up and say there's no Y Dao, perennialism then starts to creep in as an ever-present danger in the sense that it flattens all religion. Uh, where does then, where is there any distinctions that one can draw? 
And I think um, if we take uh, Professor Ray uh, you know, boat metaphor and extend that to its uh, the full story, uh, which ends with once you've crossed over, that brought people across the river, uh, and the boatman also gets there. But once you get there, what do you do? You let the boat go down the river. Is Suchi uh, going to do that as well uh, in terms of uh, thinking about the place of Buddhism? I mean, that is the ultimate. I mean, I've always thought that that's a really admirable thing about the Buddhist tradition is this notion is that one doesn't keep carrying that boat around, but you also, once it's served its purpose, let it go. In any case, uh, the, I think perennialism also has its uh, its questions. Pluralism, uh, which is one of the namesakes, I think, of the Harvard uh, sort of brand of uh, study, it's an earned as in terms of uh, thinking about religious uh, engagement. Um, you know, I, I think a fundamental uh, part of that is the respect for uh, differences uh, um, and uh, even, you know, uh, a kind of humbleness in the way that one engages with different uh, religions uh, and trying to better understand all of those. Um, and so I think, you know, there are different types here. Once one uh, takes proselytizing, if we want to throw another <laughs> P term in there, uh, off the table, then uh, in terms of engagement, it seems as if, and uh, here I go again now with D alliterations, uh, that there is, um, you know, the, the importance of dialogue, direct action, and uh, engagement with doctrine. So very interestingly, the uh, presentations that we've we just heard have deliberately taken doctrine off the table, okay? And I think that is probably a savvy savvy decision uh, because this is where uh, the the hardest problems occur, I think, in terms of that engagement. So leave that. Uh, don't we? You know, as we heard, uh, we do not. Uh, that Suji doesn't preach the Dharma; it speaks uh, in in a common language. And that's often where religious groups can operate most effectively together, in the sense of united problems uh, that need to be addressed, rather than some sort of common doctrinal points. Um, so dialogue and mutual understanding uh, is part of it, um, but not engaging in the hard theological questions or doctrinal questions that would bog uh, that work down. Um, and then I think, you know, direct action, I think, is really what's happened. I think what we're seeing here is that is the absence of, of Buddhism or religion in a sense, but a united uh, call by people uh, to perform uh, de direct action for a united purpose. And this, I think, gets uh, um, back to uh, Professor La Liberté's point is that uh, once one makes that move, we are directly in politics. We cannot uh, separate religion and politics at this, or in fact, maybe we're just over on the political side uh, in, indeed. Um, uh, I um, have, you know, been a uh, kind of a fan of Mike Davis for a long time. Some may know his writing, uh, um, uh, who had written this book, Late Victorian Holocaust, who basically says there is no such thing as a natural disaster, that all disasters are because of the foibles of humanity. We locate ourselves in the wrong places. We do not provide the proper in infrastructure. So to speak of it as some kind of a natural disaster, I think, is a misnomer. Uh, it's often due to lack of preparation. And how can Suchi move from merely responding to disasters to actually doing uh, um, the kind of preparatory work that addresses things prior to them becoming problems? And that's an eminently political act. In other words, um, this notion that uh, the problem is that, um, that we have organizations all over the world, many um, that have been mentioned in these presentations, which um, deal with often with issues that are actually owed to people as a matter of as uh, as a matter of justice, rather than being something that needs to be supplied by charity. And that I think, uh, in other words, these uh, groups are having to address needs that should not, in fact, have to exist. Um, and so, how to move uh, away from merely a responsive move uh, to um, a, uh, a more proactive uh, stance, I think, would be an interesting thing to consider. And I would just end by saying, perhaps there would be something valuable in a, um, I, I think Lena was, you know, right here, this notion that what we see is almost already a kind of separation between the, the religious and the political wings of, of the Suchi organization, but I don't know exactly what the internal discussions are there. Perhaps it would be a, a, a strategic move to simply separate these as a religious side, the Buddhist church so-called, that can engage in the difficult dialogue issues. That would be really interesting rather than avoid them completely, but then have 
a the foundation and i think just calling it the tsuchi foundation uh and allowing it then uh to do the relief work that it seems to be incredibly good at and then we uh solve professor la liberté's uh question about the 10th precept now it's just it is everything is politics at that point, and one doesn't have to then uh, 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 revise the 10 precepts that we heard so uh, interestingly expounded earlier. So that's just to say, why do we need, why in other words, do these have to be a singular entity like that and engage uh, with some of those problems? So I'll end there just uh, throwing out a few just provocations, I guess, um, to throw in another P word. Thank you. Wow. Okay, <laughs> getting tougher and tougher. So, um... Our last commentator, Monica Semper. Good afternoon. So uh, thank you all for saying all those brilliant things. I can go home now. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to start by saying, although I, I do perceive myself as an academic, um, like Lorelai sitting up here, I am not a religious studies scholar. I am at uh, Harvard Divinity School, which is why Professor Robson and I haven't met until now, yeah. <laughs> even though we're both at, we're both at Harvard. And now we find ourselves sitting together, so thank you. Um, I am a Buddhist practical theologian, which is a walking oxymoron. Those things just don't go together, and yet that is nevertheless what I am. I am also a trained Buddhist chaplain. So I'm very sorry to, to say to Dr. Glegg that I'm not a good representative of the American convert tradition in that I didn't really understand the entire point of sitting meditation until after I became a chaplain. And then realized, oh, maybe I do need some kind of a calm, equanimous, compassionate center that could be helpful in this work. So then I started meditating just a little bit more than they had wanted me to meditate before. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, I do see that trajectory in American convert Buddhism that focuses on the contemplative and then uses that as a basis for dialogue with other religious traditions that likewise have contemplative um, traditions of their own, some of which have been buried for quite a while. They have been de-emphasized in the various strands of Christianity and Judaism. And through the comparative theological exercise, uh, they look to Buddhism and they see what they find to be beautiful. And then they look back and find it within their own tradition. So that that has dominated a lot of um, interreligious dialogue in the United States, especially with convert Buddhists, for quite a long time. But I really appreciate, um, uh, like James here, I really appreciate Su Chi's uh, philosophy of actually not starting with doctrine, because that is where academics like us tend to get lost. So let's, we don't need to start with debating the divinity of Jesus or whether it's rebirth or not. We can start by trying to understand one another on a personal level, on the level of character, and then doing something good together that we can all agree on. We can all agree on working towards alleviation of poverty or working on climate justice initiatives, no matter what we call them. I also appreciate the approach taken in, um, in Indonesia and Malaysia, that there is, you're building these pragmatic activities like recycling or like um, cleanup from floods, but through them you're building what uh, sociologists might call social capital. You're building the capacity of that community to be within, be in relationship with one another in such a way that they become stronger for whatever comes next after that. So, you know, social capital that's from um, sociology, we could call it social karma. Um, if we wanted to put a Buddhist spin on it, these pragmatic activities really help build the resiliency of the entire community, even though they start out with something very mundane, like a recycling center. But through that, that becomes education, that becomes relationship, that becomes um, so much more than that. And I think that also aligns well with the Tsuchi philosophy of altruistic action preceding wisdom. And that wisdom develops as a result of that action and through that action, but you can start with the altruistic action. This reminds me actually of a concept within the Dharma called the, th um, the three prajnas. Uh, you might be familiar with it. It's a fairly minor concept. It doesn't get a lot of airtime in Buddhist Dharma talks, um, but it structures a lot of Buddhist pedagogy. If you start looking for it, you'll often find it. And it is, um, and I might get the order mixed up. So those of you who, who pr can speak Pali better than I can, I read these words more than I ever hear them said, so I might mispronounce them. But 
Trutamaya Prajna, Sintamaya Prajna, Bhavanamaya Prajna. So the, the wisdom that is developed based on listening, which in our day and age would also include reading, the wisdom that is based on contemplation, which includes both uh, thinking and reflecting and dialogue, as well as um, some meditation techniques and the wisdom developed by practicing, which is the Bhavana Maya Prajna, which involves, yes, advanced meditation techniques, but also just the doing and the being in the world. And it's only through that, the doing and the being in the world, Bhavana Maya Prajna is the only kind that actually enlightens. The other two can be helpful, but it's the wisdom of practice practice that is actually the enlightening wisdom. So I find that the 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 um, the activities that you are promoting in the countries that you're working at where Tsuchi is working and studying align very strongly with that teaching in Buddhism. So maybe that's one argument for why we can't separate the two. <laughs> because one they they mutually feed one another in a in a way that produces vitality. There are probably other arguments in favor of separating them, but um, that might be one thinking of why, why they exist stronger together. Like my colleagues, I also have questions about the 10th precept against political involvement. It strikes me that solving the status of the refugees and the stateless people in Malaysia will require a political solution through the changing of the laws. And I wonder what role Tsuchi could play in that if any, or if maybe you are playing a role in that slightly unacknowledged, um, just by highlighting it, just by bringing it into the consciousness of the public that is serving that political end. Um, I'm thinking um, for myself being at Harvard Divinity School, my role there is I'm the assistant dean of multi-religious ministry. And we think, we think ministry, often students will arrive and then object to this word ministry, that's a Christian term. Well, in some ways, yes, because the entire English language is inflected by Christian heritage. There's no getting away from that. But in its most capacious sense, ministry means service, service to the world. And it can reach far beyond traditional religious spheres. One's, one could perceive one's ministry as being, the, being a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or a journalist or an architect or any number of things. So when we say that we're training Buddhist ministers, we're training Buddhists to go into the world and be of service in that most capacious sense in, in whatever way they possibly can. For myself, that's as a chaplain, but for many of our students, it's, it's a very broad range. So we now describe ourselves as a multi-religious and multi-vocational school, which sometimes leads to the question of what are we even teaching? <laughs> we're teaching them to be everything everywhere to everyone. All at once, yes, yes. That's why we need Michelle Yeoh um, on our on our faculty. But also in that, our student body has changed dramatically. Not only are there Buddhist students, many dozens of them, some of whom are in this room, um, attending Harvard Divinity School now, but we also have many nuns. Not the nuns who are in the room, but the N O N E S nuns. This is a religious category that the Pew Forum came up with to describe people when they're filling out a demographic survey and they're asked what religion they are. They say, none. They're of no religion. We have a lot of them at Harvard Divinity School because they still have great questions, great existential questions, and they still want to be of service to the world. And even if they don't identify with a particular religious faith, they're still spiritual in some sense, or they might identify squarely as secular humanists or even atheists, but they recognize that religion is an important force in the world for, for others. So having many of these people, I was interested by the quote um, you shared from uh, Master Qingyan about she was afraid that the Presbyterian president of the hospital might be a person of no faith. Um, we have lots of people of no faith at Harvard Divinity School. So how might Su Chi draw them into these volunteer efforts? And also just a question of translation, being someone who doesn't speak Chinese, I wonder what word was translated as faith in that sentence, because I don't imagine she had that conversation in English. So that, that's an open question. So how do we draw those people, which are a very growing segment of North American and European young adults, um, at the last university where I worked, it was 60% of our student body. So how do we draw them into these joint efforts to help in, in ways that are amazing? Work that Suchi is doing is amazing. But if this is 60% of some young adult populations in North America and Europe, how do we also draw them in? 
to, to these interreligious engagement efforts. So I'll end there um, and say thank you very much for including me on this panel in this event. Um, thank you so much. We kind of really, uh, we kind of run out of time. Uh, I don't know what we have, what, five minutes or something. And certainly we don't uh, go through the uh, panelists again, And but we should we entertain question? Five minutes, okay. We will entertain question or we, we just open the floor, right? Or any of the commentators, panelists would have something to add and say, um, can say. I, I really want to say one thing that uh, whenever this conversation of um, interreligious encounter or dialogues occurs, there's one uh, mysterious figure is always pop up in my mind. He is a Buddha and he's definitely not a Buddhist. And he's the Prateka Buddha. <laughs> that's that's uh, something interesting to think about. It's <laughs> for. All right. Okay. That's me. Question? Yes. Uh, Lisa? Uh, one of the respondents mentioned. Uh, that Tsuji is is conducting direct action, um, and that removes religion from uh, the activity. But I think that, I, from my understanding of Tsuji, the direct action is the religion. So despite any alliteration, I think that we really need to understand that direct action is the practice and the practice is the philosophy and the philosophy is the religion. I mean, we, we really need to go in that in that circle. So as somebody who is not a student of, of Buddhism um, and, and really very uneducated, so forgive me, but as a student of uh, the history of charity and, and of philanthropy um, and of giving, I would have to say that, that one of the things that impresses me most about Tsuji is the the deep imbrication of direct action in the entire uh, two, uh, two uh, dual partite um, structure of of Ziji and of the of the master Zheng Yan's uh, 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 being, really, uh, that direct action is is right there. And I'm wondering if if some of our panelists um, can speak to that. I understand that you don't use the doctrine, but the direct action. How, how, does that bring people to some kind of an understanding? Thank you. This is wonderful commentary. Uh, I thought this. Anyone you wanna? Yep. Uh, to that? Allow me to just uh, probably add on a little bit. Sorry that uh, we didn't mention too many uh, Buddhist uh, terms in the the presentation, but this is the. Uh, but it is it's important in this uh, in a multicultural um, perspective that uh, we do not speak too much of the those language and uh, just for information, like uh, what I was talking to Brother Hongjin just now when you mentioned as Assalamu alaikum, it is actually forbidden for us as a being non-Muslim to say, say this greeting in Malaysia. It becomes very sensitive. Yeah, so um, this is the we got to respect the local context. Right, but when it comes to the um, Buddhist community, especially, then we will explain to them in a different uh, manner. For example, that is a lot of the time that uh, when we uh, receive a different lineage of uh, Buddhist, um, then we come to the Jingzi Hall, then we explain to them that what we are doing with our four infinite doors. Right, so uh, that's a step from the meta, for example. So we have the charity that we eradicate the poverty, and then in order to be better served to uh, do this job, that we have a community volunteerism, and then there's a lot of the time that people who is not as blessed as is us that, uh, right, then we can move on to the place that uh, we have the those uh, flexibility of traveling, then we can go to other. Uh, national or uh, other countries, that is where the international volunteerism come about. And that is all encompassed in the, our charity, uh, which is in the meta. When we go to the Karuna, right, then, this is the, then you see that this is where our medical mission, and this is where our uh, this uh, bone marrow uh, banks, that is, is over there. 
And when if we move on to the uh, Upeka, for example, now Upeka, we have our education that this is in the Upeka and in the Mudita, right? That this is where our environmental protection and this is where humanistic culture is so encompassed there. So it's, um, it's a lot of the time that it's, it depends on which context that we come in, into it. And similarly, when we talk about the mindfulness and then the people love mindfulness, right? But um, a lot of uh, new practitioners then is they come to our recycle station, they say, you don't practice meditation. No, no, you try to do um, the mindfulness in the, if you're not, you will sort this rubbish, this resource wrongful. And then you definitely put the, the right one in the wrong place if you're not mindful. And this is a simple way of telling them instead of uh, a very complicated theory. Right, I hope that address a little bit. Thank you. Great. I will just earn five minutes from the organizer. Um, just to MPI, clarify, you too, set the fire. Or just very short. Um, I mean, that actually gave illustrated my point, which was that the direct action, it, uh, there was no claim about what they see that as in terms of religious practice, but the issues of religious doctrine and dialogue uh, and proselytizing is taken off the table in terms of that. So that's a that's a separate. Those are two separate things, I believe. In other words, you don't, as as you mentioned early on, you don't come in preaching the Dharma, uh, but just speak in different ways. And, and so that's a separate thing of just how one engages uh, in in a in an interreligious manner without beginning with that. I hope just he, since he doesn't take that um, religious dialogue off the table in a different setting. I mean, the, one of the positive things about that is that religious dialogue, it's not a debate to see who comes out on top, but actually often results in better understanding of one's own doctrines uh, and can help clarify that. So, but that's not happening at the direct action stage is what my point was. Yeah, that these are, that that's happening as a separate, uh, uh, in a separate domain, uh, but it could be understood by the practitioners themselves as a religious vocation if one even wants to call it that yeah yeah the uh, direct direction whether direct direct uh, direct action is uh, re religion uh, this is a similar question whether eating is meditation and this line is really <laughs> should we draw or we can draw at all it's a good question yeah this Practice, right? She's always talking about. Well, she's always talking about shanti, shanti li xing, bodily putting into practice. So, perhaps we can start working towards like a bodily practice of compassion. Like, just you, you just have to do it, right? She always says, "Just do it." Yeah. I'll, in another important uh, con uh, concept, body. <laughs> Just maybe to uh, build on this, one thing that was really interesting to me uh, after many years of COVID lockdown, actually finally getting to New Zealand and meeting uh, many students who are actually in Christchurch during the devastating 2014 earthquakes, where Tsuchi, it won't surprise anyone here, were among the first respondents on the scene, even before the government and the local hospitals and ambulances and so forth. And so hearing from students, actually, some of whom and their families have lingering PTSD, honestly, with um, the level of devastation and how it really disrupted people's lives. Um, the intensity of that kind of experience, it strikes me, when we are thinking, juxtaposing this kind of bodily engagement, direct action, against things that are somehow more abstract, contemplation, kind of religious shoshing or whatever, you know, I sometimes wonder whether being in the field and leaving aside these issues of doctrine and contemplation and what you're supposed to do as a religious adherent and actually having a kind of really visceral experience that I won't say is positive because actually many of these things are deeply traumatic, but there's something very real and intense. And, you know, if you go back to Religion 101, when, you know, you are studying all of these early theorists of religion, Durkheim and rites of passage and initiation and the kind of intensity that sometimes provokes very profound experiences for people. I wonder if religion is just the shell, but that actually it leads people into um, something that's actually kind of more raw and, and deeply meaningful. 
speaking as a chaplain, I just want to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we really appreciate all your input. Okay, thank you very much. I think Chi has done a great job in the real action, with the big love, because that require, uh, like NIH put up the last 20 years, it's a mindfulness, it's beyond the religion. And to put into action, it require it uh, most enlightenment and wisdom. And she has done that. Thank you. Yep. Um, we have maybe one question. Or one last word. Um, okay. Uh, since we don't have time for questions or discussions, I'll try to keep this open ended. Um, as we're here, uh, the theme on Venerable Zunyan's uh, philosophy, um, and we're here gathered in Cambridge and uh, in America, we can think about Buddhism in America, um, Suji in America, maybe this will touch on uh, Professor uh, Glegg's research, but also when we talk about um, Suji's mission and Buddhist identity, um, the when uh, Venerable Zunyan was starting out her work uh, on altruism and social work, uh, charity philanthropy uh, in Taiwan uh, that has its very specific social contexts that might not be the same as in America and Buddhism in America it, it ser it's very diverse it services many different communities um, there's you know we think of uh, Tibetan Buddhism uh, Zen and Theravada historically as a big movements but there's also other Buddhist movements like, I guess, uh, Saka Gakkai International, uh, the New Kandampa tradition, which are demographically very diverse. Um, and Suji, I think, is special in a way because it represents Taiwanese Buddhism, it represents humanistic Buddhism, it represents, I guess, Chinese Buddhism, East Asia, Mahayana, whatever you want to call it, but it's also its very own special thing with emphasizing this altruism and how it presents itself through the social work instead of maybe proselytizing or spreading the dharma as other buddhist movements do in that affects when suji is in america how does it approach american society and american uh questions and, and politics and identity and issues where for a lot of americans who are approaching buddhism um, things like social inequality, things like LGBTQ questions, immigration, all, all of these, I mean, it gets into politics, it's kind of all pervasive, but a lot of these things that people uh, turn to either for Buddhism or other religions or spirituality, uh, does Suji address that when it's doing excellent work with the uh, disaster relief and education? Uh, does Buddhism and does Suji help with these other issues in America and, and how does that uh, bridge with other Buddhist movements? Okay, thank you for very much for the comments. I think that would be the end of the our this session. For the you know, for the sake of brevity, uh, we 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 say uh Chiji Foundation, but last time I checked the the complete title is Buddhist Compassion Relief Chiji Foundation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. You and we will hold.
of Tsuji's global charity. Now, I'm not a member of the academia, and I have not had any formal trainings in Buddhist studies or relevant discourses. So it's truly nerve-wracking for me right here, right now, to share in front of all of you, distinguished scholars and, and teachers. But even so, I'm still profoundly grateful. I am very grateful that Dhamma Master Chen Yen and also Professor Ray Sheng He gave me this opportunity to present and share so that with your feedback, I will be able to hear the remarks that I might not otherwise hear. I will be able to see the perspectives that I will otherwise might not be able to see. Just as Professor Andre Ladiferte, I think he was actually quoted many times today, uh, commented yesterday, we must have the courage to accept critiques and different perspectives so that we can improve and become better. So I thank you, all of you, for this opportunity. The topic to this grand discussion is Tsuji's global charity. Now presenting later is uh, our CEO Yen and also CEO of Tsuji USA, Debra Boudreau. They're both in this discussion group and they have both a matched experience with Tsuji Global Operations. So I'll stick to something that I know, something familiar. So I'll be talking about my home, which is Jinsi Abode. Now, Jinsi Abode has been regarded by Tsuji volunteers worldwide as the spiritual home. But this concept was alien to me when I first became a Tsuji volunteer in the US more than two decades ago. Now, why would I regard a place that I've never been to as my home? It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, as I progress as a volunteer, I learn more of Tsuji's stories and I hear more about the histories and grew closer to Tsuji and I knew more volunteers, brothers and sisters. Yet it still does not resonate with me. It does not make me regard Huarian as my home. Now this all changed after I made my first ever trip back to Hualien from the US back in 2009. What I saw was a group of people, even though coming from all different directions, coming from all different backgrounds, cultures, and countries. Now, they strangely all share the same goal. And while you might start at first as the outsider, I think there were many, many commentators or presenters these couple of days have mentioned that they are the outsiders to Tsuji. You might start out as the outsider. Somehow, somehow, you will all be recognized that you have this particular certain DNA markings in you. So they gradually take you in as their own and you become part of the family. However, the longer I was in the abode, I realized becoming a family isn't always a given, even when you come to Jinsu abode. You begin to see everybody, you share the same goal. It doesn't make you family. You don't feel fit in. So I see everyone, including the monastics. They are trying real hard. People coming to the abode, they can actually, so that, you know, they're trying hard so that people coming from all different places can sort of understand our ways and accept our values and be willing to become part of the family. That's when it becomes clear to me that all of this effort, all the effort of making people know your value, know who you are, actually was done ahead of time, a little bit at a time and all the time. Now, in the 13 years that I lived at the abode, since I moved back, I lived at the abode for 13 years, I witnessed a very interesting transformation. People of different expertise, especially those working in specialty areas like education, like medicine. There's a very, diff very interesting transformation. When I first came back to the abode, I remember about 13 or 15 years ago, Master would make weekly trips to Tsuji Huadian Hospital or Tsuji University. For what? For meetings with the management of the school, of the hospitals, or the heads of departments. I found out even as the owner or as the director of the board, going to the hospitals and going to the university, having meetings with these director, the head, head of directors, head of departments are not easy. At the first years of establishing this, the hospital, for example, masters and the other monastics from the abode, they regularly visit the hospital only to be seen as overreaching owners or even 
and this is seriously true, spies from the abode. You head to your, the hospitals that you had spent a big portion of your life making and building. Yet the people now running the hospital think that you are a spy. Or some of you, you're just going to come and see and observe things and report back to the master and tell us how bad we are. We're not vegetarian. We're doing things wrong. It is sometimes difficult to understand. How is that possible, right? Master has spent a very precious time in her life making this hospital into reality, building the schools, making it possible. Yet, people think that you are overreaching. Don't preach to us. You just built this place. You have no expertise. But when you think it through, it does make perfect sense that people in management, they don't want too many overreaching owners, right? You want freedom to do what you want. So over time, this is what we're talking about. Very interesting transformation. Through consistent interaction and unwavering support of these people. Oh, you want to purchase more? Okay, let me try to... Let me try to raise more fun for you. You wanted to expand? Let me try. You, you try to find more talents? I'll try to make sure they stay at this backward place that's called Hualien. That's what my master did. So the relationship slowly changed. Master Chen Yan and the monastics, including everybody that's very close with the monastic, they are now accepted. 13 years ago, master would make trips to the hospitals, to have meetings with them. Now, all these doctors come to the abode. They see abode as their home. Maybe not all of them. Maybe most of them are still forced. But still, now they're open to come to the abode. Now they're open to the idea that there is a monistic nun speaking to them in terms of their specialty, their expertise. Now they're open. Master Chen Yan, well, okay, so, so the doctors at first, they came from these big cities, Taipei, with big paychecks, and the promise is to be promoted. You know, they have these plans to support Hualien Hospital. So these doctors from the best hospital in Taiwan, in Taipei, they have these stints, three-year stints. If you come here with a three-year stint with, um, with Ziji, then you get promoted when you come back. Now all these doctors, they choose to stay. They accept abode. They accept Siji's value. It's a very personal and individual, even organic evolution of relationship. As people are conditioned, they're conditioned to now accept the abode values and the Siji ways. This conditioning of minds takes place over a span of decades for the trust to settle in, for people to recognize abode as their home. And that's where we come in. To expand further this conditioning, there is now a group of lay practitioners known as the pure practitioners. Now, thanks to Professor Julia Huang and Professor Pei Ying Lin and all the previous discussions, uh, thank you for mentioning the pure practitioners and providing the necessary discourse on this topic. Now, I'm not well versed in the histories, in the development of religion, nor can I recite verses or make comparative arguments from different Buddhist sutras. But I can share with you insights on the principles of database and implementation of parallelization in terms of uh, database joins in a data warehouse. But that's not our point here today, right? So even though I am not a scholar, but I'm a willing student. I learned from my guiding teacher, Master Cheng Yan, and I follow the path ahead. What is this path? Let's watch this video. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Chang 其實那我們去邀請其他的朋友們來參與我們的學習 and Master reminded us again, you must always remember that we are Ziji School of Buddhism. So what does that mean? What do we have to do? It's not just about remembering who we are and what we do. So what do we have to do? So this is what Master says. Master says, pure practitioners, our affinities are such that we are on the same path. Let us be clear that this path is the Bodhisattva path. We have all made the vow to gather here and learn to walk this Bodhisattva path. Very simple. Whatever that we have discussed, we might not know what exactly this Bodhisattva path means, but we're here to learn how to walk it. It's almost like children learning how to walk. The path is in front of you. Just follow the person in front of you. But do you know how to walk? So Master paved the path, we have to walk it. How do you do this? Master says, many people believe that the bodhisattvas fly in the heavens. But in reality, bodhisattvas are down to earth. So they need a base of operation. Great. Jinsi abode is this base, allowing aspiring bodhisattvas to learn and make progress. Great. Down to earth. Understand the people of today. And the last question that was asked in the previous session talks about in the United States. It's very, very different from where we first started in Taiwan. Indeed, down to earth, not flying in the heavens like we flew AA here, no. Down to earth here in Boston, back where I grew up in New York, in Queens, down to earth understand what is happening to the people here and now and stay engaged to the current world. So Jing Sibo is no longer just our spiritual home, what we talked about earlier. It's actually our base of operation. So we return here, we learn the Dharma, we sort of remember what Master had taught us and sharpen our skills. We talk to each other, convene and discuss our strategies. We utilize technology, incorporate new ways of thinking, and then continue to deepen our faith as we are immersed in the Jing Si Bo monastic environment, and then also interacting with the monastics. When we are prepared, off we go again. That's what we do. And that's what I thought that was it, but it's not. Master said, your primary family is Jing Si Bo. I got that. That's also our base of operation. And from there, you expand to your larger family. Oh, we have many families. Okay, larger family, which is who? The entire world, okay. Consider the entire world as your home and regard all living beings in this world as your own family. Oh my goodness. We were just very down to earth. Now you have shoot me to the moon. You have told me that my home is this world and every living being are part of my family. Now, as Professor Megan Bryson mentioned, theory-wise, right, it makes a lot of sense. But in practice, it's very hard to do, right? So how do you make everybody your family, right? It's even very difficult to make him, make him my family. Even though we dress the same, and even though we stay in the same hotel room, but it's already very difficult, right? So we have different likes, and we follow different you know, we follow different 
hobbies, etc. So it's already very difficult. So how do you make the whole fam- the whole world your family? So Master draws upon our aspiration and inspires us further. She said, even if you're as small as an ant, well, at least an ant has colonies, right? But you should have the aspiration to move upwards. If everyone has this upward aspiration, there will be more progress made. It should start from each one of you. Now I see. We start at the base of operation. We start at the abode. The source, remember that, testify the source of the Dharma lineage. We see that the source is from the abode. And we shoot for the moon, which is making the whole world our home, making all living beings our family. But how do you do that? One at a time. You do this one small step. And it's not even a small step by a human being. It's a small step by an ant. That's what Master said to us. Don't worry. Master said, pure practitioners should manifest such aspiration. Because guess what? You have the necessary education background. You also come with your sincerity. You made the vow and you're determined. You're also unburdened by family ties. Ultimately, I believe one of Master Chen Yen's vision of pure practitioners is that we are a special task force. Wherever there is any problem, we can be sent anywhere, anytime. Not Michelle Yeoh, but anywhere, anytime, complete any task. I remember Brother Sudan's story. Master was asking for volunteers to go ahead to Serbia. And all the way in the back, there is Sean. His name is Sean and Sidan. He raised his hand, and in his hand, he held, what was it? Passport. His passport, Malaysian, Malaysian passport, being very specific. Okay. I have three minutes left. Oh, my goodness. Are you sure? Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So, be sent anywhere. So, um, right. Special task force. Now, I'm, show, I'm gonna show you this, this, this video, right? So this is our task force. We were sent to the, uh, we were sent to the practice. Now we are part of the dark, the, the sutra adaptation. We had to learn all the moves, even though we dress differently because we didn't have time to change. But we're doing all the same things that people are doing. Now imagine, can the monastic do this? It will be very difficult. Uh, we are able to do this, and therefore we're able to be part of this group of young people you know, doing all this, and we learn from them as a group. Okay, so this is a different one. So Sean and I were together. All these people, all the movements, we're serious about being part of the people. No, we're not sitting at the office thinking about how do we go into the people and into their lives. We had to walk in do what they do when they're bleeding, when they're tearing, when they are sweating, we have to be there too. However, we know that we have fallen short of master's expectation. Recently, master always talked about going back to Buddha's homeland. And I think we weren't prepared enough. So master said, Bodhisattvas from Singapore and Malaysia heard about master's aspirations. They immediately took action. Furthermore, they organized their manpower and scheduling so that they can continue their work without disruption, with one group taking over from the other to ensure that this effort continues. I think we failed. We didn't do what we needed to do. We had to be more diligent, more assertive of our responsibilities. So that's what we do. Now, how do we achieve all of this? Master said, with the monastic appearance, Masters embody the image and representation of Buddhism. Pure practitioners who are now in the first generation in Siji will carry on the distinctive image that we began. So we are now the first generation. We have a lot of things that we have to do. We're not very good at it yet, but we have to try. We are now first generation. We must set an example, carrying the mission of Buddhist teachings and serving all sentient beings, showing Buddha's work. In some ways, Master said, we have more flexibility. 
than monastics because we can act more freely. However, Master says, even though you have this freedom, you must still cultivate and refine yourselves, leaving a lasting impression on others. So I don't really think that there is any difference among all the nouns that we're giving out today. Monastics or commissioner, pure practitioners. Master have very, very similar expectations. We're all equally important, not just the things you do, but we have to carry ourselves in a refined way. To some people, long time ago, monastic appearance alone was enough for the public to accept the teachings. Now it's not. Rising levels of interconnectivity, higher education, now more roles are needed. That's where we come in. These are still very difficult. Master says, what's dangerous, dangerous road ahead is that when people engage in worldly matters like we do, their resolve began to waver. Whenever I think of this, it pains my heart. We are still having our own problems too. We are going to be confronted with our own afflictions. Master says, after aspiring to be pure practitioners, when they encounter significant afflictions, they must endure and pass these tests. No, the road is not clear of obstacles. It's going to be there, maybe even harder than most. Master says, they always need something to hone in on their skills. That's what true practice entails. So when someone sharpens us through challenges, we should be grateful. But Master always remember to remind this. Remember the triple gems, the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha at the forefront. Pure practitioners can lead others to diligently practice and propagate the Dharma. And so we should always listen. Listen to the Dharma teachings. This is what Master says, and you should pay attention to the worldly matters. Don't be disconnected from the society. Pure practitioners aim to cultivate for purity, but also inspire to dedicate within the community. That's the way it should be. So lastly, um, Master reminds us to go back to our sources, to know our roots, that we must be abide by the Dharma lineage. Remember that we come from the Jing Si abode. I am one, we are pure practitioners. Now, even though I might not have all the answers to all of your, all of your questions, I might not have know all the relevant histories in this course, but I know one thing for certain, that we will continue this journey and maybe we'll find the answers together. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Brother uh, Joe Huang. I think this is the first time that the pure practitioner, uh, Derek, uh, express uh, their wish and their dedication and to some extent their sacrifice. I think they belong to the public. That's the service, as um, Professor Sanford just said, the minister and the chaplain said, they always serve to the people. That's the, the goal and they set a standard and example for all such members. So we we'll move the next, uh, you know, model as a uh, uh, Mr. Yan Bo Wen, the CEO of Tsuji Foundation, and he would like to present his mission in Tsuji Foundation. Welcome, Mr. Yan Bo Wen. Hello, everyone. I'm so uh, thankful for you still being here. And uh, especially, I I'd like to thank uh, uh, Joe Huang, the MC. Uh, uh, with them, uh, I really feel comfortable uh, for their strong support in many ways. Uh, especially uh, last night, we have an online meeting with our Dharma Master Zhen Yan. And they stay with us for two hours without saying a word, leaving the words for us, the time for us. I really thank for those uh, pure practitioner. And by the way, Joe Wang holds a, a master degree on computer science from Cornell University. <clears throat> and uh, I, I originally, I tried to use uh, my time last night to modify my 
presentation material because uh, for the you guys, um, you know, your presentation is so uh, so good. So uh, you raise the bar too high. So I need to change my materials. <laughs> However, I need to online with my master so I you know, can only uh, spend a little time to modify it, and I try my best. And uh, the topic I'm going to touch is uh, humanitarian age action and uh, the sustainability of Tsuji. The second part, sustainability of Tsuji, is I added the last line. Yeah. And um, the first part, uh, I try to uh, give the two cases on how Tsuji orchestrates uh, orchest uh, our res disaster relief team uh, under different situation. The first one is uh, for the country, uh, we have no Tsuji volunteers in the uh, affected country. Uh, the, our master Zhenyan will emphasize the gui guideline of closeness principle. The volunteers in neighboring countries we work with uh, our global headquarters that is in the Huanian abode to perform assessment and provide relief as quickly as possible. Thus we can uh, minimize both the resources required and carbon footprint of the relief efforts. So even the, in the, during the rescue, you know, the disaster relief, we still need to consider the, trying to reduce the carbon footprint so we are very uh, with the ecological uh, spirit. And uh, for the case uh, in uh, uh, Russo-Ukraine war uh, began in February, 2022. Tsuji has no active volunteers in surrounding countries. As a result, we had to rely on previous connections. For example, a former staff member of Dai TV, Suji's television station, had relocated with her Polish, Polish husband to Poznan, that is in northwest part of Poland, a city in the, a city in the northwest part and of Poland. Similarly, a Taiwanese student who had graduated from Suji University and was studying at a medical school in Lublin that's close uh, the border between uh, Poland and Ukraine. And uh, some other connection that we had in Poland and Czech Republic. So we quickly got in touch with uh, those local residents and they, they, were be able to, they were able to help us to get an overview of the situation. And uh, the, the reason why we focus on Poland is because uh, Poland, Poland uh, took the most uh, population of the refugee. Once upon a time, they, uh, there are more than 3.5 million refugees from Ukraine to, to Poland. And this is a, a, a normal adequate uh, you know, we conduct our uh, distribution uh, with uh, blanket, uh, clothes, food, and medical something, and and uh, also the emergency cash distribution, like a cash car, and also the family care. But more importantly, we do it with gratitude, respect, and love. That is the most precious way of Suji. So uh, uh, our volunteers from the surrounding country, including Germany, France, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Spain, Turkey, more than 40 volunteers from 12 countries, including Taiwan, mobilized to support the relief operation in five cities of Poland. Uh, so we provide, provided the support to more than 71,000 refugees uh, with more than 360 
distributions. Additionally, we also partnered with 11 esteemed NGOs, including UNICEF, Red Cross, Characters, Communions, Airlink, Project Hope, World Hope, Ezra, Israel A, and a local NGO, a Polish woman can, to provide more than 30 refugee service centers in nine countries, as well as shelters, food and cash cards, healthcare and medical treatment, psychosocial support, and more and more, and benefiting more than 1.3 million refugees in surrounding countries. Those are our partners during the, the uh, last year. And that's the location uh, on Suji doing that, uh, conducting the distribution actually in, in five cities. And uh, UNICEF, their uh, blue dot you know, uh, refugee service center and uh, communities, characters, Polish Women Can and Airlink, they are conducting with the, uh, some other partners, Project Hope, World Hope, and Ezra. We are delivering uh, medical equipment and medicines uh, inside the Ukraine. We still doing today. And this is uh, from the very beginning. Uh, we provide information and protection and food and water and then emergency shelter and psychosocial assistance and emergency cash, gift card assistance, medical care, vaccinations, rehabilitation therapy, long-term long housing and language training because they need to learn uh, Polish and job opportunities, long-term family care with those 11 partners. And this is a summary by the end of 2022, we actually support, provide service more than 1.3 million services. And uh, for the second uh, case, uh, there are uh, Suji volunteers in the affected country. Uh, our team uh, promptly a send out assessment group to ev evaluate the situation and determine the intermediate needs of those affected. Those kind of work often uh, begin within days or even uh, hours of the event. And uh, this is uh, uh, back to the 1999, there is one very big earthquake uh, in uh, Turkey. And since that, uh, our Tsuji volunteers supported uh, those uh, uh, temporary shelters and uh, also the, the cash support. Since then, uh, we have a very good connection in uh, Turkey. So, um, and this is uh, uh, our brother, uh, the Turkey uh, local, our uh, branch office head, uh, brother, Faisal uh, or Hu Guangzong. Uh, he uh, spent a lot of efforts uh, at that time, you know, at a very, very uh, 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. At that time, uh, there are lots of uh, re Syrian refugee children. They need to go to a factory, a sh shoe factory or textile factory for, for the labor, labor child. You know? uh, they uh, need to work. 13 hours a day and only have 13 minutes for restaurant. They, they will count the, the minutes. And so uh, our volunteers uh, try to talk to the, the, uh, the, the head of the uh, factory and we uh, support those students' uh, tuition, you know, that they're, they're uh, salary, kind of salary, uh, to get them back to school, uh, for them to uh, study schooling. And this is our uh, school in Istanbul. 
in Gezi Antep city. And uh, we call the school, the international school, El Manahel. Manahel. And El Manahel in Arabic is oasis from a dry desert. So many uh, Syria refugees see this Manahel school as a, uh, the hope of their future. And eight years later, some of the students, they grew up, graduated from college, universities with excellent achievement. And they, uh, they uh, all of them express they want to do the charity work with Tsuji volunteers, and especially, especially the, the uh, right hand one, the Emma, Ahmad uh, Junaid. Uh, about two weeks, three years ago, I was in Turkey, and he's my English trans translator. When we visit uh, those uh, local governor of Istanbul, and uh, when the, another even bigger uh, earthquake strike uh, in Turkey, um, in the uh, Turkey. Uh, the border between the Turkey and Syrian, and our Tsuji disaster ref, ref, relief team was formed, and we sent an eight-person uh, group to Turkey together with those uh, more than thousand uh, Syrian Syrian refugee, you know, uh, our volunteers there, and uh, they went to the disaster area for the distribution and assessment. And this is uh, a quick summary of uh, the emergency aid provided. We provide a cash car, uh, uh, benefited uh, more than 41,000 households. It's about uh, near 200,000 uh, people. The winter close is more than uh, 45, uh, 400, uh, 455,000 uh, uh, pieces and blanket and scarf near 1 million pieces. And there are some other uh, small items. So, uh, so uh, to truly understand the need of uh, affected people, we need to go deeply into the community and disaster area, so either through local volunteers or through local partner organizations. So Tsuji volunteers around the world uh, will stand by uh, to st under uh, our master's instruction. We'll be there to support those uh, disaster, disaster uh, relief work there. So second part, I will touch about the sustainability of Tsuji. Uh, for the past three, more than three years, we suffered the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, uh, if I can do the, some reflection, uh, I would like to quote, uh, it was the best times, it was the worst of times. Uh, the quote from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Despair. We had everything before us. We have nothing before us. We are all going direct to heaven. Way. This is a kind of non duality. So each year, uh, World Economic Forum, they were published the world, uh, Global Risk. Uh, this year, the theme of the global, global uh, risks is uh, today's crisis, tomorrow's catastrophes. It's something like uh, in Chinese, 
I translated into Chinese is 今日危机, 明日灾难. This is something to reflect uh, our uh, Buddhism teaching. You know? uh, it's kind of the Pusa Wei Yin. The Bodhisattva fear causes. Zhong Sen Wei Guo. Sensual means fear effect, effects, fear consequence. So when when the earth, mother earth, give up a warning sign, we need to uh, take a preventive action. That's the meaning of this slide. However, the Ciji is uh, become a, a, a such a big organization uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, we have branch office in 70, uh, 67 countries and territories and hu humanitarian aid reach out to 128 countries and territories. Uh, this is my uh, observation. Uh, actually, we have some, uh, actually, my personal, have some concern on Ciji's long-term development. Uh, from a Ciji volunteers, we have a first generation and younger generation. From the mission, like a uh, charity mission, in, in my office, we have uh, grassroots volunteers and we need to consider governance, the board governance. And in a boat, the Dharma lineage, that is uh, Master Zheng Yan's job. He need, uh, she needs to balance uh, so many volunteers coming from all walks of life all kinds of occupations, different ages. And they are, it's a big task. We have uh, elit, uh, elitism or egalitarianism, egalitarianism, or jing yin zui, like a deontology or utilitarianism. Or fundamentalism or liber liberalism, or all such different characters of volunteers, they came, they all come to master, seeking for master's uh, instructions. In my observation, I see Master, she caught a lot of Confucius uh, saying. I would say she's kind of a Zhong Dao. You know, Zhong Dao is trying to balance all kinds of the uh, ideas, ideology. That is a very difficult job, but Master has great capacity, great patience to cohere those volunteers. And this is, uh, we used to uh, uh, SWAT to do that uh, uh, analysis of a, of, a or, uh, or a company or organization. And I use uh, TOS is a second generation of SWAT. Maybe uh, Professor Nenner can correct me. <laughs> I'm not expert in this area. But however, I found this uh, TOS uh, more practical and realistic. We need to consider internal factor and external factor with uh, strengths, weakness, opportunity, and strengths. And this this is uh, uh, I I did it uh, on this talk. Uh, part of the material coming from uh, Professor Richard Madison. Thank you very much, and some some of uh, input. And you can see, because short of time, so uh, I want to uh, point out that uh, the, the biggest strength of Tsuji Foundation is founder's charisma and her social influence. However, this is also the biggest weakness after post uh, Dharma Master Zhenyan. And this is something we need to consider 
how do we establish the system and pass down to the younger generation? We have four mission and uh, eight, footprint, eight steps, including uh, international disaster relief, uh, environmental protection, bone marrow donation, and community services. We, when we map in those with the SDG, uh, seven SDGs, we found uh, these four mission and eight first steps can cover all those 17 SDGs. And we also paying attention to ESG, especially governance. This is the weakest part of CG. So last one, uh, the world's biggest issues is war, pandemic, and climate change. Probably someone will say the inflation. That is because of uh, probably originally from the war or many uh, geographical tension, including trade. So I would say that is a main, main disaster. So master teaches us a great lesson, grand lesson, asking us we need to purify our mind, be a vegetarian, and doing the environmental protection living with responsible consumption, I would say this could be the solution, the current disaster, current, we are facing the current issue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Yen Bo Wen. Yeah, I would like to express uh, our gratitude uh, without his support when we organize this symposium. And uh, Mr. Yenbo being very open-minded and very want to listen to outsiders. And we also facing the challenge how to uh, transfer from the sand to sandhood, like a Christian, uh, you know, transfer from the Christ to Christhood, how to transfer the charismatic leadership into uh, in our system and also the Dharma, the, the practice. So we have uh, many, many challenges right here. So that's the reason that uh, Mr. Yenbo want to you know, organize a symposium here, not to speak out, but also to listen to everyone. So thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, CEO Yen. And let's move to the uh, next presenter. Uh, she is uh, uh, CEO of uh, uh, Tsuji United States. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Deborah Boudreau, <laughs> you are there, okay. Welcome, Sister Deborah Boudreau. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's a long two days, but it's a lot of conversations. Um, I'm very grateful, honestly. I learned a lot. Um, a lot of scholars spend time to study about Tsuji Buddhism. And for these two days, to me, is eye-opening. I joined Tsuji is for compassion. I never think about there's a religious behind that. So from the compassion perspective, I have a chance to look into it, um, what we have for the originally uh, Master Zeng Yan tried to create it. So I never know there's a Tai Shi Da Si. I heard about it. So from this one, I say, oh, I need to look into my choice. Where's Master Zeng Yan's teaching? So from there, I started to learn the language, humanistic Buddhism. And from humanistic Buddhism, focus more on issue of the world rather than on how to leave the world behind, on caring for the living rather than for the dead, on benefiting others rather than benefiting oneself, and on universal salvation rather than cultivation 
for oneself. And when I read this one, um, my personality is mapping. So I started to mapping what Master Zheng Yan teaching us. So when we talk about um, He Zhe Zheng He Fu give me the topic for uh, Tsuji Global Charity. So I started to look into it. As a matter of fact, 1973, Typhoon Nora hit eastern part of Taiwan. At that time, Master Zheng Yan already activate, activate to do the disaster relief efforts. She already started to do fundraising, gathering resources, creating distribution lists. And November 4th, she organized more than 30 or 50 volunteers to distribute the funds, clothing, and bank blankets. This is 1973. Now, at that time, you can see what is Taiwan an island look alike after Typhoon Nora. And we are in USA. James just mentioned about a lot of questions. Hopefully, uh, we will have a chance to share. The fundamental Tsuji approach to humanitarian disaster response. Master 1973 already shared with us. Priority, direct, respect, speed, and practicality. This is five we still practice today. And now I'm in the United States. I look into it from 20, 20, 2001 until now today. We spent more than $25 million for disaster relief. And we started to wondering, what is my KPI for that one? So that's humanitarian also have KPI, okay? So I look into it. What is FEMA and Homeland Security? What is their disaster response? They have prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Then I'm started to do mapping, personality issue. So I compare this too. So I started to look into it. I highlight response because a lot of time now, everyone, you only pay attention about Tsuji's response, Tsuji enge engagement, um, Tsuji uh, going to the front line. Um, it's not only response. As a matter of fact, the five emergency management already integrate into the five core value that um, Tsuji, the path of compassionate wisdom and empathy into that. And I'm also going to share with you what we are doing right now in USA. You see how fancy we are. We already get into SRE disaster re response program. And we are learning the US Climate Resilient Toolkit to identify where is the next disaster. And there's a disaster dashboard. Honestly, we pay attention to that. We follow quite extensively. And from there, we always talk about what is the efficiency, coordination, compassion. What is our guiding principle for disaster relief standard operation procedures? As a Buddhist, you are faith-based representative. You go into the battle zone to do the disaster response. How are you going to work with those NGO? How are you going to work with the CSO? So we started looking to the National Incident Management System. This is NIM we talk about. There's a lot of uh, uh, policy procedure, guidebook, toolkit in USA. But in Europe, by answer question, Europe, we study SPEAR handbook. SPEAR means applied to humanitarian principle and minimum standards. Listen, the focus area, water, sanitation, and hygiene promotion. So it's not only di disaster response. There's a lot of water, sanitation, hygiene, so-called wash. 
and then food security and nutrition and shelter, settlement and health. Here, I would like to invite everybody to reflect Malaysia and Indonesia. You see the footprint. A lot of time, the video only show the action, but the behind the action, there's a lot of protocol in place. From there, we talk about transforming Tsuji Buddhism into action and the impact of vows and spiritual practices. Joe share about pure practitioner and they engage to the community, the vow, the faith, the practice. The sutra are a path and this path is a road to walk on. This is Dhamma Master Zen Yin teaching us. So are we doing meditation? Definitely, yes. That's the path to do the meditation. But it depends on what kind of meditation, like the Dr. Jen uh, indicate that, what kind of meditation we are doing. Walking the Bodhisattva path, the affinities of Bodhisattva are with suffering sentient beings. The sutra are the path. The path is a road to walk on, integrate, the Buddha Dhamma in daily life and become a living Bodhisattva in this world. Now, let's talk about Tsuji sequencing of delivery during the disaster relief assistance. It's all integrated with the Bodhisattva behind that. Our number one is cash for works. I have to share with you, I've been in the international pray for cash for work really, really inspired by Master Yen. I have a lot of story to share, but I don't have time. Please Google Tsuji website. The other one is cash for relief assistance, livelihood support, compassion in action, economic justice, bamboo bank movement, food justice, we have 80-20 movement, gender equality, and diversity, equity, inclusive, and community empowerment. Wash and health. Health is uh, meditation for mental health component and character education, as well interfaith, interreligious partnership capacity strengthen. This is the Tagalobang in Philippines when high-end typhoon hit the ground. This picture really struck me a lot. When you are facing the climate challenge, you have nothing. You are like the kids sitting on the mud. That kind of feeling, you feel lost. You have no way to go. And your property is, you don't know where is it. Suddenly, a group of blue and white coming in, create a cash for work, clean up program to empower. But Bohisafa is not only sitting inside a temple for meditation, for chanting. Bohisafa is going to the community to become a living Bohisattva. You clean up the environment, you prevent the disease, you provide financial income to the family, you bring back the economy, one of my sequence of delivery, rehabilitation for survivors and for people's innate, in, internal kindness awakening. This is true. This is true story. You see, you mobilize the community to helping each other's. Thousand, a thousand people. What a beautiful smile. What a beautiful smile. This kind of Bohisattva meditation is the best philosophy that Master Zeng Yen 
invite everybody to put the effort into it. From cash for work, we are talking about cash for relief. Cash for relief is another area that uh, CEO Yen mentioned about. We really want to prevent the gap for the um, individual family in between the disasters when they have no resources. So facilitation the gap between NGO and community-based organization. The most important is the anxiety for household and provide cash for livelihood necessities, revive the local economy, respect personal privacy, and again, provide a safety net. So this kind of circular compassion in action really put everyone a thread of hope. The blanket, Dr. Um, Nen Nenold mentioned bow, bow with two hands. That's the love, that's the respect that our volunteer delivery. The continuum of the hope infused with compassionate actions. So it's not only give, we invite, invite. This is now happened in Maui. Our team is in Maui. And they see the blanket with flowers, Hawaii, aloha. So respect. When we go into the action, are we talking about Buddhism? Yes. Here is Buddha. When they receive the cash card, cash card they put aside. They listen to the story of the no stranger from the blue sky, provide a red envelope with the Buddha Sutra, a statue, and they listen to the story. This gentleman, he is a veteran. When a fire approached to his house, he is only jumped to the ocean or he burned to the ashes. He jumped to the ocean and he helped his neighbors. When we talk to him, share with him, he cried. And there's a lot of same story. The Bamboo Bank, economic justice, this movement, each time when we go to the community, it's not just say, oh, here's a card, here's a blanket. No, we empower them, give them an economic justice to balance their life. And we share the story for Tsuji Bamboo Bank era, how you can be part of that. A 30 housewife save two penny every day. Now you are suffering. You can be one of that to empower yourself. So this kind of um, um, footage you can see during all the disasters. The education is not only stop for innovation. The sanitation path, we promote gender equality and economic empowerment. We are promoting this project now in Africa, Mozambique, and currently slowly in Sierra Leone, Africa. But you know what? When we promote this concept in UN C, and India company immediately pick up the idea. So this product is all over the world right now. But the key value, the concept is action to share the compassion, to empower the gender equality, to find a solution for the woman, to co coexist with the earth. Tsuji climate charity actions. We have our volunteer use two hands to deliver a simple uh, language for remind people how to do that. And we even have Coco, the Voices for Nature, to join with us. And thanks to Professor William Kayser and Hazizan Professor write the book. And 
from ethical eating to food justice movement, the plant-based diet movement, we also promote very aggressively. I'm going to move very fast because there's so many things to share. The blanket, I know 2020 when I go, went to uh, Kenya, UNEP, and we talk about um, plastic and, um, to the planet. And this blanket, the concept at the UNEA4, the fact that you can see a blanket, you feel it, thinking it's made of a cotton. It's not, it's made of PET bottles. That is awesome and amazing. I want to bring it to my country. And he did. And now this project is moving on. And now quickly talk about partnership capacity building. CEO Yen mentioned it about we work with a lot of partners. Now, if you go to UNICEF website, you can see Buddha City Partnership Collaboration. And also, um, started 2003 until now, we are working very hard to bring Siji into the mainstream. I will answer, there's no politician involved, but we have to be in this kind of place. And also champion of change. White House also mentioned about Master Zheng Yan. And yesterday, uh, Professor mentioned about Master uh, Windy Academic Institution, American Academic Institution, and also uh, BBC uh, Top 100 Women. Now, fostering interfaith and interreligious partnership, it's continue going on nonstop. Um, the humanitarian medical relief for Jordan is another way. And believe it or not, we built a church, reconstruction the church after the disasters. The Buddhist and Catholic dialogue, it's continue going on right now, never stop. 57, 58 now, years ago, three, three sisters pay a visit to us. And from there until now, the conversation, the dialogue is happened. And then recently, I want to share this one. Paul Francis brought backwards U.S. conservative, reactionary attitude in U.S. church. I love this one because they say uh, Paul Francis is going to rewrite and add on another documents on environmental law legacy. Why? Because the little see inside, there's a lot of area we can correlate it for climate change. So I love this one. Now I very quickly answer the question that um, Professor James um, just mentioned about the medical uh, charity cases empower better quality of life. This is the young girl, 15 years old, and um, her her father died, and Siji come to help her. Her situation is so bad. So bad, okay. But, 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 Siji help her all the way. This is so-called long-term recovery for the disaster response. And also so-called from charity to philanthropy, from compassion to wisdom. This is the story of Siji philosophy, Master Zanian's teaching. This is the story of her life. She has a better quality. And there's a lot of story and documents about data talk. We have a lot of data. So um, I'm going to stop right here. Um, I know my time's up, but I have to say, leave no one behind. Siji Buddhism, Buddhas in action. Master Zheng Yan always have her compassion, her philosophy to go into the community. The three sisters opened the door for no one behind. And now we have a better friend called artificial intelligence, AI. So is AI going to be part of Buddhist practice? Definitely, yes, it's a matter of time. So are we going to choose humanitarian interaction? or we're going to expand it. 
I would like to say something is today I really learned a lot. Today is a time capsule for me, for Ciji Buddhism. We learned the history about Ciji from Taiwan to all over the world. But we also need to think about time is changing. Generation is changing. How are we going to put, put Ciji Buddhism in action? This legacy going to continue carry on is every one of us need to think about. So let me say thank you for everyone. And then it's a great pleasure to learn from all the scholar and professor. Maybe the philosophy is not clearly uh, shared with you, but we will be very happy to work with you to provide information and to build it up, Ziji Buddhism into the community, into this space. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister uh, Deborah. So in this section, we heard uh, Brother Zhou Huang uh, and a very, very uh, Buddhist uh, determination and also the practices. We also heard uh, Yen Bo Wen and also Deborah about the public good that's being dedicated. So this is two leg, two arm belong to one body. It's a Buddhist Dharma. Also, it's the Master Zheng is philosophy and spirit. So we have a 10 minutes break. Let's return uh, roughly five to five, okay? Five to five, five or five. We come back here. We have uh, another participant to join us. Okay, thank you. See you later, 10 minutes. Mm.
And I would like to thank Professor He and Suji for inviting me, even though I only recently got my PhD. Um, I really have enjoyed these two days and I enjoyed this panel. So I was looking at um, Suji and its uh, environmental mission. But in the course of it, I realized that Suji integrates everything. So when you look at the environmental mission, you can't just look at the recycling centers because they have an environmental plan as part of their disaster relief efforts. And they try their best to not create more problems by the way they rescue people. They have um, an environmental plan in their hospitals as they're trying to figure out what to do with hospital waste. They have environmental plans in their charity, the charitable donations, the blankets are all recycled. They only give out vegetarian food and they also educate the people that they give the money to um, on how to live more sustainably. But then the issue of sustainability that was raised by the, um, the other two speakers was also sustainability moving forward and what happens um, as Master Zheng Yin, who is now in her late 80s, when she eventually Yuanji, right? Um, and so Joe here next to me is part of that sustainability plan, I think, um, because the story that I've heard, uh, I'm now interviewing your practitioners and other Tsuji people about their lifestyles and how Tsuji has changed their living for a new research project. And I've interviewed a few peer practitioners and they all tell me, well, the peer practitioners started because somebody asked Master Shengyan of Dharma Drum Mountain many years ago, how can um, Siji go forward when Master Shengyan is gone? And he said, as long as there are 50 people who have her vision and who are in completely immersed in her view, you can, they can carry the organization forward. And that was sort of the root of the peer practitioners. And so all of these peer practitioners are younger, but they're getting immersed. And the other thing that I think I saw, and I was talking about it with um, Lori Lai, that um, you know the peer practitioners felt like they failed because they didn't see it. But the old experienced volunteers, you know, they were already in action. And that was something that I also noticed in my field work. Even when the Tsuji volunteers are not wearing their uniforms. I went with some Tsuji people from Huali and to Taidong to attend one of their, um, the, the musical dance routines. <laughs> um, and as we were getting on the train, those of us who were less experienced, we were just sort of walking along because we didn't have to wear uniforms and we were just walking. But all of the experienced ones, they're in two lines, even without the uniforms, they're walking, you know, they're in step and they move so fast. And they were all on this train and seated before we even found the platform. So it's kind of like the older people have been um, socialized into the Tsuji way of doing things. And hopefully this is what the peer practitioners in the next generation can absorb and pass on. So those are my comments. I, I think really my, my only question would be for Joe is, what are you learning from the older, more experienced ones? Um, you know, uh, not just from the master, but from the ones who have been living Tsuji for so many years, because they've absorbed a lot of the culture and the things that need to be passed on. Oh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Professor uh, Zimmerman Liu. Uh, this section is aimed to discussion, not only, you know, to command to the presenter, so yeah, I think you can open up uh, your uh, expression and ideal. So next, uh, I would like to invite Professor Richard Madison uh, to deliver uh, his opinion. Thank you. 
Well, let me say what a great honor it is to be able to come here. I'm extremely grateful to be invited. And I learned a tremendous amount personally, uh, maybe didn't absorb enough wisdom, but personally from uh, working with, with Siji and, and, and helping it and learning about it. So I also learned something from here because it was right here at Harvard, just a few meters away from here where I studied sociology. And I learned some sociology, not enough either, and not, not that well, but in any case, I learned some sociology. So let me just maybe apply a little sociology to some of the wonderful talks that we've had since it just happened to be something I learned about here. So uh, <clears throat> one thing that was very interesting for me was the way in which Siji has fused, you know, Buddhist philosophy with Confucian philosophy and certain kinds of modern, even science philosophy. And uh, the question is, is, how did this happen? And Siji has fused it in a way that influences all sides. So in other words, uh, has absorbed a lot of certain Buddhist, con a certain Confucian concepts. But they, they changed, they modified these Confucian concepts. Siji Confucianism is not, is not like the Confucianism when I first came to Taiwan of Chiang Kai-shek in the, in the sort of Wenhua, you know, of Huxing Yundong, the, 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 the cultural renaissance period, uh, which emphasized all the most authoritarian aspects of Confucianism. It's not, by the way, like the Xi Jinping's Confucianism either, which does the same thing pretty much, okay? So it's a certain kind of Confucianism that modifies it in a way that emphasizes mutuality and in and, and, and the context of harmony and so forth. So it transforms Confucianism. In the meantime, the Confucianism has transformed Siji too. You know, uh, these concepts of, of, of things like family and the world is a big family and so forth and so on uh, are certain kind of modifications or development of, 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 of Buddhist Dharma that fit a certain modern context. So there's kind of mutual interactions. How did this happen? The way I think I see this is happening, again, this is from my sociological learning from William James Hall, William James being the great American pragmatist philosopher. It comes from the ground up, from experience, not from, you know, logical interconnections and some kind of abstract theory you learn from books. So the way in which uh, uh, ideas, religious ideas included, uh, uh, get developed is that my colleague Robert Bella, you know, passed away. He had a threefold kind of process. First, he says in development, evolution of human cultures is ritual. People learn by doing, uh, by doing things that are meaningful in a pattern way. And then second and continuing to be the most powerful way is by stories, by myth, by sacred stories. Uh, you tell the story about why the things you're doing are important. And then only later, and in a, in a way that's ambiguously useful or not, is theory. Theory, analytic theory that, that then is developed in all the great world religions to understand why you're telling the story and, you know, what it's based on. And so I think what we, we see in, in Master Jung Yan and in many of the talks here today is telling the stories. That's how the fusion took place. Master Jung tells stories. When, when I've heard her speak, at least in community Dharma talks, mostly it's stories. She tells stories about uh, what Sissi has done here and there and so forth and so on, and then it summarizes it with um, maybe an aphorism coming from Buddhist teaching, aphorism get put together, but the stories are what the, the living context in which you know uh, her teaching takes place. And so it's stories. And Siji's development and so forth is a matter of, of stories. Uh, once when I was there at the uh, in Hualien, uh, uh, I think it was Ray, Ray Shankor, took me to um, uh, th this, this, this place in um, where they have the uh, basic archive of all the things they've done you know, rows and rows of, of, of folders, you know, showing what they did in this place and that place and so on. At one point, he said to me, those were our sutras. That's what we learned. 
story of what we've done. So they have sutras too, they have the Buddha sutras, but those are their stories, the, all the things that they've done for all these years. And uh, by telling the story, uh, first of all, the stories then provide both a rationale and a motivation to integrate various philosophical ideas, you know, say you can't be just an isolated kind of, you know, Buddhist Sangha, you have to reach out to the world, be influenced by the world, and so forth and so on, and bring it together in a modern way, etc. And so the fusion is, takes place through these stories that are the most important. And the stories, of course, are based on on, on practices that you've done. And the practices are basically ritualized practices. So you, you, even giving out relief, et cetera, is not done just in a utilitarian way. It's done in a way that's it, it's meaningful because it represents kind of Buddhist love, great compassion, et cetera. And, and so it's a meaningful action that, that is then is modified accordingly. So ritual practice, the story, and then only an attempted way to kind of theory and, and philosophy. So I, I, I see it as kind of needing to go that way. Then there's one other aspect I'd just like to mention. And this is more hardcore sociology, uh, observation about Siji. There is two parts. There's the Siji foundation and the Siji uh, uh, monastic Sangha. Okay. And, uh, you know, in Taiwan, uh, the other two great uh, Buddhist organizations are Foguanshan and Bagwashan, Dharma Drum Mountain. And those are all named after monasteries. Foguanshan, the monastery. Uh, Foguanshan, the same thing. Uh, and so they all, have, they're based in a monastery, based in a monastic sangha. And then they've added foundations. They all have foundations, but the foundation it comes second to 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 the sangha. So you don't call this the Jingse uh, school. You call it the Siji school, because what came first and and is more prominent and so forth was this foundation, and then the practice of running the foundation and developing it and so forth has then influenced the way in which. Uh, Buddhism is 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 practiced, thought about, and carried out in in the, in the, even in the Jing Se Se. So uh, an issue is the relationship between this foundation, which is a certain aspect of the secular foundation. You don't even have to be Buddhist to be be part of it, uh, and or it's an NGO, et cetera, et cetera, and the Suji uh, community of of monastics and the, the Suji you know Buddhist teaching. And I think, um, just from a sociological point of view, okay, uh, there's inevitably going to be a tension with that. Okay, the tension be a creative tension, which I think it is basically. But there is a tension there, and you have this foundation now is becoming so huge. You know, I just uh, handed in my uh, forms I signed. <laughs> Thing, which is, you know, about a copyright uh, form and uh, how to get bank account money and all that. And I'm happy to have done that. Uh, that this is a wonderful, good thing. But it brought me to my mind that this foundation is connected with, first of all, with lawyers, uh, secondly, with uh, big banks and accountants and so forth and so on. It's a very complicated organization complicated spanning global you know good communities in, implicated in geopolitical conflicts and and with all sorts of people with different kind of expertise you know professionals who provide needs assessment for people in disaster situations for other people about you know talk about different forms of development all the things we, we, we just heard about so you have a tremendously complicated kind of organization now it's become huge uh, with with many millions of dollars of, of assets and responsibilities and tied in with all sorts of forces, uh, legal ones, and also ultimately political ones, okay? You can't discount the political aspect. Uh, it's not partisan politics, not, not you know, but but it's it's to, to do what they do, they, you have to negotiate with people who have power in, in different places, in very complicated situations sometimes. That is politics, right? And in a way, the things that you, you do are meant to, to change context, 
in, in, including environmental protection. So all of that is uh, is going on, and it's complicated because therefore there's a certain tension between just the development of the 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 uh, you know spiritual vision uh, that you have in in the things of so. And so the way that this is all mediated is through Master Jung Yan. Uh, her this the sheer strength of her of her personality or her charisma if you will and all that uh and it has infused first of all the organization with those kind of values that professor leonard talked about it really makes it a marvelous uh, you know beautiful thing uh but the values it, it, it's going to be hard to maintain master jung yan mentioned and joe huang mentioned that you know get involved with the the world and how does he put it you know you can waver etc and this causes their pain so they're going to constantly have to manage this master jung yen uh her, her sheer quality of, of her of her life and her example as well as her wisdom uh helped pull this together and not just that i mean she uh, knew how to run <laughs> This organization, I, I I sat with her when when she had meetings with people who were architects who were building something and so forth. And they gave out their plans, and then she said, "No, we're not going to do it that way." <laughs> Got them very flustered, so forth. But what I was impressed was she she knew what she wanted, and she had done her homework. You know, she and and she really thought about it, and 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 so she had a very direct uh, kind of hands on uh, control of this, which some people. In the organization, like the Huang mentioned, could find you know irritating at times. So, uh, but but she she did it and she could do it. Now she's older and now the organization is bigger. It can't be done in this this kind of way. And then then, then the, sometimes the problems that are caused by having such a large organization with different people involved in it and so forth then create certain kind of uh, issues that become like controversies in Taiwan. There have been some in the last decade. Uh, so it's going to be just from a pure sociological point of view, a kind of a tension going forward. It's going to have to be mediated. The uh, pure practitioners are one way to begin to, you know, to deal with that. But it's going to be a, a big challenge because since she, you know, uh, it doesn't retreat from the world, Chuja, it makes the world a big family. Part of the world is part of you know, what Master Zheng Yan called, what they all call Dharma degenerate world, you know, Morpha. And uh, it seems to be getting more degenerate every day and with major conflicts and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, how it is going to go on like that uh, in the same way is that's the challenge we all have to, you know, we'll tell more stories about as uh, as, as time goes on. Yeah, so that, that's, I'm just going to talk too much. <laughs> Well, thank you, Professor Madison. I think you haven't completed yet, right? We're leaving for some other time. Uh, so let's move to uh, Professor Herbert Nanner uh, to uh, uh, deliver his point of view on this section. Thank you. And uh, thank all of you uh, for being here today. Uh, and I really want to begin uh, with gratitude. Uh, I am enormously grateful for the opportunity to have had a chance to have a window into this interesting and important organization over many years, and that's very much your, uh, your gift, and uh, for the opportunity for the learning that I've done and uh, in, on all those previous days when I have been involved with Suchi in one way or another and learning about it, but also for today. Uh, I thought today's discussion was amazing. And I kept taking notes on different things people were saying. And I have three major courses that are coming up in the immediate, uh, in the next six weeks. Uh, I have a course for MBA and MPP students about leadership in turbulent times. I have a course uh, for a bunch of general officers, military uh, officials who are involved in, in the US response to major disasters. They're from the National Guard and from the Army and from the Navy and from other uh, organizations that will respond to our next major crisis, whatever it is. Uh, they're currently responding to Maui. Uh, and then I have another course that's coming up for nonprofit trustees, trustees of social enterprise 
a nonprofit organization. It's about governance. And I was taking notes on different things. I was trying to take them all on the same pad, but they're going to these different courses, and I'm getting confused about which one is where. But I'm learning about all of these things all in this day. So thank you for their hospitality, for the opportunity, and for this amazing learning. Uh, this is the product of my association with uh, Professor Her and with many others at Suchi. So please convey my personal deep gratitude and respect to the venerable master uh, for the many opportunities that have been afforded me and the learning, uh, which continues as we speak. So I love the opportunity to watch this living, breathing, evolving organization and its philosophy about how it makes its way in the world. And you are at an important point of transition, as you're well aware, uh, when uh, the, the venerable master will no longer be here to say for herself what she thinks, and you must figure out how to carry on these traditions. So it's an important moment. And I love, uh, I want to come back, and because I think what Joe Huang did uh, in talking about the pure practitioners is a great example of the way in which this organization operates in the world, thinks and acts in the world. What is this? What, is, what, is, what are the pure practitioners? From my perspective, as somebody who thinks about leadership and management, it's a role innovation in this organization. The organization was doing what it was doing, and it realized, well, there's something we're not, we don't have, well, maybe we could do this better. So maybe there's another role that we could identify and, and develop and define and then train and organize and recruit people for and set them loose and see what they can figure out. Uh, so this is the living, breathing uh, process. It's also a process of organizational redesign. Organizational redesign means the continuous rethinking of how the organization is set up so that it can most effectively and most naturally do its very best work. And so you're, that this innovation is an example of the organization continuing to evolve itself uh, to be as effective as it can. As Joe Huang said, uh, we're going to learn to walk this bodhisattva path. That means you're exploring and engaging and learning, and you come at it with the humility that you do not already know the answer, but you're going to figure it out. So what do you need when you're exploring, when you're setting a group of explorers, the pure practitioners, to figure out, we've got some ideas about what this looks like, but we don't know for sure, and we're going to have to find it out as we go. What do they need? They need a base of operations, and you spoke about the abode, is, the, is your home base where you can always come back. What's at the home base? The home base is the reaffirmation of the core values that you are bringing into the world. So you need a home base. You need the current principles and current knowledge, your understanding of how things have worked today. You then need the willingness to try. And people talk about this as a tolerance for failure because we're not going to get everything right and some things are going to fail and we'll have to rethink. I think both the word tolerance and the word failure are wrong in that statement. A tolerance for failure. No, 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 no. Tolerance is way too low a standard. We need to celebrate the learning that we're doing. We need to be actively understanding that this process of experimentation is how we're going to learn to make Suchi even better and more effective and the pure practitioners uh, driving that forward. And the second thing, the failure is wrong because when you try something, because you don't know whether it's going to work or not and you're trying to figure it out, if it doesn't work, it's not a failure. That was a success. You learned that it doesn't work. You're disappointed, but it wasn't a failure. What should we call it? We should try. We should call it a try. We're going to try a lot of things. Some of them are going to work. Those that work, we're going to continue to do. Those that don't work, we're going to stop, and we're going to think of something else. So think of it as a try. Our latest and most effective so far try in learning, our latest and unfortunately disappointing try which is a precedent to our next and even better try. So not a tolerance for failure, but a celebration of trying. That's what Su Chi has done all of its existence so far. It's been finding its way. It, for me as a scholar, it has been a fascinating opportunity to look into an organization that is explicitly doing that. Keep doing it, and we will keep looking and finding and trying to understand how it is that you all do this. Thank you very much for the privilege. Just thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Nanner, for this uh, kind of command and encouragement to the Tsuji to move on, to create and uh, innovate. So uh, uh, 
all the three presenters, do you want to say something or open the opportunity to the, our audiences? I think we might open opportunity to all audiences. Okay, uh, Dhamma Master Zhao Hui. Um, I remember that a question is uh, how to uh, connect the meditation uh, and the charity. I, I think uh, it's not only uh, Tsuji uh, has this kind of practitioner. Practitioner, practitioner okay. Uh, I just um, uh, think uh, <clears throat> a sutra, this, this, truth, this sutra's name is uh, that the Diamond Sutra. There is no fixed dharma called supreme enlightenment, and there is also no fixed dharma the uh, the Tathagata can expound. The practice of all good virtuous uh, uh, dharmas, uh, free from attachment to an ego, a personality, a being, and a life will result in the attainment of supreme enlightenment. So I think mindfulness is no problem uh, because mindfulness, uh, this, this kind of, me uh, this method of uh, meditation can use in everywhere, uh, including uh, touch every sentient beings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The Buddha uh, uh, did not provide only one way to uh, enlightenment. There's so many ways, and meditation could be various ways. Okay, yeah, this is a young man. So uh, these are two concerns for the future of Tsuji. I'm, uh, uh, for context, I'm 19. I'm a volunteer from New York, and uh, I wanted to ask about the future. Um, two things. One thing was uh, kind of the, the, I think, bold statement of including AI with Tsuji, but also another is uh, the youth. Um, I think, especially in terms of one of your four missions, in that you said that university education, um, universities primarily, I think, in, in this case, you want to run one with a, a lot of undergraduate students. And so with a lot of our students uh, my age, um, you you were worried that we we you don't have any uh, as many members who know about your your education as well as your mission. Um, I'm like one of I am in my experience one of the youngest in my branch, um, and a lot of the members that you do get are coming from like other people in the families and other people in, um, uh, other people who just already know about Saji through like interpersonal connections. But is there any plans for the future to kind of uh, reach out to these younger students or reaching out to, uh, you know, people my age uh, who are like around, you know, adolescing and, and go growing from young teenagers to adults. Um, I was just wondering if you had any opinions on that. Does anyone want to answer the question? Uh, okay, Deborah. Okay. That's a very good question. For the, um, I would like to go back to meditation and also reply back your um, environmental climate change. Uh, Tsuji, we talk about dye technology. Dye technology, the blanket is not just a blanket. It's a blanket full of the process of circulatory compassion. What we are doing is you group a senior citizen together you empower them, you treasure their value. That's the sociology. So they can get together doing the same repetitive movement. That's meditation. And also medical term, that's rehabilitation. So the process is right there. And um, why this year, I should say the past two years, we've been uh, really looking into it, not only Tsuji, even United Nations started to invite it, the young leaders to be on the table to share their thoughts. 
uh, for some reason, I agree, I disagree for political uh, definition. It so really depends on the line, how you draw. Um, you see, we engage with so many uh, high level political forum. We engage with uh, FEMA, Homeland Security. Why? Because Buddhists, your voices need to be heard. When the disaster strikes, you create a curriculum a huge population, our village chief, they have their ha um, diet um, behavior. They have a special needs, but you use the Western style to deliver the love and care. It's not going to work. And you have to be on the table to share what is the cultural diversity and inclusive awareness. So that kind of engagement, it's kind of very gray, finite to define the political or advocacy or earmarking, whatever. For Buddhist, it's a information sharing. So I'm always receiving a call from FEMA. Deborah, it's a group of migrants coming from Amazon. They are from Asian. Can you help? So that kind of connection established right there. Go back to your question. This kind of facilitators, it's not just say um, you have to create a platform for you to join. Come back to Tsuji USA for young leaders. We all immigrants coming to this country. Your main focus is doing homework to get your degree and your site additional time, you will join your social gathering, you will. Uh, um, um, different um, activities. So we slowly, slowly, um, I know we have a um, IYLP team um, lead by uh, CEO Yen, but in USA, we have a young leaders team. We group all the college, uh, Tsuji um, University and Tsuji Tsuching, and now we open to social searching to join and grouping them together Give them a topic, climate change. What will be your survival skill? And this is the first year we, we roll out this program. We listen to their input. It's amazing, fantastic, their engagement. And I have to share, there's a case study for social movement for young leaders engagement. You create a platform, let them to engage, let them empower to plan a project together, let them to do a survival skill, then it's working. So what I want to suggest is, it's not just using social media to tell you, hey, Tsuji is here, hulala, come to join with us. No, it's each individual. You need to explore. And of course, of course, Suji, we have to be working very hard. That's why our social media director's team is in the back. We spend so much effort trying to promote this concept. So it's a lot of uh, connection. Indeed, we need to be more proactive. We need to let people know. But on the other side, should Buddha, going to Buddhism team, should they practice silo and follow the monastic practice? Oh, we should go into the community to promote, to engage, to recruit, to invite more young generation to come. So it's really a token of two sides, how you to see it and you balance that and to justify that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, and see you again. Uh, I would say the, the young talent, uh, Recruiting and incubation program is uh, number one priority in my mind. So I would like to have the Sean, Sean Tan. He's my special assistant, and he's in charge of those young talents uh, programs. So Sean, would you come up stage? <laughs> uh, thank you, CEO Yan, for giving me op this opportunity to reply to this gentleman. Um, I totally agree with what Professor uh, giving comments just now. I think right now, uh, Tsuji, we need a lot of try and error. 20 years back, 20 years before, we have a lot of youth in the university, 100,000 around the world. But right now, numbers is gradually uh, decreasing right now. This is a fact that we have to face it right now. That's what this gentleman brings up. And then um, as a pure practitioner here, we are in different position right now. 
we have in a religious department, I'm a special assistant to the CEO, we got different opportunities to try different um, uh, way to solve the problem that we face in Chiji. Uh, just take for example, two years ago, we got COVID-19. No one can meet with each other, which Chiji, essentially, we meet each other to get the affinities and then we get all the people to join us. But during COVID-19, we don't have the opportunities. So how we get use of IT technologies to solve the problem in, in Taiwan, but particularly in Taiwan, we stop all schools, we stop everything. So all the students, university students, they can't go for summer camp blinds for the children and all the children, they can't go out. So they create a lot of problem in Taiwan. So what we do for that, that's a good try, I think. Um, we start to have all a recruitment online, everything online. We get about uh, 700 university students to participate within three weeks. Everything starts from scratch, nothing. We get nothing at all because summer holiday is coming. We have nothing um, planned. So in, within three weeks, we get 700 students and then we get about 2,000 um, children around Taiwan. But after six uh, cohort, this is the last batch. We stop that. We, ha we have to face that things won't be the same all the time. So right now, what I can uh, reply to this gentleman, we are on the way to try to get a model that masters successfully create for the previous generations. But right now, for our generations, I think things different, works differently. But I, uh, for sure, the essence, the core value from masters will always be the same. But we are now on our way to find a good model for our current generations. This is my reply. Thank you. Thank you. We got a three minutes left. So maybe the last question, the last comment. We have to close uh, this section 45. Anyone want to have a comment? Okay, okay, this young man, yeah, please. Three minutes. Um, I guess I don't have a lot of time again. Um, let me first uh, address the, the gentleman's earlier question about uh, youth and uh, Buddhism. And as we see, in America, um, well, globally, Buddhism, uh, how the youth are engaging, it, it might look like it's declining. Um, there was a lot of growth with the Buddhist community in Taiwan, for example, uh, after the uh, end of the martial law period and uh, economic growth period, uh, there was a lot of growth in the Buddhist community. And But now, I guess me being in uh, Taiwan studying uh, my master's program in Dharma Drum, uh, observing the dynamics of uh, how the youth engage with Buddhism. And I, I am curious to see how that is progressing uh, in the future. And in America, um, like here at Harvard, there's the, the Divinity School and the growing uh, chaplaincy work of young Buddhists, young Americans, uh, working to engage with the Dharma, engage with Buddhism uh, across very different uh, diverse traditions. So I uh, want to comment that I'm, I'm look forward to see how Tsuji progresses. Uh, I also want to add, or I'm fascinated by the uh, peer practitioners because that is really special. It, it ties to uh, the youth groups, it ties to new, newer audiences for Tsuji, but also it's very unique in that uh, in Chinese Buddhism, Taiwanese Buddhism, uh, there's there's that strict divide between the lay and the monastic, while you see in other traditions, like in the Japanese tradition, uh, there's priests instead of monks. And so they, they can marry, they, they, uh, the Vinaya is different. Uh, in, in, Thai, uh, in Theravadan traditions, there's the periodic um, monasticism. Uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, a lot of uh, there's also periodic um, or, or lay uh, adepts. And so seeing the peer practitioners, it's a very serious form of the following the Bodhisattva path. I'm curious to know how are they, what is their education, you know, as the professionals, as uh, learning Suji and really engaging with the mission. I, I'm curious to see 
what is their education, what really makes them stand out and unique, and how are they engaging in society? Okay, welcome to come to Hualien to see in person. Thank you. We have the close of this section, and we move to the closing remark. I would like to invite uh, the Professor Eugene Wang and, and Master De Chen to come on the stage. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for these uh, two long days, and everybody is so diligent, always stayed <laughs> in this uh, conference room. So uh, I would like to um, uh, open in this uh, current remark, and start from uh, Professor Eugene Wang to have his closing remark. Thank you. Well, um, we've had two days of intense discussion, presentations, and uh, exchanges of views. But the key question that we came in with is, of course, what was Master Zheng Yan like as an individual? Why did this person who was born in wartime Taiwan came to matter in the world? She didn't have formal schooling. She never studied abroad. But she touched, and her organization she created touched 10 million people. Um, and when it matters, she was sent, the organization Tsuji was sent team to Ukraine, to Hawaii, when um, there was disaster. Um, there were hospitals, there were um, all kinds of um, social engagement activities. So these all create a mystery to some extent. How did a person who didn't seem to have all the, well, the, the work, I mean, she beat all the odds and create this, this uh, organization that really um, matter in the world. So one of the moves she made is that to demystify Buddha. So we, the, the conference goal is to some extent to demystify this person. So to some extent, we succeeded in that. To the, on, on the other hand, we feel there's more mystery. Because uh, 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 scholars from different disciplines really try to explain this phenomenon, um, Master Tung Yan and Tsuji Foundation. We went a long way, we came a long way understanding, explaining. Uh, scholars come from different disciplines, from philosophy, Buddhist studies, sociology, political science, uh, social studies. Each of us try to use our discipline lens, try to unpack, try to understand, try to demystify the mystery. So one takeaway of it is that Master Zheng Yan, in the Tsuji Foundation is not to be reduced to one single perspective. In other words, you could use Tai Xu, Ying Sun, the lineage to explain some 
uh, certainly not all. You could use Lotus Suda, expand some, but Lotus Suda has been around for a long time, so it doesn't single, uh, uh, doesn't expand everything. You could use the extraordinary circumstances that she grew up with, what time, and also the inter Asia interactions with the Japan, the interface with uh, the West as a special kind of set of circumstances that made her and the organizing, organization what she is and what, the, what it is. But still, you could see that it doesn't quite fully explain phenomena. So I still end up wondering what really happened and what really made this possible. So uh, we shall carry that question, of course, moving forward. Another thing I thought was quite extraordinary to think about is that we are in the academic setting at Harvard. And one of the Harvard's aspiration, as I'm sure um, the, our, our other institution universities, we always want to create students, train students to be the world leaders. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, value placed on the training of future world leaders. You have a case here in Master Yan and the Ziji Foundation that she created. Uh, she didn't go to Harvard, but a very few Harvard students can accomplish that's what she has accomplished. So this really put some pressure on those of us who teach at higher education. How do we train our students so that we can have more individuals like Zheng Yan, after Zheng Yan. And one way I kind of feel that, you know, it's not just about book learning, it's just not about reading Lotus Sutra, which I happen to be one of the specialists of Lotus Sutra. And one of the mysteries of Lotus Sutra is that the Lotus Sutra talks about, you need to read Lotus Sutra. <laughs> uh, and then in the end, didn't, you end up not doing what a Lotus Sutra is, but then you, you kind of gain some wisdom. But that said, still um, reductive uh, way is not the way to go about it. And um, so one thing I sense that, um, well, since we're at Harvard, so we, you know, our former colleague, uh, uh, Howard Gartner has this theory about multi-intelligence uh, among them of emotional intelligence, how to connect with people and so on. So those are the kind of things that you feel like, okay, when it comes to uh, mastering, it's really uh, these multiple intelligences that you need to have in order to create and lead organization at like um, Ziji. So um, anyway, the, the bar is set very high by uh, <laughs> Master Zingye and Suji Foundation. And uh, it certainly, I hope someday, I'll, I'll, I, I'm sure we have colleagues from Harvard B, B School and they probably will write a case uh, and uh, write, write a case, uh, a Zingye's case. And I hope also if we can put our acts together, we should also think about if we can award, um, well, I shouldn't, um, prematurely say that, but but if possible, it would be nice to have Mathilde be awarded an uh, honorary degree from Harvard. That would be uh, something that we uh, it would take. Uh, um, but that would that would be the that would be the, the sort of uh, standard the the aspiration um, that that our future student and teacher should uh, look at and as a some kind of reference point. Um, so finally, I have to say that uh, uh, we are, um, since I, I, I was very touched by this 19 year old uh, young man from New York who asked questions about future and so forth. Um, well, we are at uh, Harbor and uh, 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 we face all the pressures now, uh, 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 the high, the institution of higher education face the problem. How do we make our schools relevant, uh, right? Uh, so these are the questions in part can be answered by looking at 
how Tsuji and how Master Tsingyan and the organization keep renewing, as our colleagues just said. The ways renewing is what matters and how do we renew ourselves in the 21st century. Things can no longer be as business as usual and uh, Buddhism cannot be that way. Uh, high school, uh, um, um, high education cannot continue that way and there has to always be some kind of renewal. So in any case, um, I look forward to more conversation to have because I still carry this mystery uh, I understand um, um, much more contextually about uh, what Master Tseng Yan is about, what the Tsuji Foundation is about in, in ways that two days ago I couldn't have that kind of depth and breadth. But still, I still want to have more questions and so forth. So uh, hopefully we will, um, in a couple of years, we, we will have more events like this to uh, and hopefully we can still be the host at Harvard <laughs> I know us uh, uh, the uh, probably want to have it to Princeton but we'll try to hold tight <laughs> to our monopoly of things and uh, but but in the end it's not about Harvard it's not about Princeton it's it's, it's, it's really about the whole world yeah okay uh, finally, I would just want to thank everyone who has been extraordinary participant of this event and also all the volunteers worldwide. I mean, uh, you're, you're just, I've never seen a conference this meticulously, with this meticulous care and uh, uh, attention to details and everything. And so uh that goes a long way to saying you know what city foundation is uh organization like but uh ultimately it's every one of you uh who have made the difference so um and also i have to say another thing is that the the kind of chemistry uh for the conference is quite extraordinary so uh quite exceptional and uh so i want to thank you all and uh if we do it again please come again thank you Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, by the way, uh, without, uh, maybe not polite, but, but Professor Tazadin uh, promised me to host the further research on Dhamma uh, Master Zheng Yan. But of course, in the Harvard and the Princeton, every prestigious school is always a good friend and partner. So now, next, I would like to have um, uh, Dhamma uh, Master De Chen to uh, express her gratitude on behalf of Master Zheng Yan and the abode. And I know some of the uh, friends may not listen to the Mandarin. So Alex and Joe, would you like to help me to translate for uh, for Professor Lerner and Professor Sanford? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, not word, word to word because we are run out of the time. So maybe, yeah. No, not, not on the stage. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, just uh, not one to one. Not not translate in public, but close to Professor uh, Lerner and also uh, Sanford. I'm sorry because uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, your time is uh, running. Yeah, yeah. Um, 亲爱的昭慧法师，在座所有的家人们、朋友们，大家好。非常非常的感恩，这两天在哈佛大学这样子一个殿堂里面，虽然我都没有机会来跟大家分享，但是我很认真、很真诚的跟每一位讲者、每一个评论者来学习。而在每位分享者跟评论者在提到了上人实际的故事当中，每一张的画面，其实自己都很熟悉，所以怀抱了一份非常感恩的心。而这份的感恩心，最主要来自于我的家师正言上人，他一路以来教导着我们用。谦卑的学习，例如
。昨天一天的课程当中，上人虽然心系着台湾台风，风大雨大，各地有灾情。上人更心系着夏威夷岛，夏威夷贸易岛的大火，实际如何展开紧急的救援？但是上人也关心着我们，昨天一整天，大家在这里讨论了议题。昨天晚上有因缘跟上人连线报告的时候。还是非常非常的感动。上人说，听到了几位，包括严执行长和副执行长跟上人报告。那当然很感恩，呃 ，Andrew， 还有阿芬，还有招费法师都跟上人分享。但是上人还是很谦卑的表示，这一切该都是。做该做的事，所以上人还是很谦卑的表达自己何德何能，能让这么多这么多专业的学者，在全世界都是顶尖的研究学者，给予这么大的一个肯定。但是上人这边谦卑，仍然回馈到实际所做做的每一件事情，都是全球自贡在做的。有这个殊胜因缘，参加这一场的盛会，是所有所有专家学者共同来提出对上人哲学的思想、对上人领导的风格，都给予这么这么这么大的一个肯定。在这个肯定当中，我所感受到的是，如在专家学者当中也有提到的。在佛教来讲，六成就，我们这样一个盛大的研讨会，就如同一场法会，有各种成就来一起丰盛这一场的盛会。For this event to be a success, we talk about the fulfillment of time. What a beautiful opportunity! Thousands of years ago, Buddha created Buddhism to teach people that they all have pure intrinsic nature that we can return through diligently practicing the Bodhisattva practice. Twenty-five hundred later, on September third and fourth of twenty twenty-three, we are here together, studying Master's teaching, Buddha's philosophy, and. Putting the teachings into practice and Siddhi's contribution to the world, and then of course there is the fulfillment of the teacher, just like the Buddha's teaching and Master Cheng Yan's teaching and leadership, and also the fulfillment of the venue. So I'm very grateful to Professor Wang for providing such a wonderful venue for us to. Rest assured, with advanced technology, and we can broadcast the symposium worldwide, so that when every presenter shared, many people are also commenting and responding online. This fulfillment of this venue in this distinguished university, when we are discussing and learning from each other here, it's such an extraordinary occurrence. And most grateful, they are the fulfillment of assembly. All of you are gathered here, which is made possible because of our leaders here who have faith in Master's teaching and leadership. As Master Cheng Yan realized that she's just doing what she should. In the early days, we've just focused on doing what we think is good. We've rarely engaged the external world or worldwide leaders and scholars to understand what Sichi is doing. So I'm thankful for Professor Her in his advocacy for sharing Sichi's work worldwide, and invite all these scholars and researchers 
to affirm Suchi's work. I believe this is the right direction that we're heading to. So after years of dedication, as all of you are here, gathered here, supporting this event, making this possible, you all have your strength and mindful dedication in understanding Suji. I heard Andreas sharing, who is a political scientist researcher, but he's studying Suji for 27 years, even though he's just so persistent and so determined in his aspiration to do this work. And of course, another scholar often who's also very diligent, spending many years to promote Suji's spirit worldwide. So seeing all of you working together and so many conditions coming together, I'm just really, really grateful that you are all affirming Suji and Nasa Chengyun's work. But I've also heard your, your deep expectations and hopes for Suji. I'm sure all of us will take your warnings and reminders to heart so that we can turn it into a force of motivation so that we can bring Suji forward in a way that meets the mainstream society's needs for living Buddhism to be practiced and implemented in this world, inviting everyone to join. At this symposium, I am very grateful to all the volunteers, volunteer bodhisattvas and staffs who have dedicated themselves in secret in the background. So before turning the Dharma wheel, we must feed the bellies. As we're here being nourished and taken care of, every meal, every snack, there were volunteers who fulfill our needs for food and nourishments. So we must truly be grateful for their dedication. In this symposium, a lot of you mentioned Master Cheng Yen used the Lotus Sutra and Sutra and Meanings in, as her spirit to guide us on this Bodhisattva path. And the Bodhisattva spirit is to go among people and transform sentient beings. Master really hopes that Sichi volunteers will use this spirit of promoting Dharma and benefiting all living beings. That is to serving Buddha's teachings and all sentient beings. But Master also recently reminded us that to promote the Dharma, we must also benefit everyone and put the teachings into action by serving and giving. That's how we can become living bodhisattvas in the world. This is a very important concept, just like all of you saying, benefiting the self and others. It's just through benefiting others, we return to benefiting ourselves. This is, as the world is changing, the four elements are in balance with severe climate change. So many natural and man-made disasters are frequent, but Siji stays with the times to serve, to help. Thank you for CEO Yen. As a retired business entrepreneur who came back to the foundation to take on this leadership role and work tirelessly to lead everyone, to follow with the movement and pace of technology, just like what the United Nations hope for Siji that we can work towards sustainability. However, as the world's changing, Siji is evolving. The only immutable thing is Master's aspiration. Her heart is still as vast as the universe, including all the realms. As we're all concerned that as the law of nature takes Master away from us, what would happen to Siji? My own perspective is as long as all of us form aspiration and make vows to be master's manifestation in the world, emulating her spirit of compassion and wisdom to serve all sentient beings for Buddha's teachings. Suji will be sustainable and persevere throughout time. And all of you here, including all the monastics in the Tsingsi abode and all the pure practitioners as well, as well as all our volunteers. 
because we're all equal in the Tsuji organization. In the small circle is the monastics, the middle circle is the pure practitioners, and then our staff and volunteers on the outside circle. In this circle, we can see that how all of you come here. We invite all of you are caring about Tsuji and sustainability. So I want to invite all of you, all of you to join us. Join our organization to the Master Chunyin's manifestation so that we can keep Tsuji sustainable. Thank you for all the lessons and learnings in the past two days. I wish you cultivation and fulfillment and blessings and wisdom. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, uh, Master Ho Chen. Uh, uh, there is a time that Master uh, told me that uh, if anyone asks you uh, who will be the successor or who is the succession plan of Tsuji, and she told me because I was supposed person. She said, "You have to tell them every Tsuji member will be successor. Everyone will be successor, not a single one." So I think everybody concerned the succession of or sustainability of Tsuji. Uh, I think according to Professor Richard Madison and also from Herbert Nanner, uh, I believe keep good spirit and less bureaucrat and continue to innovate. And for Buddhism, for essential being, only for essential being that Buddhism and Tsuji can sustain. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. of this symposium. Thank you all for your participation and thanks to all for sitting through the completion. Now, uh, we welcome everybody to uh, join us for dinner and I'm sure there will be a lot more to discuss and a lot more for exchange. Thank you all and we see you in the very near future. Thank you all, thank you.